Hello and welcome to the Bond Revisited podcast with me, Tom. And me, Joe. The podcast where we rewatch the Bond films one by one, discuss them, and then rank them alongside the other Bond films to build our own definitive list for the Bond franchise. You are listening to episode 20, where we'll be revisiting the film Die Another Day. So I feel like last week, with The World Is Not Enough, I might have started to moan a little bit too much. A bit whingy, a bit moany, a bit bent out of shape. So I'm looking forward to today, where that's not going to happen. And it's just going to be a nice, solid film, and we're going to have a nice chat about Bond, and there's going to be no whining or complaining at all. Oh. Uh. (laughs) Okay, then. I I do think that... That's going to happen, right? Well, let's just say there are there are things to appreciate for this film, <laughs> I think. That's yeah, nice. I like there's that. lots there's lots not to. Okay. But we can be upbeat about it. We don't have to whinge. We don't we can lie. We can lie and we will end up <laughs> whinging, but we can try not to. To be honest, I was kind of like I think we said at the end of last week about how we were both kind of excited to be watching this film. Yeah. Now, obviously, a week is a long time, and maybe going into it, that changed. I'm going to be honest, that did not change. I listened to the theme beforehand. I got it stuck in my head, as I usually do. I was actually looking forward to this when I sat down and put the disc in. Yeah, I was the same. Totally the same. I think after, when you say about you moaning about uh, there was not enough, I think I moaned even more. So I was ready to have some fun with Die Another Day. Yes. Um, And you know what? Up until a certain point, I think I did. That was fun. I think there's definitely fun in this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. As I said, we said last time, I think a, a bad film is more interesting than the boring film. And there, there's definitely lots of bad things in this. There is some boring things to me as well. But uh, it was entertaining nonetheless. Yeah, I think just to show my hand a little bit, it feels like all the stuff that people say is bad is still bad. But... It's like there is a lot more around that to talk about and focus on. And that maybe isn't so bad. So it's like the most divisive one because it probably has the worst moments in any Bond film. But that doesn't Mm. mean that it's consistently bad across the board. Um, And I think maybe some other films are actually more consistently bad or bland. And if there's one thing you can say about this film is that it's not bland. Yeah, I think it's you often see this film at the bottom of rankings on internet articles and things. And I do think that's a bit unfair. I think, as you said, it's it's got lots of things that people can poke fun at and kind of these really big, cringy moments that everyone talks about. But there are little bits of interest and actual potential uh, mixed into it. Some of them don't go anywhere. But it's definitely more than we've seen with previous Bond films, or some of them. And, yeah, I just think sometimes it's maybe a bit... It's just the easy one to put at the end or put near the bottom uh, without actually watching it again and and thinking about it. So that's why I'm glad we're doing this podcast. Well, I think if you timeline wise, in terms of their release schedule, swapped Octopussy and Die Another Day, then that would change all those lists. I almost feel like Die Another Day is treated as like the worst modern Bond. Yeah. So it gets shoved to the bottom. But a lot of the other ones before that kind of get mashed into one, like especially the Roger Moore era where there's like seven films. They kind of like I'm sure the people doing the list do watch the films, I hope. Uh, But I do feel like you kind of group them a little bit more. But because it's a more modern film and has those more obvious flaws as well, like some of the older films do have obvious flaws. It's like it stands out more. And it's like, oh, yeah, that crappy one I remember seeing in the cinema. Shove that out of the bomb. It's bad. (laughs) Yeah, I guess where it is newer, 2002. It is a bit... That is true. I think you can give a lot of the the bad effects or cheesiness from Roger Moore films because they were 30 years ago. But this is only 20 years ago. And so I think you can judge it a bit more harshly, perhaps, with some of the things it gets really wrong. Hmm. But this is also the case of... I'm assuming you're in the same boat as me as I clearly remember this film coming out. Yes. Oh, I mean, this. so yeah, this was the 40th anniversary of Bond when it came out. Um, and I remember there being a huge deal about it. I remember there was like TV shows. I remember one in particular was uh, Best of Bond, I think it was. And it was hosted by Roger Moore. Ooh. It was like the top the top Bond moments countdown. And I remember watching it. I, I remember taping it on VHS and watching it 
over and over again. I loved it. Do you remember any of those? Do you remember what was number one? I have a feeling it was the laser scene. I was going to say it had to be a Goldfinger moment for sure. Yeah, I think near the top was like the parachute from The Spy Love Me. But yeah, I think it was Goldfinger at the top. Okay, that makes sense. But yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I still remember this coming out. I don't think I saw it in the cinema though, but I would no. have been 10 at the time. So I was very much aware of Bond, watching Bond films, and I'd remember this coming out, and I remember quite liking it when I was younger. And oh, yeah. when it was my birthday the year afterwards in 2003, uh, in my room I had like a small, tiny TV, like one of those small CRT TVs, just to like watch stuff on with like an aerial that barely worked. Um, <laughs> so you know the ones I mean where they oh, just yeah. like yeah. the metal T- stuff falls off and you have to balance it at just the right angle to actually see Who stuff. remembers TV aerials now? Blimey. I know. But they were crap. I'm glad they're gone. Um, Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, I had one of those. So, for my birthday, uh, the following year, I got a VHS player or video player so I could actually watch stuff. And alongside that, I got a copy of Die Another Day on video. Oh, yeah. I I get at the time I liked that film. I, I recognized it wasn't maybe the best, but I remember having fun with it. And that same copy on video, I still have. Uh, Wait, in my bedroom at the moment. I have a question about your VHS. Okay, hey, is it the one that's like part of a series, and when they're all be- like next to each other, they make a picture on the spines? I it's can like go orange check, and black. <laughs> but no, I don't think so. Oh, I had a lot of those. I this is the them. one that it was like based off the original artwork with all the glass and ice stuff. It was like oh, okay. purely the poster on this. Like this would have been like when it just came out. Oh, I see. Gotcha. And I also have GoldenEye as well on VHS, but I got that after this one because this is the one where I was like, here's the new Bond film and a VHS player, Tom. Go in your room and watch Die Another Day. (laughs) Enjoy your birthday. (laughs) Yay. Now, was the TV Die Another Day themed? Sadly not. Oh. (laughs) I don't know what that would look like, but I don't think I want to know. Just a big ice TV or something. A big big Halle Berry TV. The controller was like a glove on my hand. (laughs) (laughs) I could fast forward it on that. The power of the sun. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you get the cool visor to go with it as well. Oh, that was Christmas. That was a Christmas. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so we've rambled enough, but like this for me, extremely nostalgic. As a kid, I remember liking it. I then kind of went back to not liking it as I got older, especially with the Daniel Craig era. But it's always been a little bit of a back and forth. So obviously when we started the episode, I put it in my bottom five. So at that point in time, I kind of didn't like it all that much. But most of the time, I've been more of a die another day defender than a critic. I just think in that moment when I was doing the rankings, it was like an easy one to put at the bottom. Yeah. So I did. But actually, I've been probably more favorable towards this film than you might expect, considering my previous opinions on the other episodes. As in favourable right now for this episode? Well, we're going to get into what I thought of it. But going into it, I was excited about it. But like, I did think that maybe I was too harsh putting it this low. Whether that was wrong or not, we'll find out. But I do normally, like back in the day, I remember liking The Vanish and stuff. I liked a lot of the stuff that made this film so silly and over the top. So we'll see. Was that just because you were 10? It probably helped, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It definitely helped. Now you're now you're old. What do you? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've passed it. Um, now we're older. Yeah, I, I'm guessing some of those opinions would have changed. Yes, uh, but I'm looking forward to turning like 80, and when I start going senile, and I start loving it again. That's what I'm looking for. You can track <laughs> like a person's <laughs> mental state and their mind <laughs> by how much they like or dislike time of a day. I'm just now picturing all these old people in a retirement home watching like the steamy sex scene between Bond and Jinx. <laughs> That's not bird watching, is it? <laughs> is that them feasting? Oh I don't know. <laughs> Where right. are the birds? <laughs> all, right, yeah. all right, let's get into it. Uh, I could speak like for an hour about my history with Dying of a Day in this film, but that's, again, just remember it so clearly. So we're going to have to talk about the film itself. Okay, all right. So, boom, circles come across the screen. It's the same walk as Goldeneye, as far as I could tell. So that means they never updated it for Piers Brosnan in his run, which was probably a good choice, I suppose. Yeah, good walk. Doesn't need changing. Yep, solid walk. So we then get the Bond theme, and it's 
almost like a classic version of the Bond theme. It's not the same one that we had last time, but it still has like these crazy drums, <laughs> like very like late 90s, early 2000s, like drums in the background. Yeah. Which I didn't dislike. No, I, 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 I'll say right off the bat, a lot of the music in this film I think is very good. And I think, you know, you can't really go wrong with a, the gun barrel theme. They've generally been all good throughout the whole series, actually, the little tweaks and twists they do on them, so... Yeah, like, all the Piz Rosen ones have had a unique version of that Bond theme, and they've all kind of stand out, and a lot of the David Warner ones have been very tied to the, the time and the era that it came out, which is charming in its uh, twisted yeah. way. Yeah. But speaking of being charming in a twisted way, uh, Bond fires the gun, as usual, but this time a bullet comes out, and it comes flying at the audience, and... I guess hits the cap. Well, it doesn't hit the camera. It like goes underneath it. But yeah, like almost like a 3D film where they throw stuff in your face. You get that with the bullet coming out the camera. Yeah, it really did seem like a 3D film. It did make me think, hang on, was this released in 3D? No, no, <laughs> it's just, it's just, they wanted to spice things up a bit. And I guess, yeah, like I, I did mention that this was the film's 40th anniversary. So I feel like with that, they definitely wanted to, yeah, spice things up, make some changes, sometimes good changes, sometimes changes just for the sake of it. Lots of East like callbacks and references to previous Bond films, which I'm sure we'll point out along the way. But um this one, the the bullet going down, I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But I don't hate it because it's just so quick anyway. Like it really doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fine. I think a lot of people like to just straight off the bat criticize a film, like, oh, this stupid bullet thing. It's just what, who cares? I mean, honestly, like, who cares? I like the bullet. Yeah, I don't and you know mind. why I like the bullet because it's a tone setter. It's yeah. If you were gonna get you, if you sat down thinking you were gonna get a from Russia with love, uh, you know, a uh, golden eye, you know, something like that. Nah, 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 nah. We're throwing CGI bullets right at the audience instantly, and to me, that's what I appreciate. I know you know where you you stand then. I know there's going to be some dodgy CGI, some questionable uh, choices in this film, but it's going to be weird and fun. And I feel like even with such a minor thing, they're setting the tone. I can get in this frame of mind of like, okay, put on my city wacky CGI early 2000s hat. Okay, that's on. <laughs> All right, proceed. I am ready for this film. It gives people a chance to leave if they're, <laughs> if they're like, what have they, what have they done to the gun barrels? This is terrible. It's ridiculous. And then they're like, all right, you, you, go, you can go now. Haven't even Other finished their popcorn. <laughs> Please leave. Although we should say this film was actually, uh, I know we've barely touched this film already, um, but this film was a huge success. Um, oh, which massive. Is what, which is what makes it so interesting that it was, uh, it did a lot better than The World Is Not Enough and it was the highest grossed, grossing Bond film at the time. So, when we talk about this film being bad, a lot of that is in retrospect or the critics. This film was a huge success uh, for the franchise. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so we, we come out of the circles and the bullet and we see a beach with a load of military kind of things on it and two soldiers. And this is in North Korea. I guess I can try and pronounce this name. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's like a puck. Puck Chuong? Maybe, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm assuming not? the little uh thing in the the gap in the middle there means you should separate it. It's not like Puck Chong, it's like Puck Kong. Okay, all right, I'm done with that. Um, so <laughs> coast, uh, in North Korea, so it's the beach, it's quite cloudy, it's like in the, in the evening, but it's not dark. And we then go to the huge waves, there's a lot of waves going on on this beach. And as these waves are going on, we see somebody in like a black wetsuit start surfing on the waves and they're just doing a little bit of wave riding for a bit and there's then a shot of them surfing another wave comes over and then another person comes out from underneath that wave uh, and then a little bit more surfing together and and then a third person shows up and there's like quite an energetic feel to this as well this is not like a quiet thing this is almost like it's not a stunt but it is supposed to be quite energetic almost like it's 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 more Bond style music. It's not the Beach Boys again. <laughs> <laughs> oh hey Roger. <laughs> hey what's up Roger? <laughs> yeah, they don't get a Beach Boys uh, cover band to do the music for this one. It's more just like energetic Bond style music. And yeah, they spent ages on these waves. Um, 
I quite liked it, to be honest. I was quite into it. And I thought it looked quite cool. But yeah, we get like a couple of minutes here of just people surfing on the waves on a Korean beach. Yeah, I mean, these waves, I don't know if they did some kind of special editing or tricks to make them look bigger than they are, or they really are just gigantic waves, but they look huge. And I think, yeah, it's not a massive stunt. It's not like parachuting out of Moonrake and all that, but I think it still has some intensity behind it. It's definitely a... a, a a bold start. I liked it. Yeah, I quite liked it. It gave me strong The Living Daylights vibes, to be honest, this whole setting. And you need this surfing to help set up the uh, the infamous scene later on. So it all links together. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's Christopher Nolan stuff, guys. It really is. Um, so yeah, so the men eventually get to the beach. There are two soldiers there, like patrolling the beach, but they don't see the guys. And they all then get to the beach. They... Well, actually, I think straight away, uh, Bond just takes off his mask because one of them is Bond. Uh, he removes his mask and it's him in the wetsuit and they run along the beach with their boards and Bond is doing some like hand signals because the other two people are, I'm assuming, South Korean uh, soldiers. Um, so they're kind of infiltrating this base and Bond does some hand signals. One of the soldiers cuts a wire, which disables an alarm. Bond gets a knife. He stabs into a gra- into the ground and a little radar dish comes out of it and starts beeping. And this sends a signal to a nearby helicopter. And when that helicopter receives the the signal, it then changes course. It goes into a different direction. So Bond and the soldiers remove their wetsuits entirely and run off. And we see the helicopter that was signaled before. It lands in this field. A man gets out and he's all like, what's, what's going on here? I didn't know about all this. And Bond is there and points a gun at him. And he takes his briefcase... And the man is wearing sunglasses, so Bond takes the sunglasses, puts them on, gives him a little cheeky smile as well. Yeah, and he's wearing the exact same clothes, which I did wonder how did they know the exact clothes he was going to wear. But oh. I guess that's what Intel's for, right? Yeah, that's recon stuff. Although, I, because the idea is that Bond is going to pretend to be this man, which is why he's stealing his briefcase and sunglasses, I would assume, but... Yeah, I guess that is more there to sell it to the audience, what Bond is doing, because mm. I don't think the place is going. It's like, hmm, that's not his jacket. <laughs> <laughs> it, like They don't know what he looks like, but they're like, hmm, those aren't the <laughs> shoes I would expect. Kill him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kill him now, yeah. Uh, but I honestly really like that little moment of Pierce taking the glasses and then smiling at him. It, it goes back to what we talked about a little bit in The World Is Not Enough, where... Pierce has his own brand of like cheeky Bond and the way he kind of says certain lines. So I, I really like that there was this small little humorous moment that is very Pierce Brosnan Bond. And I like yeah. having it up front. Yeah, yeah. So Bond is in the helicopter. It's flying over this forest and as he's on board, he opens up the briefcase and we see it's full of diamonds. Lots and lots of diamonds. So he removes the diamonds and underneath them, he puts some C4. So he just kind of fills the bottom of the briefcase with a ton of C4. He puts a little bit of a receiver, a detonator into the C4, which is like linked to his watch. So he's linked this up so he can blow up the C4 with the watch, and then he puts the diamonds back in. And then we cut to a military base, which is Colonel Tansan's Moons. Did I say that? Colonel Tansan Moons. Yeah, HQ, yeah. Uh, which is part of the demilitarized zone in North Korea. Now, if you don't know a lot about the demilitarized zone, well, join the club. I'm the same. I, this, uh, <laughs> this film oh, I thought you were going to give us a, a lecture lot. then, like a bit of a history lesson from you. Well, I was hoping you looked it up. Um, I, I vaguely know, I think. I like I, The film doesn't go into it that much. I'm assuming it's just a big chunk of land between the North, North Korea and South Korea where you're not supposed to have military in it. Yeah, pretty much. That's just from what this film presents, and that's all you really need to know, which is exactly very nice. So we go inside the HQ, the base, and we see a man in like yeah, in army gear, kicking a, a punching bag, kicking and punching, doing some martial arts on it, and eventually he stops, and somebody else comes along and unzips the bag, and there was a soldier in there. He falls out, uh, and the guy who was kicking says, "That'll teach you for for lecturing me." And they're all speaking Korean at the moment because they are korean uh, and it's all subtitles at the moment so so this guy is like quite a young person so he's a fair he's like a an officer he's clearly some some uh, someone of high rank 
uh, but he's also quite young. So Bond arrives at the base. He just lands in the middle of it because it's a quite big open area with a lot of vehicles and then like a building nearby. So Bond lands in the, the middle and the officer goes over to greet him. So yeah, this is Colonel Moon. I actually took me a little bit to connect that because they say this is Colonel Tao Sun Moon's base, but it actually took me a second to connect that. Oh, this guy's Colonel Moon. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because they keep... Yeah, because... We... All right. They, they, there's, there's another Colonel Moon as well, isn't there? I suppose. Yeah, there's another Moon and, character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is Colonel Moon. So he goes to meet Bond. And as Bond gets out the helicopter, we see somebody else, someone with a headset... Uh, get his phone out and take a picture of Bond. So he takes takes the picture. So they've now got that picture, and Bond goes up to to Colonel Moon, and I think he says his name is Sal. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, but he he was no no that's wrong. Sorry, it Sal is the name of the guy. Oh yeah 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 yeah. So the guy with the headset who took the picture of Bond is called Zhao. It's just when I very first read it, I didn't hear it correctly, so I put S A L for this. <laughs> Sal, <laughs> better call Sal. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's Sal, which is Z A O, which I got right later. But uh, yeah, so Sal meets him. They, he says that he's late, and then Moon comes over to meet him, and Moon kind of starts talking quite a bit. So he's Korean, but he kind of has this like American accent almost, and he talks about how he studied in Harvard and Oxford and. You see that there's like a lot of sports cars all around. Um, and Moon asks, let me see the diamonds. But Bond pushes back and saying, well, I want to see the weapons. So Zhao on his radio uh, sends, like, communicates to someone. And we see a load of hovercrafts enter the base. So these big old hovercrafts with the big like uh, turbine sort of thing on the back, they all hover in. And Moon explains how the demilitarized zone, there's this area where there's a lot of american landmines like they left the americans left a ton of mines to separate them but thanks to my hovercrafts we can just float over them and completely skip those mines so it's fine and i think moon is saying how we've got like enough ammunition as well like he, he's talking about the military might basically and we've got a uh, yeah a ton of anim- ammunition and guns so bond hands over the diamonds to him upon seeing the weapons and zhao and like some sort of diamond expert, we assume, go and ex- inspect them. So there's like a little table they set up nearby in this courtyard and they're looking at the diamonds and Bond says to them, don't blow it all at once. Oh, hey. Uh, and Sal then gets his phone out because he receives a message and it has the picture of Bond and it says that he's James Bond, secret agent. So he now knows that Bond is a British spy, a, sp- a British assassin. They actually call Bond an assassin for most of this film. I don't think they use the term spy, maybe ever, uh, which I thought was an interesting choice. Who? Who? The North Koreans? Well, I think most people call or it just an everyone. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I did, on that little screenshot on his phone where it has Bond's face and then, yeah, like, you know, name, occupation, whatever. I did notice there's a little bit that says, uh, like, physical appear or physical traits and one of them was scar above his top right lip. And oh. I was like, Bond has a scar on his... And then I looked in the next scene and said, yeah, Pierce Brosnan does have a little scar on his lip. So there's attention to detail there. I like that is it. That's quite nice. But I'm assuming that's not part of the character, right? That's just what Pierce Brosnan looks yeah, like. Yeah, <laughs> that's just what Pierce has, yeah. Oh, interesting. But then there's a picture of him, so why would you... <laughs> why would you need that description? I don't know. Very strange. So... Yeah, so Zhao goes over to Moon and and shows him the phone. Or, like, I think he says to him, actually, like, that's James Bond, he's a British assassin. And Moon looks a little bit upset at this and is looking the other way. So Moon decides, like, hey, I'm going to show you this new weapon we have. So he stands on a, a car, I think, and has this big old, like, assault rifle type thing. It's, like, huge. It doesn't look real, to be honest. It's quite chunky. And he's saying, this is our new tank buster weapon. And he fires it, and he blows up the helicopter. And at the same moment, they all grab Bond and point a gun at him, so Bond realises he's been caught. Uh, and Moon then starts saying, like, oh, how do you propose to, uh, how do you propose to kill me now, Mr. Bond? And then we get our first of many dramatic little camera shots here, where we get this very dramatic head turn from Bond. I can't remember what he's looking at. 
But yeah, this film has quite a lot of these like dramatic camera shots and we get our first one here. Is this where it does like slow-mo? I can't really remember this bit. I'm not sure if this goes super slow-mo, but he definitely oh. does like a very exaggerated head turn. I'm not okay. sure if it goes full slow-mo because there are, you know, proper slow-mo stuff later in the yeah. film. Yeah. But this is your first hint at like, oh, they're really going to highlight some of these details in a very early noughties way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Moon is saying like, oh, it's, it's pathetic that the British think they can police the world. And I was like, that... That seems like an odd line, but I guess at the time, maybe that makes more sense with the Korean War, what happened there and Hong Kong and stuff. But in the year 2023, the idea of the British trying to police the world and everyone's like, we're sick of you British trying to police everyone all the time. It's almost like a very outdated idea. A mm, little bit. But I guess at the time it made sense with our history. But uh, yeah, so we then see that a general nearby is heading back to the base. He radios in. And it's the Colonel's dad. So we have General Moon and we have Colonel Moon, who's his son. So General Moon sees that there's some explosions or some smoke. So he's like, I'm heading back to the base. So Colonel Moon then starts freaking out, saying, we've got to hide the weapons. We've got to hide the weapons. And there's kind of this big panic and Bond still has guns pointed to him, but he gets pushed back and he starts kind of looking around while everyone is frantically trying to hide these weapons and... He then kind of quite casually puts his arms down, brings his hands together, presses his watch, and that sets off the C4 and causes a, an explosion from the diamonds. So he starts running. Bond just starts sprinting to get away. Sal, who was near that, just has half his face full of diamonds. Yeah, uh, That's somewhat important, although I guess it's not really important. For the rest that's of the just film. his thing. That's his thing now. Yeah, that's like his physical trait as kind of a henchman but kind of not it's half a diamond face uh, uh yeah it's definitely visually something but yeah it's not like they give him <laughs> they don't give him superpowers or anything <laughs> he just has some some stones stuck in his just face has the diamonds in the face yeah so, yeah so bond runs through the base and he jumps on one of the, the hovercrafts that is there and starts firing missiles from it which blows up some of the building he blows up some of the sports cars and just a lot of chaos going on. And then he just gets like a machine gun out, starts firing that. I don't think you really see that many people die, but it's just like, yeah, it's just very tomorrow never dies, chaos, bullets, explosions, everyone running around. It's it's fully one of those scenes. So he then quickly goes through the concrete gate, I think. Or maybe he shoots it, I don't know. But yeah, so he escapes the base, but somebody else doesn't because the gate shuts just in time. Uh, but yeah, so he's going after the hovercrafts that are now being taken away. And there's a very big one, which is the one that Colonel Moon is on. So Bond is trying to chase down. Colonel Moon is trying to escape. So now it's a bit of a hovercraft chase where Bond is on one hovercraft driving it because he throws the driver out and is driving after these two guys kind of going through some muddy uh, roads. So Moon orders two of the hovercrafts to just turn around and charge at Bond. And Bond just nudges into one. And it just flips and explodes so nice and easy. Um, and then the row kind of slightly splits a little bit. So Bond is able to kind of catch up with Moon. And Moon is on one side and he's just like shooting. He gets on a turret and just starts shooting at Bond but misses completely. He then gets a flamethrower out that he has and just starts like burning all these trees. He's trying to shoot at Bond but there's these like trees that get burnt instead. So as they're doing this, they we then see a sign for the mines. So they're about to go into a minefield. So Bond enters the minefield and he starts shooting at the mines on the ground. He he manages to shoot one and that blows up one of the hovercrafts that's chasing him. Um, and then somehow, I, I'm not too sure how, he ends up in front of Moon's hovercraft. This was all a bit of a crazy scene. So, And there's like all these like separate paths through these trees. But yeah, somehow Bond ends up in front. So they charge into Bond and hit into the back of him. Bond decides to spin it, spin his hovercraft, and then shoot the driver, and then he jumps on Moon's hovercraft. So Moon just starts shooting at Bond, but Bond very cunningly picks up a bulletproof vest that was just there and just, and just blocks all of Moon's bullets. <laughs> yes, because Moon just shoots straight at the vest and nowhere else. Yeah, he shoots like five times directly at the vest, but Bond just like, <laughs> he's just like cowering. Like the hunchback of Notre Dame, just covering <laughs> his head and stuff, walking forward. 
as he's shooting the bulletproof vest. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I'm actually impressed with how much you're like keeping up with what's going on in this whole scene because this was completely uh, what you're describing now was just a blur for me. Oh, so, it's, well chaos. Done. it's It's just chaos. chaos. Uh, so Bond, yeah, approaches him because he uses the the bulletproof vest. And they start doing a bit of fist fighting. We see Bond, or not, sorry, Moon using more of his like martial art, but not much of it really. Just a little bit of some kicks and stuff. And Bond is just using like punches, like classic Bond sort of stuff. So it's quite even. Uh, Moon gets his flamethrower out and shoots it at Bond, but Bond manages to dive out of the way at the last second. And we get kind of an awkward shot of Piers Brosnan diving forward with a fire behind him. And get used to Piers Brosnan diving in this film. Like, there are so many times in this film where he just does, like, a big lunge and dive forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true, actually. And it seems a bit harsh because I was uh, watching a little bit of behind the scenes and apparently he he had a... Maybe this is why, actually, he got a knee injury. Maybe it was all this bloody diving and lunging. It happens all the time. It's very strange. But, yeah, this is, like, the oldest Piers Brosnan is and in some ways they make him do a lot of stuff that yeah. maybe they shouldn't have made him do. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, so he dives out of the way and we see that Moon has kind of lost sight of Bond. I, I don't know how, um, but he doesn't know where Bond is. So he's like creeping around a little bit with his flamethrower and he's on one side where the big fans are that are pushing the, the hovercraft forward and Bond manages to sneak around to the front where the controls are. So he turns the hovercraft to max speed and this sucks Moon onto the fan at the back and there's like a, a small wooden gate that's up ahead and they go smash through into it. The hovercraft goes flying off the edge down a waterfall. And we think, oh no, they've both gone off. But we hear a bell ringing. Because outside of, or just after the wooden gate, there was a bell. And like a big wooden pole that bangs the bell. And Bond was able to grab onto it. And it's just swinging forward, hitting onto this bell. Um, so he didn't go off the edge. And he then drops down. And he says, Joe... Saved by the bell. Classic. That's, yeah, as is, uh, any, as, as good a time as any to use that line with a big you bell. You got to, it's right there. Which he was saved by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's correct. It's factually yes. correct. Yes. So Bond looks over the edge and he sees the hovercraft at the bottom of this waterfall. It's not actually that big of a drop, uh, but you can see the this, you can't see the body, but you can see the hovercraft has been overturned. And at this moment, General Moon, the dad arrives with some soldiers and, he looks over and sees that his son has been killed. So they capture Bond. They just capture him. And we fade to a Korean prison where Bond is being dragged around and some soldiers then duck his head underwater and we see a very sexy female Korean officer. Maybe I shouldn't have said fairy there. That might be exposing some stuff. <laughs> I don't really want to go into right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe, maybe not now. <laughs> There's a female Korean officer uh, look over in there and this then takes us into our opening sequence and I actually quite like this one. I think it's got strong Tomorrow Never Dies energy but I think I was going to say it's more grounded but it's kind of not but I don't know I think it's very much that but it feels a little bit more balanced. I think going from that surfing scene to them sneaking into the base it's got a really good pace with that. It's not all just go go go. There is a little bit of ex escalation there and you've got Bond going undercover with some jokes in there. I quite like the Saved by the Bell line and I like Bond stealing the glasses so you kind of got that humour there and it's also tying into the story as we'll find out so that's top marks for me for that. So it's it's far from my favourite one but I had quite a lot of fun watching this one and I think it's actually like Tomorrow Never Dies but kind of better. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, it definitely escalates it needs that first bit with the the surfing and stuff because to be honest when it gets to the actual fight bat the chase with the hover uh, hovercrafts that's when it just goes a bit too far like like tomorrow never dies if we just started with that or very close to that it would have just been you know like oh whatever just move on with it sort of thing but um yeah i'm glad it at least had some setup because <laughs> that bit with the hovercraft stuff it's just from it's such you could just see them writing it, thinking, right, first, let's have Colonel Moon use a gun. Then he can use um, a flamethrower. Then he can use, I don't know, a grenade launcher, whatever he had. It's just like such a, oh, what can we do next? What can we do next? And it's just like ugh, a bit tiring by the end of it. Also, 
it looked terrible, which we're going to be saying a few times. <laughs> but some bits really looked bad in terms of like the the green screening, like the most kind of overt green screening we've seen yet. I think well, maybe except for like the really old ones where it's rear projection. But um, yeah, like they're so feathery and blurry around the edges as they're doing some of these fight shots. This looks so bad, but. I didn't mind, um, well, no, I quite liked actually Colonel Moon's introduction. I liked when he's kicking the bag and there's someone actually in there. And I kind of like that they made him seem a little bit of a, not a loser, but like as soon as his dad's arriving, he's like, oh no, dad's here. <laughs> Everyone scram. Yeah. And he's got this big stupid hat on that looks far too big for his head. They're kind of setting up that this character is a little bit of a loser um, or or has some issues with like... Um, uh, like power, I guess, like a power dynamic thing going on there. So I do like that. I just, yeah, it, it's it's not going to say for a lot of this film is that it just goes a bit too far for the sake of it, it feels like. Um, but I didn't mind it. I think it was better than Tomorrow Never Dies, for example. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I do see what you mean. Uh, I agree about Colonel Moon as well, where I feel like this type of character is like perfect for Bond to go up against, where Colonel Moon is very kind of full of himself and just feels a little bit like he takes himself way too seriously where as you say like once the general shows up we kind of be like oh no goodness and so he <laughs> thinks a lot of himself and he thinks he's cooler than he is and it's kind mm. of like the perfect person for bond to just kind of mock a little bit and have a big fight with and take out and it, it's like these sort of villains where there's like almost a disconnect with their ego and who they think they are in terms of this power hungry thing it's like it's exactly who bond should be going up against so yeah, even though he, you know, dies at the end, uh, I think it's actually quite a fun character to to bounce off for Bond and do all this this wackiness. But then we move on to the title sequence. And I just want to say that I remember in the last one I said, uh, I think they maybe went a bit too far with the, the World Is Not Enough title sequence uh, in terms of visually. And so you'd expect me to say the same thing here, being... This, you know, die another day. However, I'm just going to say off the bat, I really like this title sequence. So the thing that kind of separates it more than we've seen in previous Bond films is that this one is actually part of the story. It's actually continuing the story, filling in the blanks of where we end up afterwards, which is that you see uh, in the midst of all the CGI stuff, you see Bond being tortured. Like that is the main premise and the, the thematic um, visuals of this title sequence is uh, you get like the scorpions that they use and you get the fire and the ice and the like electricity that like, tasers and all that sort of stuff. But you also get some very kind of sometimes blurry, but you can still make out what's going on. Actual shots of the of film of this happening to Piers Brosnan. And I think it was really well done in terms of the first time they've done something like this. I thought it was great. I really liked it as well. I, it was surprisingly exciting to see all this. And yeah, they still keep that quite strong visual feeling, like the scorpions are the big one, but they're kind of everywhere, which I quite like. They're quite distinct, the scorpions, mm. and they're clearly CGI and stuff, but they they work really well as this to tie into the torture and what you're seeing on screen. And yeah, you then got all those women. And yeah, I don't know. I guess it kind of embraces the fact that it's all fake where you've got ice women and you've got fire women and there's like electric dancing women as well. Yeah. Like yeah, women yeah. being sapped, which I guess is all tied to the theme of a uh, Bond being tortured and stuff. But yeah, it was kind of strange and unsettling, but I guess that was kind of the point. And I was, I was kind of actually ended up having a really awesome time with this one. Um, yeah, they did something different and I kind of think it worked really well. I wouldn't want to see this every time. But I think as a, let's mix things up for this one and actually tie into the plot. Yeah, it, it's surprising how well it worked. There is one particular shot I just thought was far too good for this film, <laughs> basically, which is I think it's the shot where there's like a, some like electrodes and there's sparks and the sparks turn into women diving. And I just thought, wow, like that is actually legit. Like it, this, this looks great. It just looks great. I mean, they do, they, there's a lot of that sort of stuff, like flames turn into women and all sorts of stuff, like dancing women. But um, yeah, I really liked it. Now, I will say that along with some of the things in this film, 
uh, one of the things that people like to complain about with Die Another Day is its song, which is by Madonna. Is it? It is. <laughs> oh. It is. Hmm. And I don't hate it. I don't hate it. It's it's I was looking up um how I would how to define this song. I was looked on Wikipedia as to what they what genre they pull it under and they defined it as electro clash, which is what? yeah, I mean that's I don't know what that is exactly in terms of a genre, but I would say that's like yeah, that kind of is how it sounds. It's it is quite a harsh sounding song, um which I think is why a lot of people don't like it. But it kept me the thing that I, that kind of gave it a pass for me is that it kept me interested along with the visuals going on. I think the song is actually just interesting to listen to. Um, I could do without the Sigmund Freud bits, I think. Yeah. Where she just says Sigmund Freud. But um, she says yeah. something else after that, Joe. Analyze this. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And yeah, but honestly, I actually think this, again, this gets a, maybe more critis- criticism than it actually deserves. I think it's a perfectly fine Bond, fi- uh, Bond song. I don't know how much I'd listen to it outside of the Bond film. But as we said before, it's an earworm. I was it was in my head for days afterwards, so yeah. Oh yeah, definite earworm. And I like it as well. This is kind of what I think I'm figuring out with a lot of these films when I watch them. I just want to know where I stand a lot of the time with a film. And something being a bit weird and different is fine as long as like you're kind of somewhat committing to that and you're bringing that together. And I feel like that's kind of what this is. It's a full commitment of we're going to have this very different sort of action uh, or opening sequence, which has the the live action stuff, which has like Bond being tortured in a Korean prison. And we're going to go all in and just have Madonna sing this weird sort of song with these really this really strong string sound, but also this really kind of strong like electro sort of sounds as well. And I think it those two... Like the visuals in the song, I think, match up extremely well um, and kind of sells what they're kind of going for. So I think this song's a ton of fun. I, I really like it. I don't, I get why somebody wouldn't like it because there's kind of nothing else like this. And it doesn't help that Madonna is just kind of a really hateable human being as well. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> like she's not the most likable. Like nowadays, who cares, right? But there was a time where she was kind of everywhere doing really not great stuff. Uh, which I, I think doesn't help. Or just being very attention-hungry, I suppose, is, is what I mean. Madonna? No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, when you say celebrity not doing great stuff, you think they're just, like, tweeting, like, Nazi stuff. So I, I want to clarify, I don't <laughs> think she's a Nazi. I just think she needs a hug. Um, so oh, for, which, yeah. For the, yeah, again, I don't care about that much stuff anymore, and I think this is a really distinct, unique song. And I would take this over, like, an all-time high any day of the week. At least I oh. remember this one. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. All, it's just night and day between that sort of song. Um, but anyway, uh, after the title sequence, we are back in the cell, North Korean cell, and on screen we learn it's been a whopping 14 months later. That's a big old time jump for a Bond film. I don't know if we've ever had such a time jump. Well, I don't think a, so. A I time thought jump it was very at all. strange that they got the SpongeBob uh, narrator guy to do that voice. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool, but I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we see 14 months later and Bond is looking very different, like we've never seen him before. He's got long hair, long kind of dirty brown hair. He's got a massive, great big bushy beard. He's looking like he's been tortured. He's got you know scars and ripped clothes and bloody and beaten and bruised. And he uh, he looks rough. He looks rough. Who would have thought? So don't get captured in North Korea, basically. Um, but yeah, he is taken to. Uh, he's taken from his cell, and he's taken to uh, the general, General Moon that we saw in the the pre title sequence, and kind of sat down on the chair. And Moon saying, "Oh, I don't condone what they do here, but." Basically, we learn that Bond, throughout all of this torture, he has still not cracked. He's stayed silent, um, despite being abandoned, is what Moon is saying, by his country, by his people. Um, why, you know, why do you do this sort of thing? And uh, I think Bond does say something to make like a little quip. Somehow, I can't remember what it was now, but Moon does make note that he's still joking after all this time. Then he is... Moon is like orders them 
to take Bond away outside. And you think uh, they end up going to this like misty bridge. And there's all these armed troops around there and it's kind of looking a bit dubious what's going to happen to Bond. And Moon starts talking about his son, Colonel Moon, and what happened and how he's hoping that by studying in the West, it would bring uh, the countries closer together. But, you know, it's only kind of done the opposite. And that his son had an ally in the West as well, which is kind of a strange thing to bring up so early on in the film. I guess it does come back, but it's like, yeah, setting up that his son has an ally in the West as well. Well, this comes um, up a ton. Well, the like, bond, the bond thing does, but I'm like, well, why does moons matter? Well, it's the same person. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. the line <laughs> is, I no. think, it, I think. Sorry if you were going to say this, but General Moon says to Bond, for the last time, who, who made uh, my son betray his country? And then Bond says, the same person that betrayed me. Right. Although that doesn't now, not, hmm, I will get to it later on, but that doesn't make sense to me about another thing now later on. But anyway, yeah. So it looks as though Bond is about to be shot. There's like a firing squad of the people with guns behind him. Uh, but then Moon orders him to start walking, start walking across this very misty bridge. He can't really see the other end of. And so he starts walking and suddenly behind him, all these troops stand down. And he wonders what the hell's going on. Kara's on walking and... As he gets sort of to the midway point, uh, another figure comes the other direction. And out of the mist, you see, it's Zhao. What's going on? Uh, well, it's a prisoner <laughs> exchange. <laughs> they're, they're being traded as part of an exchange. Uh, although to me, it seems like a bit of a security risk, letting them walk across at the exact same time. I mean, I guess that's the point of it. But like, they do meet in the middle and uh, kind of say some words to each other about I don't know, threatening each other or something along those lines. Yeah, I um, like how the Tanoi, because there's an English voice telling Bond to move forward. And I like at that point when they're talking, he's like, no, stop it. Don't <laughs> leave him alone. No, come on. Keep going. Don't talk to him. Yeah. yeah. The voice, that's what I put. Like, the voice is like politely telling Bond, keep moving, please. Don't stop. <laughs> Don't make me come over there. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, they eventually do just keep on walking. So we get, um, we see the other side of the bridge. And hey, look, it's Robinson. This MI6 is there in some form, and uh, he's next to this very kind of, I wrote down, smarmy-looking American guy who uh, who sees Bond coming and says, like, oh, you would have thought he was a hero. Um, but yeah, as soon as Bond gets to this other side of the bridge, he doesn't really get very far. He's immediately uh, drugged uh, with a syringe and grabbed and taken on a trolley, and he's taken for a, a bit of a kind of health scan. And we see him in some sort of hospital, uh, on, a, on a hospital bed, having a very futuristic laser health scan. It's like there's laser going up and down his body, and that's how they're looking at his kind of vitals and his organs. And there's this uh, kind of voiceover from one of the doctors saying about how there's signs of venom and antidotes and part of the torture that he had. And that his liver's not doing too well, so it's definitely Bond. Um, but yeah. Um, did you want me to carry on or did you want to talk about well I guess first? it's if we want to go into this torture stuff I guess uh, I, I think I, I guess it's a tricky one with this because it's such a really it's a really interesting idea I think it's a really cool idea about Bond being captured at the start in the opening sequence and then the film kind of properly starting with him like being released and stuff and being very different I think that's awesome and to be honest, I think this film actually does it pretty well. Uh, you might think I might start complaining about it, but I think it handles this stuff in a very cool way. And I almost feel like Die Another Day being that more over-the-top sort of film almost kind of helps pull this off, where if it was kind of like too grounded, I think it might have lost something to it. Um, now, obviously, we do get a tour to stuff in the next film, but that's handled very differently. And I think that works well there as well. But I think in this way, the way they approach it is actually pretty good. Uh, I feel like maybe this idea, people might think it's better for Timothy Dalton, but I always kind of like the edge. Like it lacks a little bit of edge due to the tone of this film. And I feel like that's almost appropriate for the Bond films, that it doesn't take it super seriously, that there is a little bit of a wink and a nod and it does take it somewhat seriously, but it kind of finds a balance that I actually really liked. So I think 
and I liked this as a kid, and I still like it as an adult. I think all this stuff is really cool uh, and really uh, such a great way to start a Bond film, especially one that you're trying to do something different with. Uh... <laughs> well, <laughs> I think there's my answer on that. I'd, I, I also think it's a very good premise. I, I guess you're right. Like, If they had tried to do this any more seriously and, and let's be honest, keep it going further than they do, which is going to last for like another five minutes in the film, if they tried to keep it a running theme, maybe dealing with like any kind of PTSD that Bond had from this or something, it would have stuck out like a sore thumb being surrounded by bloody cyber suits and tsunamis later on. So I guess in that regard, it's good that they didn't do that. That being said, I'm still not going to kind of let them off the hook. I think they it shouldn't maybe shouldn't have been that way at all. You know that that kind of uh, silly at all. And maybe they should have tried to ground it a bit more. And if they're going to have this start, then actually try and carry it on throughout the film. Uh, I'm very mixed on it. I'm glad it's there in the film at all. And you, yeah, you're right. We do get it probably a little bit more realistic in the next film anyway. So it's not like we had to wait too long. But um, uh, I just, I, I wish they'd have done it at least a little bit like they did with Bond's bloody shoulder injury. They kept that going longer. And that was just, <laughs> that was just him hurting his shoulder on the Millennium Dome. In this, it's, you just don't see it ever again. Yeah, I suppose so. But yeah, as you say, I kind of, I, I'm kind of glad they didn't though. I guess my counter argument to all of that would be how, and it, I guess it's something that I like about Die Another Day compared to The World Is Not Enough, where The World Is Not Enough took all these ideas and all these bigger concepts and tried to do them throughout the film and just failed miserably, where I think Die Another Day, its ideas are a little bit, aren't quite as ambitious as that film, and it almost kind of treats it in the way that it wants to treat it to make it work within the film itself. It's like it's not pretending to be a film about a man who was tortured for 14 months and how he's dealing with the PTSD and the stress of it and trying to rebuild his life. No, it's about <laughs> Piers Brosnan as James Bond going in and making some jokes and go, having this bombastic stuff and then it's just there for the plot and to give you kind of this kind of more unique, different opening to then kind of rebuild Bond a bit as the film goes, but again, not really in a character sort of perspective. So... I like that approach. I appreciate that they're picking a lane and they're doing that. Maybe it would have been better if they picked the different lane, which is let's actually do a film where Bond has been affected by this. But I would much prefer this approach than the world is not enough approach, which is we're going to pick this lane. We don't have the map. The road looks really bumpy. <laughs> we Our car is falling apart, but we're going to do it anyway. Die another day says, nope, I know where I'm going on that other path. We're doing that. Get the plot out of the way and then we can move on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I suppose. I, that does make a lot of sense, yeah. I I suppose... No, it's fine. I'll stop. I'll drop it. <laughs> I'll drop it. I'll, <laughs> I just I'll think keep, like, I like yeah. a consistent tone. And the first thing was kind of crazy and over the top. And there is a little bit of a like tonal shift with the torture stuff. But because it, it almost works in this crazy way because it is meant to be more over the top. So it's like, I feel like all this stuff... And the fact that it's not carried on works with that tone. So I was in, I really enjoyed the opening sequence and I enjoyed the, the credit song and I enjoyed this stuff. At the moment, I was just kind of like enjoying all of this stuff and I think it fitted together much better for me than maybe it had any right to. But I feel like there was almost this odd consistency with its odd tone. <laughs> odd consistency with its odd tone. Yeah, well put. Yeah. Well put. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we're still in the hospital room uh, and Bond's on, on the bed and M comes to pay a visit. She comes through the door, uh, doesn't have any grapes with her, which oh. I think is a bit rude. Uh, no scotch that, either. No. <laughs> no bourbon, walk, sorry, it's bourbon. Just, just walking around with a drink, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, but she is behind a glass wall. Bond kind of goes up and spots that he's behind this big glass wall. Uh, so he's like literally being locked away in this hospital. And M is not very happy. She's she's straight off the bat. She's not happy with the situation. Um, she says that Bond's freedom in this this uh, exchange came at too high a price, and gives a little bit of background to what Zhao did to end up in that situation, where he blew up a summit between um, is it North Korea and China or South Korea and China. It's definitely China involved. Yeah. Someone in China. 
uh, and yeah, and killed three people. So uh, yeah, she won. Yeah, she just thinks it wasn't worth it, and Bond should have committed suicide uh, with cyanide pill, which apparently he says he just threw away years ago. I don't know. That seems kind of strange. I, I don't know. Would Bond I, I do like, that? I think he would. Yeah. He's just so confident he'll never need to use it. Yeah, I, yeah. that's how I took it. Maybe the Bond yeah. in the books would have kept it, but I feel like Bond in this Pierce film, Brosnan. it's yeah. like, nah, that's, I'll just take you on the chin. It's fine. <laughs> I'll deal with it. I'll cross that bridge, literally, when, I, when we get to it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, because of that, because uh, of that stuff of Zhao, she's upset. And also, the reason why Bond got out of there at all, out of the, the North Korean prison, is that... Um, I think she says like a week earlier, a US spy was was killed, and so uh, was killed in North Korea. And so the Americans think that Bond has started to to crack and hemorrhaging information to them. So they had to pull him out of there quick. I before... don't think they ever explain that point though, because I think we only get it here. And it'd be yeah. interesting to hear if that actually is an explanation for it, because it's it's more specific than that. Em is saying how they inter- they intercepted a signal coming from that cell yeah which is which exposes the american agent and bond is the only person in that cell or in that jail where the signal came from so that's why the american thinks it's bond because he's literally the only person in there that could have given away that information which is like fair enough but as far as i'm aware that never comes back <laughs> at all i guess i guess the only way that comes back is that you realize who really did that later uh, on oh okay if we find that i because i missed that detail i don't know who did that Oh, okay. Well, hang on. Now I'm thinking. It wasn't the no. very sexy woman, was it? I think it was. You think so? I don't think she. I didn't think she ever appeared in the film again. Oh no, not that, not that sexy woman. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were trying to be like secretive. <laughs> You're still thinking about that sexy woman. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Well. Um... Analyze that. <laughs> 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 no, not, uh, the, not I know who you're talking about, but I can't, why would she be in North Korea sending a sick? I, I mean, I guess it would have to be. Actually, yeah, I assume it's just hacking or something but like I, that. I I don't know. Not, do they ever actually say that, though? No. I mean, I didn't write down that plot point because I kind of forgot about it. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, maybe they don't. Know. I think you're meant to forget about it, but a lot of this stuff in this film, they do explain later on. But now we're talking about this again. I'm like, who went to Bond's? Because I would just. We. we I don't want to talk about this too much, but we're already in it. Who would want Bond freed? Or is it more about getting Zhao freed? Yeah, maybe? I think it's more about getting Zhao back. Oh, right Oh, So they maybe didn't even know or care if Bond was freed or not. They just wanted Zhao to be freed. I guess so, yeah. Right. Okay, That may- I'm on board. That will make sense now. It's moving up the ranks. Yeah. <laughs> I can see it. It's shooting up. <laughs> uh, Bond maintains that he was uh, he was compromised this whole situation that previous mission in the title sequence uh, is compromised by a mole um that's how when uh Zhao did his little camera and uh, that's how they found out his true identity so he wants revenge he wants to go after Zhao uh, and find out more about this but M's having none of it she, she basically says that uh he's useless uh she takes away his double o status and um, wants to send him off for re-evaluation instead, and uh, yeah, you're you're no use to anyone now. She's quite brutal with Bond, despite what she says in the last film. Uh, I get, actually no, I guess it links into what she said in the last film about you know is the best that we've got, but I'd never tell him. So she's that, that she's sticking with that line of of not even giving an inch away to Bond. She's uh, I do kind cold. of think with how the rest of this film goes, and I don't know if they really drop any hints of this being the case that she might know what Bond would do. Like she had to do that because he, you know, he couldn't go back into active duty or anything like that. So mm. she did what she had to do, and almost maybe said that line to push him forward to kind of go and do his own thing. Mastermind M. Yeah, again, they don't. I don't think they ever really say anything that confirms that. But with about Be- with M and Bond, you know, the the whole point of these characters is that they do know each other really well. They are like weird friends. Uh, and they have worked each- with each other a lot. So I somewhat maybe think M knows that by doing all this stuff, she has to do it for political reasons, but probably knows that maybe Bond is not simply going to go like, well, I'll retire then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll <laughs> go Hawaii. for this re-evaluation and uh, have a nice time in Cuba or something like that, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, no, I like that interpretation. And I mean, you're right. Like, it does end up coming back about being off the grid. So, yeah. Yeah. I think you're a good spokesperson for this film so far, I've got to say. <laughs> I was having a good time at this point, so. Yeah. Although, how about now? Because <laughs> she leaves and Bond is is kind of got his head against the glass and is clearly thinking of how to escape. Uh, and you see him sort of clock eyes with the heart rate monitor. Um that's, you know, uh, attached to his bed and attached to him. So we then see Bond lying in bed and you get like close-ups of his eyes as, as he starts to close his eyes and hey, almost kind of a meditation mode and you get flashbacks and clips of what happened to him <laughs> in his torture, like when well, he's being tortured in North Korea and as he does this and zones out, the his heart rate starts to drop on the machine the dangerously low levels and eventually it says that he's going into cardiac arrest so he induces a cardiac arrest from nothing um just from his pure mind power and this obviously gets the attention of the doctors who who come in and start to treat him um get the defib out they start to you know, about to do that and then he just quickly snaps out of it uh zaps the doctors of the defibrillator um and and leaves <laughs> the doors open so he just leaves he he checks out as he says um <laughs> there's a sexy nurse as well that sort of there's a shot like where she's impressed by this i don't know she's like oh wow uh, <laughs> yeah well bonds all like thanks for the kiss of life yeah yeah um and yeah he he leaves the room and we see that he's actually on a boat uh because he's sort of on on the deck of a boat and so he jumps off the edge over the railing and he swims to the shore and you wonder, well, where possibly could he be when he gets up and there's a big sign in the background and he's in Hong Kong in the Yacht Club. So there you go. So what did you think of the heart rate scene? <laughs> you know what? I was fine with it. I was fine with it. I think um, they maybe could have done it a little bit less. They may Maybe not a cardiac arrest. I don't know. I think getting the attention of the doctors is is the smart thing to do and then overpowering them. But did it have to be a cardiac arrest? <laughs> like, Well, I think that... his heart rate literally goes to zero, doesn't it? It's not that he yeah. lowers his heart rate to one safe level. It's not like, oh, it's 20. It's like zero. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I, I just think... Uh, it's just they have to go... They just have to go to the extremes of this film. So I guess that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, now, it did make me laugh, and the reason why I laugh when you're talking about that is because accidentally a running joke of last week's episode with the world is not enough is about how about the film going to a dream like sequence <laughs> flashing yeah. back and a black and white sequence to something that happened before and like yeah. 10 minutes into this film it literally happens there's no dream <laughs> fade unfortunately but it literally is black and white footage <laughs> of stuff we've already seen in the past to explain what's currently happening and i was like wow I forgot that happened. Oh my god, you're right. Oh, yeah. I I I didn't mind it. It was just it was dumb. But Joe, you know what? There's lots of dumb things in this film. Doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Well, this is the thing with this film, right? Like, it's almost like going on a train and going at different stops. There are so many different. Like, if you're not, you can either like get to the platform and see the CGI bullet and say, "I'm not getting on that train," mm. and leave. Or you can get on, and it gives you lots of different opportunities to stop. It gives you very clear stations to say, look at this madness. Maybe, you know, the chaos at the beginning with the, the hovercraft. Maybe like, actually, that's a bit too much for me. I'll get off here. And then we, you know, maybe Madonna does it. You're like, mm -mm, no, no, thank you. And you get off at the Madonna station. Uh, and now we have another one for people to get off with. This weird flashback, again, very early 2000s edited way with bond doing flashbacks to him being tortured and his heart rate coming down and then shooting back up and it almost being this cool like thing so you've got another station and don't worry folks if you don't want to get off now there's plenty of other stops coming up oh but, so many stops oh so many stops but for me it's kind of like i know where i stand with this it's really dumb so i kind of like it <laughs> i wouldn't say it's necessarily needed and I would I agree that maybe they could have toned it down a little bit more. But again, I think it's oddly consistent. So it's like, 
it's very early 2000s, weird editing, weirdly put together nonsense. And that's fine. I don't <laughs> mind that. You're, you're on board. You've got, you've got a, a, um, like a, a ticket ready to go all the way to the end. Well, I have to. This isn't... <laughs> For the sake of this podcast, I've been strapped down. So it's either <laughs> yeah, I enjoy the ride or I, I just start screaming. So Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Bond has arrived at the Hong Kong Yacht Club. So he walks in. It's all very fancy, all very uptight. Lots of older people and in very fancy clothes and women in dresses and man, men in tux. And Bond walks through and he's got like, he's got the big beard. He's also got his chest exposed and it's very hairy. Not quite as hairy as Sean. But he is quite hairy. He is quite hairy. Not quite as sweaty as Sean either, but but yeah. No, he <laughs> literally gets tortured for 14 months and still somehow <laughs> not as sweaty as Sean. Not a single bead. No. <laughs> Good for you, Piers. Uh, but yeah, then he's in like, yeah, he looks terrible. Uh, but he casually walks through, very quite confident, actually. Very confidently uh, walks through and he approaches the desk and he asks for his usual suite and the man at the desk looks at him and he's like, well, do you have a credit card? And Bond kind of looks down, kind of gesturing like, nope. <laughs> but then another man approaches and comes up behind, behind him. He's like, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, welcome. And he's all like, get Mr. Bond the, the presidential suite. And then he recommends like, I think, is it oysters or something? It's some sort of like seafood dish. Uh, It might be oysters, yeah. It's something like that. They then start talking about dinner uh, and what and all this lovely food. And Bond's like, oh, yes, that all sounds good. And, and then he orders some Bollinger. <laughs> oh, I can't remember the year of it, but it, is it 67, the classic Bond Bollinger? Well, it would... Uh, do you know what? It would have made sense if it was 62, right? If they were doing all these references and things. Hmm. It was 60-something. And I, I would have put my bets on it being 62, but I, I honestly can't remember. I think it was 67. And I want to okay. say that's because Roger Moore always ordered the Bollinger 67. We're both going to be wrong now, you realise. It's going to be some I mean, almost number. certainly, yeah. But I, I do know whichever one he ordered is one that he, like, ordered in other films. Okay. All like, right. So There's... it is some sort of a, a callback, but the year wasn't so much... Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't so much a reference to you know the year, but he does order a Bollinger for that. I have he now found a website, oh, <laughs> JamesBondLifestyle.com, which has an entire page dedicated to the Champagne Bollinger and all its appearances. Oh wow! So the first one apparently is Live and Let Die, where Roger Moore orders it. Loves the stuff. And then Moonraker, he does. Where I think they make a 69 joke, it looks like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Octopussy does, it doesn't say the year. A Few to a Kill, it was 1975. In oh, that that's one. a late Bollinger. Yeah. And then Living Daylights, another 1975 for the Bollinger. Mm. And then License to Kill was a 1979. So actually, these are progressing quite a bit. Interesting. Um, yeah, Golden Eye was a 1988 Bollinger. Tomorrow Never Dies was a 1989. The World Is Not Enough was a 1990. And, oh, let, let me get this right. Bond asked Mr. Chang for a Bollinger 61. 61? 61. 61. Holy moly. Oh my God, and the Bollinger appears in all, the other, in all of the, the Daniel Craig films. <laughs> okay. So well, it, was we have to, it was 61. We're going to have to try and remember this now. <laughs> What's the Bollinger? I have to get the Bollinger number of each one. And this whole page is filled with like, oh my God, there's like a poster for Die Another Day, which has like a Bollinger bottle in ice, which has all like oh. the Bond branding on it. Oh, I bet they loved this film for that. Yeah. They must have done. Like there are apparent, there's like multiple posters. Like No Time to Die had a Bollinger poster. <laughs> it was like champagne, the champagne of James Bond Bollinger, No Time to Die, only in cinemas. Wow. <laughs> So it was, it was 1961. Unless that site's just lying, but we'll never know, I guess. We're not going to watch it again. So anyway, so the Bollinger has been ordered. So I think uh, Mr. Chang is this character's name. I think Bond says, uh, hello, Mr. Chang. 
And Mr. Chang says, oh, I've been busy, Mr. Bond, because he sees the state of him and he says, just surviving. And we cut to Bond in his hotel room and is in a smart white shirt, smart trousers, and he's just finishing up shaving. So he's also had a haircut at some point during that. So now this is straight back to classic Piers Brosnan Bond. Uh, all the all the hair is gone and he's just wrapping that up. So not on the chest, not- though. Hmm? <laughs> Not on the chest. Still there on the chest. Don't worry. Do we see his chest again? Not all the hair. Um, we must do. Well, surely not in Iceland. <laughs> and in Cuba, I think he's wearing that very casual blue shirt. Maybe. Joe, you know what? Maybe he did get rid of all the hair then. He might have. Here's the thing, though. I like. We definitely saw his chest in Goldeneye. I remember some hair, but not as much hair as we see in this film. Maybe just a little trim. Maybe. I don't want to accuse <laughs> Piers Brosnan of maybe, you know, adding a little extra hair because he knew what was, you know, padding his he- chest hair, but <laughs> I'm not saying that didn't happen. Oh, oh. I see what you're going for there. Mm. Slander. <laughs> Sued. <laughs> Sued. <laughs> see you in court, Piers. Uh, so, yeah, so Bond hears a knock at the door and there's like a masseuse. A young woman, masseuse there, and she enters in and like he are like she says, I'm gonna give you a massage and says, Get down on the bed, go face down. But as she's kind of setting up and looking in the mirror, Bond goes up to her behind and starts kissing her and she's like, Oh, I'm not that sort of masseuse. Of which Bond says, I'm not that sort of what does he say? Not that sort of guy? That sort of customer? Customer, yeah. Is it a customer, yeah. And he says that because he finds a gun strapped to her leg between her thighs. So he grabs the gun and then he picks up an ashtray and throws out a mirror nearby and it smashes the mirror and we see Mr. Chang and two cameramen are there. So Bond points the gun at Mr. Chang and he was like, I know your Chinese intelligence. I've always known. Um, So, and he's like, oh, we need to talk. So he sends the man, the men with the camera out and the woman out as well. So him and Mr. Chang can talk and you get a funny, another line as well, which I quite like where he's like, Chang still got his hands up and Bond's just like, put your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> Please, come on. <laughs> Something I like about this film, like it's not the funniest Bond film, but all these little lines for the most part work for me, which is more than I can say for like the world is not enough in certain other Bond films. Mm. Uh, so... Bond is talking to Chang and is saying, I want to go over Zhao, uh, after Sao, and I know he killed three Chinese agents, and that was at the summit. So M said before that he blew up a summit and he killed three people. Those were three Chinese agents. So Bond is saying, I will go and get Zhao for you, because I know you're after him, if you can get me into North Korea. And Chang's like, well, what's in it for you if you're taking out Zhao for us? And he just says a chance to get revenge. And Zhao has info that he needs. So they all leave and we cut to Chang at the front office at the, at the hotel. And Bond approaches and Chang says, oh, here's a here's a thank you from us. Here's a box. Here's a little present for us. And uh, Bond opens it up and there's a passport and tickets to Cuba. And he's like, well, Cuba? Why are we going there? And Chang explains that Zhao was last seen at Havana in Cuba. So... Like there's some sort of line here about saying, give us a, his our best or something like that, and Bond says he will. So now we're heading to Cuba. I think like a lot of this scene is more like a, a little bit of a cool down from the torture stuff. Oh, because definitely. I feel like a lot of it is like more comedy focused. Just a just a bit of breathing space, you know. Um, and and. I don't know. I don't want to go into like every single thing that's like, oh, that's a reference to this film. That's a reference to this film because there's ton. There's a ton in this film. Being the 40th film, they just try to squeeze in so many. Some I think are more overt than others, but even in like little bits, you can see you could make links to other films like this one with the recording behind the mirror is a bit like from Russia of Love. Um, so yeah, I think it's good to have these moments that it's not just crazy action. And you can get kind of smaller things like this and actually, I don't know, pay attention a little bit more, I suppose, rather than just zone out with some things like like bloody hovercraft chases. Oh, you mean the references make you pay attention more? Well, yeah, like it, it, 
sometimes like little background details and stuff. There's some coming up later on where like you you really have to pause if you want to get everything. But even like this, to to the to someone who's not a Bond fan, it'll just be like you know the, the film and that won't matter. But if you're a Bond fan, you might pick up an extra stuff. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to be honest. I picked on up on very little of the references. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I got the fundable one. Don't worry about that. Picked up on oh, yeah. that. Oh yeah. <laughs> But I maybe saw like three or four, if that, references. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, I kind of expected to see more, but I, I guess it's just how I watch films. I very much, I, I try to turn my brain off, which I guess is the right approach for this film. Uh, so for me, I don't really kind of pick up on those smaller details that put into films in general. So for me, I, I didn't connect hardly any of these. I think that's probably a good thing though overall. It's better than it being the opposite where they just get in the way and seem too forced, so yeah, maybe not a problem. I did see the dead woman covered in gold in this scene, though, like, <laughs> just in the closet oh. next to Chang. Yeah, a <laughs> golden woman. Yeah, well, you don't want to put that right in the middle of the screen. No, but you just, just have just, that on the side. Just for the true fans, you know. Yeah, it's like, what's that sparkling in the closet? Oh, it's the it's the dead woman. <laughs> it's Jill Masterson. She's she's back. She's back. <laughs> oh, they just put her in the closet. They should have buried her, maybe, but. No, no. But yeah, not too much to the scene, but I think it works quite well. It's a little bit of a cool down. It, it's Bond in a hotel. It's kind of him becoming Bond again and classing himself up. It's nice to see that transformation and it is nice to see we get we get a bit of Pierce or Harry, so it's nice to see him like back as Bond to kind of go off to another Bond adventure. Again, it depends on your expectations of the films and stuff. For, for me, they're kind of, it's quite consistent with what we've seen before. Bond gets to kind of do the hotel stuff, a few jokes here. It's nothing amazing, but it's it's solid stuff. And it also, with him getting the nice clothes again and a haircut and shaving, that is the signal to be the, yep, that that torture thing, that's done now. We're back. This is back to the bond you know and love. It's, it's very much a kind of line in the sand. We're moving on now. We're going back to the tried and tested stuff. Yeah, we, we would see this shaving idea, which is not a sentence I would ever think I would say, in Skyfall. They actually do the same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not yeah, but we, we get a more condensed kind of, I guess, popcorn flick version of it. Mm. Yeah. So we just cut to Cuba. We cut to Havana. So that's something I quite like as well. That scene is not super long. Like I think the pacing of this film is pretty good as well. So, um, But anyway, we cut to Havana in Cuba and we get some shots of the this town on the shore, and we get some very over the top like Cuban music, <laughs> like very like da 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 da, like really over the top. So if you didn't know they were in Cuba, the music kind of helps sells that uh, for you. Yeah, very in your face. I didn't. I, I quite liked it though. Yeah, I don't mind it. It's like it again. It's just what this film is going for. It's not trying to be this slick, classy thing. It's Bond had this kind of funny city scene and now he's off to Cuba, so ba 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 da ba. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so Bond is walking down the street in sunglasses and in a this blue shirt. It's it's odd that I would mention it, but this shirt really stood out to me because it doesn't look like anything that Bond would ever wear. It looks like he's on holiday. Yeah, he, 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 like, looks... he looks like a tourist, right? Yeah. So we go from Bond being all in his suit and becoming Bond again just for him to put on like some tourist gear. And some shades. He and he's got shades. the shades. Yeah, he can't. Oh, yeah. Piers Brosnan cannot get away from the glasses in these he films. He can't. He loves the stuff. At least he looks better than Roger Moore in Live and Let Die, though, in that blue get-up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, on the boat? Uh, oh, he might have gone in the boat, but when he's with Rosie and he gets in that blue get-up. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, but, but anyway, so Bond enters this shop which i believe is some sort of like sweatshop a load of people making clothes and bond goes up to a desk and he he says i've got something to come and pick up and he says i'm with universal exports and the guy's like i don't know who that is and he was like phone it in just just ask the guy so this guy at the desk who's like this older gentleman who doesn't look very impressed he he phones in and says like yeah universal exports and he then says come on through that's all fine so then there's like, yeah, Bond and this old man just walk through a sweatshop and it's a bit sad, really. I don't, I, it's like we never really see this place again. I guess this is supposed to be more like corruption to set up the character that Bond is about to talk to. 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. I because he's he's basically going to be like a bit of an Intel ally character, isn't he? So yeah, I, but not a very nice one, I guess, by the looks of it. Not very nice in terms of his own country. No, I just thought it was weird that they actually show this a sweatshop in a Bond film, but there's no mm. way behind it or anything. It's just a sweatshop. And there's like a man at the front of everyone working away, reading a newspaper over like a radio, just keeping up, I guess, every just like reading a newspaper everyone so everyone knows the news. Yeah. I guess they didn't have radio, so they just had to, that's what they did. It's it's very, it's a very minor thing because the film doesn't spend any time on it. But I was like, is that a Cuban sweatshop? Oh, and it's gone. Okay. Especially since it's just come after a very fancy looking hotel. <laughs> it's just whiplash with the uh, different types of settings. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so Bond goes around the back, or I think he goes onto a rooftop potentially with the older man, and he sees a man with a cigar sitting down. So Bond sits down to talk to him. The The older gentleman who led him there gets a gun out, I think a revolver. And I did not write down the cigar man's name. I don't know if you did. I did. His name is Rahul. Rahul. Okay, I'll try to remember that. <laughs> but yeah, so Rahul, this is a... Oh, somewhat older gentleman. He's got a beard. He's got like he's in like a white suit. Like he looks very kind of, he looks wealthy. Um, and he's there with his big old cigar. So I think the whole idea is that Bond ordered the cigar. Um, I don't know what the name of it is. Again, do you remember the name of the cigar? No clue. Okay, cool. But yeah, Bond ordered the cigar, and now the man is smoking the cigar, and he was saying, "Oh, I never thought I would light this cigar," and. He asks, like, do you know what's so special about it? And Bond says it's a slow burning, so it never goes out. So the whole thing with the cigar is that actually this man is, Raul, is a sleeper agent. I'm assuming for MI6. So what Bond has done by ordering or asking for this cigar and saying it's from Universal Exports is, you know, say, hey, MI6 needs help. I think it's MI6, but yeah, he's some sort of a sleeper agent, I believe. Yeah, it's basically just a code word, isn't it? Yeah, it's just something to say, like, I don't think this guy is officially like, oh, this is me working for MI6 in this place. There's this, like, passcode, so if MI6 is in the area, they have someone to talk to, potentially due to the relations between Cuba and America. I'm assuming mm. that's why all this is happening. Again, don't know that much about <laughs> these sort of politics. I don't know about Korea. don't really know about Cuba, but you don't really need to know it. They've got funky music. That's yeah, all you need to know. I, I just remember the music. That's all. I've that's got. all I need to know. Yeah, so uh, Bond explains that he's after a North Korean terrorist, a man called Zhao. Um, and there's like a little bit of dialogue here where Ryo is saying how all well, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And Bond's like, no, not this guy. He's not. That's, that's not <laughs> no, his no. deal. No. <laughs> I think that's only in there because of the Cuba stuff. Like they, you want, they really want to jam in all this like Cuba references in here. Like a sweatshop, this guy smoking a big old cigar, <laughs> being rich with a big beard. It's like the they car. really want you to know yeah. this is Cuba. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So the Raul says I can call in a favor, um, and I think he explains that. So um, Zhao has been found on a small island nearby, and on this island there's a. A very strange clinic that only like the leaders of the world and the rich use. And the whole point in this strange clinic is to increase their life expectancy and do all these other ones. And so, yeah, I think at this point they've cut into an office. I don't know why, <laughs> but now they're talking in an office. And yeah, this is where uh, Raul was explaining where Zhao is. Um, and once again, Raul was all like, yes, our health system is second to none. It's like the best health system in the world. It's like, why are you throwing what Cuba stuff? We get it. Sponsored by Cuba. Sponsored by Cuba, I guess. Fever La Revolution. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I don't, actually, I don't think Cuba would have the money to sponsor a Bond film. I'm not sure. No, probably not, actually. Not, not so much. Uh, but yeah, so he explains like, yeah, he's on an island, so you need to go to that island. And Bond picks up a revolver that's on the table and some binoculars and asks can i borrow these and he's all like of course anything else you need and bond's like i'm gonna need a fast car and then the guy with the or Ryle was like smiles and tips his cigar it's like oh <laughs> I, I don't think he says anything i think he just looks at bond and then we cut to bond on the road in a very old 70s sports car so i actually thought it was a very cool looking car it's just not supposed to be fast 
No, well, that's another thing about the whole Cuba stuff is that it's full of those old American cars. Yeah, like because America stopped sending them cars, all their cars are super old. <laughs> yeah, and but they look, you know, they look great. All these old, I, I don't know what that is. I think it was a type of Ford, but um, yeah, they it's a cool looking car, and it's 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 uh, different to the usual BMWs and stuff. So yeah, well, I think that's what they're trying to hammer home, right? Like Bond is on his own, so they're trying to hammer that idea off. Like, look at him driving a very non Bond car uh, and also tying into the cuba stuff but you know again they're they're having fun with it they're not trying to make this super serious bond bond is out for revenge like in license to kill this is bond isn't a double row agent has been expelled but they again they just have a little bit of fun with it which you know we already had the more serious take on this with license to kill and that didn't super work for me some of it did some of it didn't um so actually taking it in a more jokey way i don't mind <laughs> i don't mind it's a it. different different spin yeah yeah so what did you think of a uh, raul uh just a bit of a nothing character to be honest i don't think he was usually that sort of character is a bit more or the ones that i remember is because they're a bit more likable have a bit more presence on screen I, I they you can tell that they were trying to do that with like little as you said the little looks of gears and the cigar and smoking and it's kind of suave but I don't know, not to the same levels as I think we've had in the past with people like, uh, who did we like really recently? Um, I guess Zukovsky's. Yeah, I think, yeah, I remember recently. Zukovsky we talked about liking. Yeah, and, and uh, what's his face from, from Rush of Love? Like those sort of characters, I think they stick in my mind. This this guy would not stick in my mind. Sorry, Rahul. Yeah, I don't blame you. I, I do think for how little is in the film, though, he is surprisingly oddly likable despite running a sweatshop and having this i don't know <laughs> I, I think the the guy is kind of quite charismatic i think he he and bond going back and forth is pretty entertaining and the guy smoking this huge cigar smirking with his suit yeah as you say ultimately he's a nothing character you can't really compare this to some of the other great bond side characters but for how little is in the film i thought he was actually surprisingly likable did you see the book that Bond picks up when he's in his office as well? No, is this going to be another reference? Yeah. So it's a bird-watching book, hence why he later says that he's an ornithologist. Um, but the book is a real book called like Birds of the West Indies or something. And the author's name, which apparently is where Ian Fleming got the name, is James Bond. Oh. And but you actually see if you look and pause it, they've scratched out the name James Bond on the book. <laughs> so Otherwise, that'd be a bit weird. But yeah, that's a deep reference, though. It is. That's it a really good is. one. For a second there, I thought you were going to say, and did you see the name? It was J W Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming there's no J W Pepper references in this film. Hmm. Is there any racism in the film? I didn't, um, maybe a little. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if there was that was that was the reference yeah in cuba bond sees jw pepper oh, on no. holiday <laughs> oh man that'd be god damn commies no jw pepper <laughs> stop <laughs> oh uh but yeah so bond is in his fast car which looks quite cool more cuban music and he pulls up to this like resort this like bar this like deck it's like a hotel by the beach and it's got like a deck, you know, very, one of those very like tropical sort of places. And we also get like a Cuban guitar version of the Bond theme a little bit here. So it's not just like over the top Cuban music. It then just like plays the riff a little bit on a guitar, mm. which is interesting. I do kind of like that this film, again, like David Arnold went crazy with the Bond theme and Toronto Never Dies. This one finds the balance a little bit more, but... You know, I guess I'll say this again. Tonally, it matches the film. So I kind of like just having a little bit of fun. Just like, ah, just do a Cuban version of the Bond theme for a little bit. Just throw it in there. But then even even then, it's not like the massive blaring Bond theme. Because at points in this film, I did think, oh, in another one, that this is where they would have put the Bond, like the big bombastic Bond theme. But they don't. They do like a little bit and then they, they restrain themselves. So yeah, they still don't sort of go crazy with that and make it lose all impact which is good yeah an oddly nice balance uh, so bond goes up to the bar on the beach and orders a mojito and he looks over and he sees like a group of people like these guys and women on their laps and one of them who 
I want to say is Irish. Oh, the annoying one. Yeah. I, I wondered, at first I thought he was British. I, was like, I oh, thought great. he was like, yeah, Cockney or something. But um, it's South African. I looked up because I actually oh. wondered that. Yeah, after the fact. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I wasn't too sure about his accent. It was a quite a unique one. But yeah, uh, he he's just very rude to a, a waiter, basically. he's He points a gun at the guy's crotch and threatens to shoot him. And they all laugh. And he's like, bring me more drinks and girls. And they all laugh. So Bond then, and, uh, you know, prepare to be shocked. Don't be drinking anything at this point in time. Put down any drinks. Make sure you're sitting down. Bond starts smoking. <gasps> a cigar oh you're oh no he does yeah like all that all that work they did in the other Pierce Brosnan films where he was like knocking out people who were smoking and binning cigars and this one he's like well I guess I'm not an agent anymore <laughs> let's let's live it up <laughs> big old cigar let's go yeah yeah going from oh you know no cigarettes to smoking Way worse than cigarettes. <laughs> it's just, eh, who cares? Who cares? We're in Cuba, eh? Yeah. And then he sees Roger Moore in the corner smoking a cigar as well, and he winks at him, and he <laughs> winks back. I will say, just going back ever so slightly, um, one of the weird things that... I mentioned before how there's just some weird things in from Bond films that I say in everyday life that just make no sense out of context. So, for example, one of them, not being a very good one, is me going... A woman, whenever oh. something about a woman comes up. Um, <laughs> oh, there, I'm sure there's moments for this in this film. Okay, but um, one, another one that I use is something about the way that Pierce Brosnan says mojito, because I guess he's doing it in an accent as if he is, you know, uh, speaking Spanish. And um, so whenever I'm in a bar now and I'm uh, getting a cocktail and I see a mojito and I want a, I want a mojito, it always has to be mojito. <laughs> it's just he says oh. it with such a twang. And I'm just like, oh, I didn't why, notice that. Why do I do these things to myself? Well, I have all the things to remember in this film. Why is it that I remember the way he says mojito so so stupidly? God That's knows. That's awesome. Mojito. Well, it is like if we break it down, it's an Irishman playing an Englishman trying <laughs> to do like a Spanish accent <laughs> That's true. It's going to get a bit muddled. Yeah. Yeah. That's whatever that is is not going to be good. Well, maybe that is, I'm sure that probably is how you say mojito more accurately, but it just sounded funny to me and funny, funny sounding things stick with me, I guess. <laughs> so assuming how Moonraker is where the woman quote comes from and is ranked very high, I would assume Die Another Day is going to be right up there because it's got another funny quote that will be in your head forever. Mm, you think so, wouldn't you? You'll see. Okay, You'll all right. see. All right, we'll put it all together here, so... Uh, yeah, so Bond is smoking a big old cigar and he's looking through the binoculars because across the way is the island and the clinic. So he's looking at that with the binoculars and it's almost like a castle. Like it looks very much almost like a castle. This might have been like an old fort or something that they converted into a clinic because that's somewhat what it looks like. So Bond is looking around with binoculars and he then looks at the water and he sees... Mojito? No, no. <laughs> the woman one. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh um, uh, Honey Rider. No, wait. <laughs> wait, different, different one. Wrong one. <laughs> Halle Berry. <laughs> so he sees a woman. Uh, oh, 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 you set me up there. I'm so sorry. That's fine. It's fine. I'm so sorry. We've only I'm done just 20 go. of these. Why would we have chemistry? <laughs> I'm just going to go now. <laughs> <laughs> For a mojito. I could do it with a mojito. They're delicious. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so sees... A woman? Oh, it is. <laughs> Perfect. I'll just edit that so it syncs up. Please do. I'll just cut all this out and just put you going, a woman, there. <laughs> it That'd work. be great. It's going to be great. That'd be great. Uh, so, so yeah, so... So Halle Berry steps out of the water, and I only say that because she's so recognisable <laughs> that there are just some actors where you're just like, that's that's just Halle Berry. Um, so Halle Berry kind of starts getting out of the water. Well, she like goes out of. She's not walking out of the ocean. She's like standing up in the ocean, and we get like a slow mo, her going upwards in her bikini, kind of going side to side, and she's she's very posy. This is incredibly posy, I would say. So 
after that, and I think the music goes along with this as well. So after that, she does then walk out, walk out of the water onto the deck and goes up to Bond. Or oh, I think she goes near Bond and Bond says, Magnificent view, and offers her a mojito. She introduces herself, I'm Jinx, is what she says. And Bond says the line, I'm... Actually, no, I don't think he says I'm Bond, James Bond. I think he just says, I'm James Bond. Um, and I want to say they do that because they already did the Bond, James Bond line before. But I never wrote down in my notes where that happens. But they definitely do it in this film. Well, she says, my friends call me Jinx. And then he goes, my friends call me James Bond. It's very, very flat. Is it like a subversion of it? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels like. They, they don't do it. Um, so... There's a little bit of back and forth here. I didn't write down all these because it went quite fast and I, I didn't really like it either. <laughs> oh, I, I don't blame you. This dialogue is terrible. Yeah, so Jinx is saying she's called that because she was born on Friday the 13th. And then she asks what Bond is doing here. And he's like, I'm just here for the birds. And they then start just talking about birds <laughs> for ages. Like, again, I didn't write any of this down because it's like, I think they are actually like, the whole point is that this is like a sexy scene of like two people going back and forth and they're using like the analogy of birds, but it kind of comes back on itself where it feels like they are genuinely talking about birds. Like this is no longer like a <laughs> metaphor for them going away and having sex. This is just like, no, there's actually quite a lot of local species. I'm very, <laughs> I'm <laughs> if you look here on page 32. Yeah, here we go. Look at these. Uh, you know, they only come for two months of the year. So I'm here to check that out. <laughs> Um, but they end with like Jinx saying about like oh about what about the owls and Bond's like there's no owls on this island which is probably correct (laughs) Um, and he's saying there's nothing to see here until morning and she asks like well what do predators do when the sun goes down and Bond says they feast like there's no tomorrow and something I haven't mentioned about this scene is that there's a really awkwardly set up shot on Jinx's face for for this scene. So initially it's just them two talking, but when it's meant to be getting more steamy because they keep talking about bloody birds, they then do this like really awkward framing of her head where it just doesn't look right. And then you just have to put up with this really awkward line delivery from her with this, to be fair, awful dialogue and... Yeah, I guess we've already said it. This is pretty bad. This, as far as an introduction to the Bond girl, it's bad. She's the dialogue, both of their dialogue, because as, as you say, it's this terrible word play, double entendre, risque stuff, and it's just falls so flat. It just goes on for too long. I think yeah. you just let's just have a line or two and then move on. But it's like there's this whole conversation about predators, and it's just stop. I don't care. And there's also really, one of my little nitpicks about this is that there's some really bad continuity in these shots, especially when she's having a drink of the mojito. Uh, it's just like, if you, it's such a small thing, but if you actually watch her, the cup, the, the glass is moving all over the place from shot to shot. It really bugged me. Oh, that is bad. But yeah, I think um, not a great introduction to Jinx. And I'm going to be honest, I think it's kind of a sign of things to come for her dialogue. It's pretty much this way the whole way through the film. Yeah, as you said, the the way they shoot the scene ain't great. And that's the main thing that stood out to me because it just looks so awkward, some of these shots. It just doesn't work. I just don't think this director, who we haven't talked about yet, some of that is because I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, but it's another Pierce Brosnan film, so we get another new director. It's a man called Lee Tamahori. Yeah. Now... Am I right in thinking that he did like a big action film, well-known action film before this? Uh, I'm looking at it now. It wasn't uh, Fast and Furious, was it? No. No. So No, okay. If you're if you're thinking before this, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page, there's not much here. Oh, okay, fair enough. Like Mile Holland Falls is the main one I would recognise. Maybe. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know where I got that from then. Why did they pick him? Who knows? Yeah, it's another like odd choice. He did Along Came a Spider, which is a film with Morgan Freeman in it. And The oh. Edge, which has Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin in it. Okay. So he was doing like all these kind of dramas and neo-noir crime thrillers. So I guess a little bit more appropriate than 
what we've seen before. But yeah, that's some of what... Not a no-name actor. Not director, sorry. But not someone experienced. It, it, it somewhat follows the trend. Of they just kind of yeah. let anyone do these films. Sounds like it. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I think he definitely does bring something to this film. I can't really relate it back to his other work, but it definitely feels unique. And I think that's probably because of him. But if there's something he can't do, it's these scenes. And the dialogue doesn't help. And Halle Berry and Pierce Brosnan don't really sell it as well. Um, it, it doesn't really bother me that much, but I guess it's another station to get off at. If you see Jinx come out the water, <laughs> unless I was talking about owls to bond for five minutes, I, would, I wouldn't blame you for getting off at that station. Um and yeah, there is something very, very odd about how they try to do the Doctor No reference. I think it kind of falls flat on its face a little bit because of mm. the way it's shot with Bond looking in the ocean with binoculars. It just doesn't have the same feeling at all. Um, so I don't think that reference really worked as well. No, I think that one is perhaps a bit... Oh, no, I was going to say it's a bit too on the nose, but there I can't say that because there are other ones that are probably equally on the nose that I don't mind, so that would be a bit hypocritical. I think uh, doing a Doctor No reference with, like, referencing Honey Rider, that's a great idea. I think that makes sense for the Bond girl to do the same thing that the original Bond girl did. I like that. I just think yeah. it's shot in that, again, early 2000s way, where it's all slow-mo coming out the ocean and stuff, and then we go... Like, it, it's just, I guess the execution of it is kind of quite off and doesn't quite work, and... Maybe if Piers Brosnan sung underneath the mango tree, it could have been saved. <laughs> I was, was going to say. But that's sadly, we don't get that. No. Oh. You have to wait till Mamma Mia till you hear him sing. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. oh, don't. It's fine. It's up to you. That one hurt. <laughs> um, I was going to say, just going back to Lee Tamahori again, I, I don't... This I'm not 100% on this, but I know... Like you saying about how these sort of scenes aren't the best, but then compare that to some of the more action oriented scenes, which I think are a bit stronger, if you know, too strong in some ways. Um, that does line up because the one thing that everyone talks about in this film later on, the, the tsunami stuff, I'm pretty sure in the uh, behind the scenes documentary I was watching, he was like, this was like, he was really pushing that, and the, the, the exaggerated nature of it. So I wouldn't be surprised if. He focused a lot on those bits, and then these sections are the ones that therefore became a bit weaker because you didn't really know how to do them. Just two people talking to each other. Yeah, like Bond is a surprisingly versatile sort of franchise, and you kind of forget that sometimes. And you, you, you know, each director has their own strength, but for someone to really balance all of that stuff is very difficult. And normally, mm. the ones who will do that would be like, I guess, a Martin Campbell that would actually probably just write some of that stuff out, or he just messes it up, like the beach scene. Like, <laughs> no, like it's really hard to balance all of that stuff, especially with the modern era of Bond and how they do want to put more weight into the Bond girls and stuff like that. So it's an almost impossible task. So I don't blame him too much, but you do see, like, you know, obviously Sam Majors is brought on later on and does that stuff somewhat well. So you can kind of see director's uh, strengths here. Um, so, you know, I, I don't get too mad about this scene. It's just like, yep, it's not the strong point of the film. It's very awkward. Doesn't really work. So it's just part of it. So after all that talk about predators and what they do in the night, it fades to Bond and Jinx in bed, uh, sleeping together. And it's very passionate, very, very steamy. Um but they do find time to have a bit of fruit as well in, in bed. She starts cutting this little pear thing, I don't know, with a knife. Uh, i got to say, this whole... Like, this is, like, very... In terms of a Bond film, this is very risque, I would say. It's probably... Like, Bond films always have an element of sex in them. Like, the sex appeal lot is always something in them and has been since the very beginning. But, obviously, standards change and, and what's normal for what's shown on screen changes... And I don't know, in the past, I think they're just, they've been a bit more suggestive and just generally more tame. And maybe I'm just a big prude, but this one just really stuck out and not for the right reasons. Uh, this is, to me, this gave me vibes of when you're a kid and you're watching a film with your parents and then this sort mm. of scene comes on and you're like, oh, what do I do? I think I go to the toilet. <laughs> like, it's just <laughs> awkward. I just, it was so awkward. I think what, 
makes it feel like that. First of all, I want to talk about the fruit stuff because that is gross. Like <laughs> she cuts a fruit in half, shoves it in her face, and without really chewing, they start kissing again. I'm like, ew. <laughs> In fruit like kiwi juice or whatever is everywhere like she didn't swallow it it's not, that would have been a mess um, <laughs> i love the bit she focused on sometimes <laughs> it's just odd i didn't like it Halle Berry, mm. it's gross um but i think it's because it starts with them actually doing it like yeah. the impression i got is that they were at like this scene starts with them towards the end and actually they then finish and then that's when the fruit stuff comes. And I think that's the difference. In a Bond theme film, you always see the start or the end. But this one is actually like showing them very sweaty, naked, like actually doing it. And I think that's where it feels a little bit strange because that's what they never usually show. And I guess I'm going to come and join you being a prude uh, because I think it maybe would have been better if they didn't show that. So obviously you don't see anything proper because it's still a Bond film and it's a 12. But yeah, if they kind of edited it out to make that, to focus on what they normally focus on, maybe it actually would have been a little bit better or more in line with what we've seen before. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, we cut to the next morning and Bond is in bed, all alone. Jinx is gone. Uh, this is this is where you see shirtless Pierce and he's still, he's still just as hairy. So um, oh, all right, just a reference out. back. All right, that's fine. But yeah, <laughs> he gets up and uh, goes, looks out the window and sees kind of outside there's a little jetty heading towards the the island that Zhao is on and there's like all these guards around there and a little boat ready to go and Jinx is on there Jinx is on the the jetty showing some documents to these guards clearly about to board and head towards the island so Bond um, thinks of a plan and we see him he pays a visit to the annoying uh, rude South African man we saw outside. He's got this wheelchair and heads to his his hotel door, knocks on his door, and uh, the the man opens it and says, "Oh, who the hell are you?" Sort of thing. I didn't order. A, I didn't ask for a wheelchair. And Bond just knock, knocks him out straight away. <laughs> well, he says, no. "I don't need a bloody wheelchair." And Bond says, "You do now," and punch him in the face. Yeah. So he goes. He goes down, and Bond heads into the room grabs his admittance papers that he was given by the waiter earlier and uh, puts them on this chair. And I love how there's this woman in the bed, probably one of the women from earlier, um, but she just doesn't care. Like She just looks up, she's like, hola, and, <laughs> and <laughs> carries on. She's just chilling. She doesn't need this drama. Uh, but yeah, Bond heads to the jetty with the knocked out South African guy in the chair, shows the guards the papers and kind of acting as... Uh, as his carer, I guess. Um, and on the island, in this clinic, we're inside it now, and he's still got the guy with the wheelchair, and he sees some doctors and some some armed people head into this particular doorway, uh, some sort of restricted area. And so to create a distraction, Bond hides around a doorway, sort of, and just launches this guy in the wheelchair, <laughs> just launches him straight into the wall, um so yeah he's on the floor and that obviously gets the attention of all the people around him all the guards that were in front of this door and nurses they come over and start looking and with that cue uh bond heads outside through a window through some like through another family's room in this clinic pinches some grapes as a little snack is that the thunderball one you were thinking of by the way no, there's a very obvious fundable one. Okay, I did wonder because yeah, there is it, but that's also a little one as well. In the yeah, yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah, 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 it is, isn't it? Yeah, and so he grabs some crepes and then goes back inside, like past the doorway, basically. So he's made it past, and um, he goes through. There's a dead end eventually, uh, except there's a big mural on the side of a wall and a camera, kind of suspiciously pointing towards this blank wall with a well a mural on it and so that kind of gives away that there must be something more to this area he unplugs the camera and starts to feel on the on the mural for any secret button and you can kind of see the button really obviously <laughs> it's like this little little star in the middle uh, it gives that a push and the secret passageway opens up and he walks down and suddenly we're in the man with the golden gun because there's all these i'm gonna 
I said I wouldn't say too many references, <laughs> Can't but this one, himself. this this one is like so obvious in there. Is that like all these rotating mirrors on the wall behind him, um, just like Scaramanga's fun house? And I think there's DNA strands in there as well, like linking into the gene therapy stuff. But yeah, um, he goes and starts to explore further. I that one didn't click either. Ah, okay. I'm getting you with some. <laughs> yeah, we're getting some. I do think that's really funny though about the star, as you mentioned, where it's it is quite obvious. But you can tell that, like, I guess Piers Brosnan was told, like, yeah, you're going to have to search for this thing, even though it's right bloody there. <laughs> yeah. so he's just got his <laughs> acting of, like, touching the wall, like, oh, where is it? Where could it hmm. be? Hmm. It's like when you're playing a hide and seek with, like, a young kid who doesn't understand the rules. So you have to be like, hmm, <laughs> where have they gone? Goodness. Oh, there they are. And then he just presses it. Um, but this, this was the first time, and... So something about this film that's quite famous as well is the product placement, where they were a lot more aggressive with it, which is something that never really bothers me all that much, oddly. But this was probably the most obvious shot for it, because there's a shot of the camera that Bond unplugs pointing at the wall, and there's like a big old Sony logo on it. Um, but I think this might be the most obvious one that I noticed. I know this film is famous for having a ton of them in. I can't really think of any others at the top of my head, but this was the first time I kind of noticed that product placement. Oh, I'm trying to think now. But yeah, Sony is a big one, isn't it? Because it wasn't the thing that the, the phone that Zhao got the message through. That was a Sony or a Sony Ericsson. Yeah. So, yeah. Which again, yeah, I don't really mind that stuff all that much. Um, but apparently this one has a lot, but I can't really think of that many. But it's meant to have a ton in it. Yeah, I can't think of too many. I'm sure as we go through the film more, more will come to me. There's Bollinger, but that's no surprise, is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, as Bond is exploring further down with these mirrors, we see, we cut to Jinx. Jinx is in a meeting with... Uh, I wrote, for some reason, I wrote down his name, Dr. Alvarez. <laughs> You're giving him far too much respect writing down his name. <laughs> I think it's because Rahul said it earlier. Um, oh, right. But then we didn't even need to know his name, really. <laughs> anyway, yeah, she's having a meeting with this doctor. I'm just going to call him Doctor. Uh, and she's posing as a patient wanting to sign up to what this clinic does, which is that DNA replacement therapy. And this doctor is... He's a real creep. Let's just say that. He starts to <laughs> starts to talk about the process He knows involved. who he is and he's not ashamed. <laughs> he, he's like, I do nasty stuff and I'm not going to hide it. Because uh, yeah, he starts to explain about like the process and the different phases of it and how you have to bone marrow and extract DNA from orphans. It's like literally so... <laughs> So maniacal, like so cliche villain. Yes, orphans and runaways, we need their delicious, delicious DNA. <laughs> Dr. Evil style. Um, yeah, a real jerk. So <laughs> such a, he sees himself such as Such an understatement. <laughs> he sees himself as a, an artist doing all this stuff. He says, oh, it would be a pleasure working on you or something like that. Um, so Jinx writes him a check for $2 million and hands it over to him. Don't know why she does that, because then she just shoots him dead straight afterwards. She pulls a gun out of her handbag and just shoots him. Um, and goes Are you going to say burn. the line? A woman. <laughs> a woman? No, no. because yeah, because like, Jinx is, uh, also does lines like Bond does, pretty much. I think other characters do as well. It's quite a common thing. Everyone's a bit quippy. So he says before, like, I see myself as an artist. And... As Jinx hands over the check, she says, well, you know, most artists are appreciated more after they're dead, and then shoots him. Ah, uh, that's actually quite a good line. It's not bad. It's not that's bad. not a bad one. Probably her that's... best. <laughs> actually, yeah, you're not wrong. Um, so she, she kills him. She starts to burn some of the documents, I guess, related to her, uh, and starts to log on or like start searching his computer because there's a computer on his desk as well. Um, and the this might be a little bit back and forth, but eventually you do see that uh, she's looking up information on Zhao because Zhao was obviously meant to be here in this clinic. And thanks to some very obvious and very clear uh, visuals on the computer screen, you can see exactly what's happening. There's like a, this little chart of his face as it would slowly merge into this other face and where they're at now, they're like smack bang in the middle where he's this kind of weird bald man in the middle. So uh, yeah, we know that Zhao is currently 
undergoing something to uh, alter his appearance. What it's not as bad screen? as The World Is Not Enough, but to be fair, this is such a weird concept. They kind of had to do it like oh, this. Yeah. So oh, yeah. It makes end, so you actually understand what you're looking at. If they hadn't have done this, then we'd be here going, oh, uh, I think they might have explained that. I, I can't really remember, actually. But no, like with this, it's very clear. He was tra- he was transforming from that person into that person, and he's midway through. So yeah, I can appreciate He's a Korean film. guy being turned into a, a, like, I would guess, like an American white dude. Yeah, exactly. And at the same time as all of this, Bond is looking around and just so happens to find the exact room that Zhao was in. Uh, so he, he enters the room and, and sees Zhao laying down on, on a bed in this hospital looking like loads of things all around there. And uh, he's laying down and he's got this uh, sort of like sci-fi visor over his head. Um it's like RGB gamer because <laughs> it's changing colors as well. It's just, it's, it's uh, yeah, I I'd, wouldn't be surprised if that's like a Logitech item, to be honest with you. But um, he is now bald, as we saw on that computer screen. He's bald, he's albino, he's sort of in that transition stage. Um, although he's still got the diamonds stuck in his face. He hasn't got rid of them yet. And uh, Bond walks up to him on the bed and he's asleep at the moment, or at least, you know, hasn't got his eyes open. And Bond wakes him up by squeezing his drip that's next to him and starts to ask who, who's behind this, who's financing all of this stuff for you here. And uh, Zhao starts to kick him or get, kicks him, kicks him down, gets up and they start to fight in this, in this little room. I wouldn't say there's much to this fight, except at one point they turn on the, there's an MRI machine in there. So the magnet turns on and all this, all the tools from a, a little tray fly over to it and like sharp implements that dodge, you know, or that miss everyone. Um, but yeah, there's just like a little bit of fighting and eventually Zhao just escapes. Well, there's also the very obvious dramatic slow-mo. It's another case of that early noughties, like dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Like, it's not quite The Matrix. It's it's somewhat, I guess, inspired by that. That happens here and it, it looks absolutely ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it's another case of that. Oh, yeah. Imagine if they did do bullet time. <laughs> I wouldn't have put it past this film to try that, to be honest with it. We get um, oddly close, but yeah, they, they do that quite a bit, which I don't really like, but I guess it's it's early 2000s, so it's kind of comes with the territory almost. But I think they do that to show Bond grabbing the bullet around Zhao's neck. Yeah, he grabs a, like a pendant that's around his neck, um, which we don't see what that is yet, but he grabs it. And uh, so yeah, Zhao escapes the room. Jinx back in the doctor's office. She's setting up some some C4, some explosives with a, a timer, like a phone timer um, to blow up the room. I think she sets it for three minutes. And as she leaves, she spots Bond or Bond spots her in the hallway. Um, I think are the sprinklers on. Like It's all kind of gone a bit mad by this point. Obviously, Yeah, like some sort around. of fire has started to... Not a huge fire, but there's just like a bit of fire for some reason. Yeah. And... Uh, so there's people running all over the place and it's very chaotic. Zhao runs through the office that Jinx was just in and smashes out the window, um, which is quite high up, but he does a nice roll and lands and it's all good. He's, you know, he knows what he's doing. But as Bond is going through there, he gets caught in that explosion that, that Jinx sets up. So he gets kind of blown back and a very inconvenient piece of debris lands right in front of the, the window that Zhao jumped out of, so he, he can't go out that way. It's so of... video gamey that. Yeah. Like, it's the most video game thing I've seen. Like, it's, oh, <laughs> it's so, it, mm. yeah, so rehearsed. Find another way. Yeah, it really is. Uh, <laughs> so he does. Bond uh, Bond uses, like, gas cylinders uh, to and shoots them to set them off, and they blow a hole through the wall instead, and that's his way of getting out. Jinx is also chasing Zhao and just like trying to shoot at him as he runs out and he boards a helicopter um, on the top of this building. Because you're right, it's like a sort of, it's like a fort, of, it's like a fort, basically. Uh, all these huge walls around it. And so he starts shooting and just misses him. Um, by the time Bond gets there, he's, he's too late, the helicopter's flying off. And Jinx, where she's chased after him, she's now right up against the edge of the the wall right near the cliff face and that's where she gets caught by some guards um who hold her at gunpoint and make her drop her gun and she 
she does that. She goes to put her hands up and as if she's about to to give in, but then she just undresses down to her bikini. And in this very weirdly framed shot, because Bond is watching her as well, she just falls backwards and dives down uh, into the sea below. Very, very big fall or big dive. And there's a kind of an, uh, there's an escape boat down there waiting for her. It's... I can see what they were trying to do, but this is just one of those scenes in this film where the CGI or the special effects just do not work. They, I don't. I was going to say they do not hold up, but I don't think they would have held up even at the time. It just looks bad. Yeah, there's lots of shots like that. It, it, yeah, it just looks so awkward because what you normally would have with this scene or what you would expect from this scene is that, you know, she's standing at the top of the cliff, the, guard, the guards are pointing the guns, and then she just jumps and you're just like, oh, what happened? And then it would, you know, cut to maybe her diving or it would cut to them looking over and seeing her in the water. But having this shot of following her, like it's her face and then she just falls backwards and it, the camera doesn't cut away. It follows her the same or at the same time. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Very awkward, very strange shot. Even if this wasn't CGI or uh, enhanced, it just, I don't see the point in it. And it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's classic of this era where it's like they thought at the time that CGI was great and could do anything. So they just kind of thought, well, rather than just doing a normal version of this shot and make it functional and make sense, we'll just do this very like unique looking thing, which it is unique. You're oh, never going to yeah. see a shot like this ever again because it you just wouldn't do it like this or the technology's better. But yeah, very unnecessary to say the least. It's it's unique in the sense of when you see someone's like someone's just had a baby and they're showing you their baby and let's just say it's not the prettiest baby, so instead you go oh they're so unique, <laughs> it's that sort of unique. <laughs> what a special little guy. Oh, that's a unique little face there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just to end off, Bond has a look at uh, the pendant, the the thing that he snatched from Zhao's ne- uh, neck and. Opens it up and it's got some sparkly diamonds inside it. Yes. So I don't want to go on about Jinx at the moment, but the the elephant in the room about Jinx is that we've done this exact same idea in Tomorrow Never Dies where there was uh, Wei Lin, the, the agent, but mm. she was like this mysterious person kind of doing stuff and was like doing stuff alongside Bond and that was all pretty good. But I feel like with Jinx in this film, and even with this, there's a little bit of mystery. But personally, I found myself not really caring at all. Like, I don't think they do a good job with that kind of mystery angle with this one. So it's very similar to that idea. But with this scene, I feel like it is a little bit worse. I think it's, yeah. The mystery element is because, or the lack of mystery, I guess, is because in... Tomorrow Never Dies, for example, with Wei Lin, you, you see her crop up in all of Bond's exploits beforehand, but she doesn't really, she doesn't really say much. First of all, they don't really have much dialogue together, in the grand scheme of things, and and she just sort of comes and goes. And I think in this film we've already seen too much of Jinx <laughs> for yeah. her to have that mysterious element um, of oh why is she here? Why is she looking? Up? Why is she going after Zhao as well? You just you're already getting a bit too bogged down with the plot. Um, and yeah, just the fact that her dialogue is generally quite bad doesn't help the fact either. I'd rather have no dialogue than bad dialogue. So. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I wouldn't yeah. say I particularly hate her, or, or certainly not at this point anyway. I don't really mind. It's all fine. But but yeah, as you say, they kind of do this as like a split agent thing where this is like two people operating and doing their own thing, one being Bond, one being Jinx, and I don't think that was very smart the way that that's done. And it kind of, like, Wei Lin was almost, like, she was clearly doing stuff, but, yeah, she, as you say, not a core part of the plot yet. And they almost, like, build to her, then teaming up with Bond later, where this one isn't that. It's like, no, it's just two agents doing stuff. So you just kind of got to see this from two different angles, which is, in terms of moving the plot along, it's all fine, but I don't think it really adds much. No. So with Bond seeing the dime, it is a bullet, isn't it, the pendant? Is it? But I mean, it's bullet shaped. It might be. I didn't actually take note of that. All right. I, I was. I always saw it as a bullet, but uh, yeah. So Bond f- has found diamonds inside it. So we cut to Bond talking to Raoul in his office again, and they're both inspecting the diamonds. And Bond sees that there's a little uh, diamond 
Oh, a little like I saw it as a diamond icon. It's obviously meant to be that, but they're saying no. This is GG. So it's like two G's made to look like a diamond, but I don't think they really show it enough to really show it as G's. It it takes quite a few. You got to stare at it a little bit to actually see the G's. Yeah, later on when you see Graves's branding, you, oh, that looks. I think it's actually a very nice logo, very clever. But right yeah. there, it's tiny little blurry thing. And like, what what am I looking at here? I don't know. Yeah, I just thought it was. I was like, why would someone carve a diamond onto a diamond? We we know what it is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's GG and Raul says, well, this is uh, from a corporation in Iceland, a man called Gustav Graves. And Graves discovered a lot of diamonds in Iceland about a year ago. Um, but Bond says, by looking at these diamonds, they're conflict diamonds. Now, Bond loves saying this fact over and over again. He says it multiple times about, well, these are African conflict diamonds. What is he doing with African conflict diamonds? Hmm, got to find out about these Africa conflict diamonds. But it's like, I don't know what Africa conflict diamonds are. But he says it so much that I feel like they expect you to know what those are. They're bad. Just bad diamonds, I guess, right? Like, uh, Yeah. I guess, yeah. But yeah, like, pe- just people... Pro- people died, probably, to get these diamonds. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so bad diamonds, that's fine. Uh, but they treat it like it's a major plot point where it kind of really isn't. Obviously, the origins of the diamonds is, but he says conflict diamonds so bloody much. <laughs> it's, it's it's so silly. Uh, but yeah, so he says these are African conflict diamonds. Um, so we then cut away from this. Um, well, I think there's a little bit of Bond saying like, well, what is Graves doing with Africa conflict diamonds and how come they're the same diamonds he found in Iceland? Hmm. Hmm. S- Funny. Hmm. Funny, So. Huh? We go to Money Penny, everybody. We see Money Penny in our office, and she is listening on the phone to the American man that we saw before, the one that was there with Charles when Bond was exchanged. So when he came across the bridge, this is the American man who was complaining, and she, the American man uh, who's called Falco, uh, Mr. Falco. Oh, that's his name. Okay, I never wrote that down. I don't know if it's ever said. It is said in this scene, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if they say busy. the full name, but yeah, they say Falco. <laughs> I was too busy looking at him having another drink, I think. Oh, she must have been. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but this guy's played by a famous actor, a guy called, I'm going to look it up so I don't get it wrong, uh, Michael Madsen. So this is the guy who's in all the Tarantino films, like Reservoir Dogs and Kill Bill and oh, stuff like that. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I didn't know that. So he plays a very minor role in this film, but yeah, he's quite a recognisable person if you like your Tarantino films. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so Money Penny is listening in on it. Charles enters the room. Charles then enters M's office, and we see M talking to Mr. Falco on a video call. And Falco is, yeah, again, complaining about Bond and doing his thing. And he explains to him, like, uh, Bond has torched a clinic in Cuba. And then says, if you don't put your man in line, I will do it for you. And I think at this point is when M is saying, well, of course Bond escaped. It's what his, you know, it's what he does. We trained him to be good. So he is good. Uh, which I, <laughs> I really messed up the paraphrasing of that line. <laughs> Bond no, good. I mean, yeah, Bond good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I, and then, like, M throughout this with Piers Brosnan has had really kind of like nice lines like this. And uh, it was nice to hear another one of those. Mm. Uh, but that's about it. That's that's that covered. So we then go to a plane, a British Airways plane in the sky. So I guess there's the other product placement. But we did that before in another film. So to me, it's not all that weird. Um, and we see Bond in first class having a Fokker Martini. And. A, a stewardess gives him the Fokker Martini, who I believe is played by uh, Deborah Moore. Yeah, you're, it is indeed, yes. The daughter yeah. of Roger Moore. Yeah. I don't have much else to say about that, but that's quite nice that she's well, in it this explains, film. Well, it explains the eyebrow raise. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> explains the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> So as Bond is on the plane, he's reading a, a magazine and it's all this article about Gustav Graves and how he's rich and being eccentric and stuff. And as he's reading this, uh, The Clash, the song starts playing as part of the soundtrack, London Calling by The Clash plays. Um, yeah, no, ver- no mix on that. It's just that song. 
So that song is now playing, and we see a lot of press waiting outside Buckingham Palace, or waiting around, and someone in the press tells a woman there who's is like, oh, your man's not going to make it. And at the same time, we see a man jump from a helicopter high up, and he starts falling, and then he uses a parachute, and it's a Union Jack parachute. So he swoops down, he then lands in front of the press, which I think at this point is when the clash stops playing um, as the parachute comes up. So he lands in front of the press and it's Graves, it's Gustav Graves. He takes off the parachute, he's in his suit and they say how he's about to be knighted and then all the press gather around him and start asking him questions. We get like, is it true about the Icarus space program? What's going on with that? He says, I'm going to reveal that soon. And he's like... Is it true that you don't need sleep? Which he kind of confirms. And he then talks about like, if you're going to be competing for the Olympics fencing team, which he kind of says, like, oh, maybe, maybe not. I am training. And all the press then leaves because he gets into the car to go and get knighted. He's like, I don't want to keep him actually waiting. So he, they disappear uh, with the woman in the car as well. And we see Bond was there in the with the press. So that was our introduction to Graves. And it's... Uh, it certainly matches his character, I would say. Oh yeah, yeah. I, Joe, you know what I used to dislike Graves uh, quite a lot with this film, um, but I think, I mean, we haven't got anywhere near really his proper, you know, element in the plot. But with this intro of him, I, I do think you get a, I think it is good. I think you get a very solid idea of this character it, with the press all around him. The the showy parachute down onto it. It's it's so over the top, isn't it? And he's so smarmy. He's just got that such he's got like such a punchable face sort of thing going on where he's just like the actor. Is it Toby Stevens, the actor? Ooh, he's just yeah, like going right. Yeah, he's just going all in on this character in like just the right way, making him seem so sort of suave but also unlikable. Um and I kind of like how, yeah, he is this kind of celebrity character as well. A little bit like Sanchez, but for better reasons that <laughs> the press are following him this time. Yeah, I really like the idea as well. Like it's, as you say, they said it instantly, this over the top billionaire who kind of has all these weird eccentric things like not being able to sleep and things like that. That That's very odd, but clearly has a lot going on as well. He's being knighted. He's got the Icarus space program, whatever that is, and the Olympics fencing team. It's like a lot of questions, but it, it super sells us this over-the-top uh, guy. And I also like him parachuting down because something I do enjoy about this character is how... And, and the film confirms it. I kind of wish it didn't later on, but confirms that this is supposed to be an exaggerated bond. Yeah, like, this is supposed to be if you took Bond and just went to eleven with some of these aspects, and if he was a famous, like millionaire who was in the press, this is kind of what it would be. And I think that's really cool and really fun. And as you say, he kind of sells it quite well. And actually, he's hateable, but he kind of sells all this kind of over the topness. So I think all of this is actually quite good. Really solid introduction to this guy. And again, it's clearly having fun with all of it and going all in. And it's nice and quick too. They don't bog down with it. He's just, he lands, a few questions, and the questions themselves are enough to, to give a lot of information uh, and, and sell you on the concept of him. And then that's it. They move on. Next scene. Great. Love it. Yeah. And I don't mind the Clash being used, to be honest. I don't know if that's nostalgia because it, it's not really a band I ever kind of listen to. So to me, when I hear London Calling, I kind of do think of this film. <laughs> Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which some people might say is uh, disgusting, but that's just <laughs> just how I was raised, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, so to me, it's just, I can't separate that in my head because I just associate it too strongly with this scene and stuff. And I think it does work in terms of Graves' character as well. So yeah, um, maybe it's it's something different. They've never done that before. Well, they did with Beach Boys. So I guess mm. I can't say they've never done that before. Um, but I actually, I'm going to give it a pass. I'm going to give it a pass, Joe. I'm going to say it's it is, okay by me. It is actually The Clash as well, isn't it? It's not a cover. Yeah, it's not the cover. <laughs> that helps. The Slash, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we then go to some sort of fancy, uh, what's it called, Gentleman's Club? Is that the term? Uh, yeah, maybe. maybe. not Gentleman's I, yeah, Club, but some it's some sort of, sort of those like rich, fancy clubs. I feel like they have a proper name. Oh, it's like businessman's yeah. club or something. 
something yeah like so that. a very fancy looking kind of old english building big mansion and one of the rooms in it has a lot of people fencing so there's a lot of fencing gear around the side so and then there's two people like fighting each other like in all the white gear and it's all very set up so there's like a stuff on the ground to indicate it and there's like buzzers and stuff so two people are fencing and bond enters the room in fencing gear he's got the he's not wearing the helmet or the top part of it but yeah he's all in fencing gear and someone turns around and it's madonna <laughs> everybody is it yeah <laughs> that i did pick up oh. on that one i got that <laughs> yeah. one um she has a name but uh again like some people are just like well that's just madonna I can't not see Madonna, so I don't care what her name is, because that's so obviously Madonna. She's too recognisable. Yeah, but I like that the the film basically knew Mm. that was the case. And it's like, well, look, this is going to be... Maybe that's part of... I guess that's part of the contract with her doing the song. So I want to be in the film as well. Um, So they're like, right, if Madonna's going to be in the film, it's going to be Madonna in the film. We can't get away with her being anyone else. So... We'll just put her right in the centre of the frame and reveal her and be like, hey, look, it's Madonna. Are everyone. you Madonna? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, she it's um it is very in your face, but actually they had they had no other choice. Yeah, like the initial impression for me is like, oh, that's Madonna, that's weird. But I actually think it ends up being okay. Yeah. Um, so Madonna and Bond hmm, um have a bit of a chat. They're kind of making some puns and jokes about fencing and stuff and keeping the tip up i think bond says it's all very standard bond dialogue with a woman uh, just doing these sort of jokes and she says oh i've come undone can you tie me up and there's like a i don't know what i don't know what you would call this what she's wearing some sort of leather gear that's got like tie like stuff all the run on the back i guess it's a bit like a corset yeah a corset that's the one uh yeah so she asks like oh can you do me up so bond is tying that up for her and she then kind of explains about how madeline frost is the best person in the club so at the moment gustav graves and frost are fencing against each other so she madonna uh taught frost fencing and actually she won gold at the sydney she's so good at fencing she won gold but i believe bond at this point points out like well, didn't the other guy forfeit? Like, or the other per- woman forfeit because of... I can't remember exactly what she says. I guess it doesn't matter too much, but they had to drop out for some health reason or something like that. And she says, like, oh, don't don't worry about that. Uh, she would have won anyway, so it's not important. Uh, that is a technique that like she won by default. Uh, but then she talks a bit about Graves, and she's saying how Graves has won so much that nobody else wants to fight him. <laughs> <laughs> then this was one of the funniest parts of the entire film this shot it then just cuts to a shot of graves looking over at bond aggressively drinking water with a lime in it <laughs> <laughs> i wondered where you were going with this okay <laughs> and it's just like glug, 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 like looking all evil and mad like drinking this water and lime and then it just cuts to bond looking back and it made me laugh so much I want to look intimidating, but man, this water is so refreshing. It's just, I need it. (laughs) It's so fancy. (laughs) That won me over almost with Graves straight away because it it just ties it like it's so exaggerated. It's so cartoony, but it is also shot and edited. Like, I feel like it's meant to be funny. Like, it's not supposed to be all look at Graves staring at Bond, which is what you would normally get with this scene. Instead, it's just like, no one wants to fight him. It's just so darn good. And it's just... Grog, 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 grog. <laughs> wow, I can really see that. <laughs> so hydrated. <Bam. laughs> I'm sorry. Madonna then turns to Bond and says, like, do you want to meet him? Uh, and then this is where we get the Bond, James Bond. Um, so I do want to, I guess, cover Madonna a little bit. Uh, I guess I don't have anything else more to say at this point because this is basically it for this character. But I think acting-wise and stuff, it's all fine. It actually, it's something that I think on paper sounds terrible. Maybe some people saw this as the next stop at the, another station. Madonna then just appears in the film. And maybe some people get off at this point. But honestly, I think her acting's okay. Well, I might have to Google this. But... Who I'm... is Madonna? 
Mad Honor. No, th- <laughs> I don't think she she I don't think she's won an Oscar, but I feel like she's she was in a film, wasn't she? Like back in the nineties or something, that people say was really good. So I don't think it's a yeah, like she she's clearly a capable actor. Um I think it is just the fact that in a Bond film, they really just have to they really they just have to point out it's Madonna. Like in, the, in the, it, it, they can't keep it very subtle with her, really. But um no, I don't think she was that bad either. I mean she only had a few lines and she said them fine and did what she needed to do. I, I don't have a problem with her at all. I would take Madonna over Goldie. Oh yes. Oh, don't remind me of Mr. <laughs> Bullion. <laughs> Jeez, like, it was Louise. just one short cameo, basically, from Madonna. Unlike Goldie, who's just always showing up, being yeah. all creepy. Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess it's one of those with Madonna where it's like, yeah, on principle, I guess, why I can get why people hate it. I'm not a fan of it. If you ask me, like, do you want Madonna in your Bond film or not? I'd be like, hmm, I'm going to go no on the Madonna. Um, but it's honestly fine. Um, so Graves and Bond start talking, and Graves is like, have we met before? Like, I feel like we've met before. And Bond's like, I think I would remember that. And he's like, oh, okay, all right. I just thought we had. Uh, so then Grave says, like, oh, well, let's let's have a game, but let's put some money on it. How about a thousand uh, for a point? Uh, and this is where Madonna gets another line. And he's like, oh, Madonna, do you want to bet? And she says, no, thank you. I don't like cockfights, which I thought was a solid line, actually. Yep, yep. That, she says a line and then off she goes. Good exit. And she just fades into the background, never <laughs> yes. to be seen again. <laughs> Bye, Madonna. Bye. <laughs> Uh, so yeah so they then start off and they agree best of three hits so they start doing a little fencing they put their gear on and start fighting each other and graves wins the first hit so he's won the first one it goes beep he hits bond so there we go um they do a little bit more fighting or another round they lock in a little bit going backwards and forwards push away and graves wins the second one second one so they then take off their things again and graves is like oh it looks like i'm gonna win and Bond says, let's up the wager. And he gets one of the diamonds out that he has. And he says, I believe this is one of yours. And Graves takes a look and saying, oh, that's that's flawless. Which I think is somewhat implying that maybe it's a fake or he's trying to suggest it's a fake. Um, but I think he knows it's not. Um, and then Bond's like, mm, Africa conflict diamonds. These are... <laughs> he's <laughs> Africa that. conflict diamonds. There's that line again. <laughs> and he's like, hmm, okay. So they fight again and... Graves like hurts his hand like Bond is able to like kind of jab into his hand and then he's all annoyed about it and Bond's like well do you want to continue and I think he's all like yes of course I want to bloody continue Um, and then he takes off some of his gear and he says we're going to do this the old fashioned way Um, and then he goes and grabs two real swords from the wall hands one to Bond and he's like first blood drawn from the torso uh, is is the winner so they just start properly sword fighting each other um, so they're going backwards and forth. I think Graves almost gets a shot in. I think Graves slices Bond's sock yeah. early on. Yeah, he does something to his his leg, yeah. Yeah, so Bond is able to kind of cut his ear a little bit, which makes him mad. So they, they're kind of like knocking over tables and it's starting getting a little bit out of hand. They're going backwards and forwards with the swords. Their fight goes out into the hall. Um, like Then we get a very awkward like setup where Graves almost, like, places a chair in front of Bond. Like, here you go, I'm going to put this chair right here for no reason. (laughs) And then Bond, like, jumps onto it and falls forward and starts attacking him. It's very... It's very (laughs) fake, but I found it oddly charming. Oh, yeah. Um, So, yeah, so they're now... They're still fighting, and we're getting a little bit of punching is now going on. They're not just fighting each other with the swords. They're starting to punch each other a bit as they get a little bit more rough. Uh, They go into another room. Graves, like, throws the sword at Bond... Um, but misses it goes into a door so he grabs a claymore that's on the ground so i think bond also gets a claymore so they are fighting with these much bigger swords backwards and forwards and uh, bond gets knocked back into the courtyard in the middle of this kind of fancy uh, establishment Um, and now they're fighting outside in a courtyard going backwards and forwards and graves is able to knock the sword from bond's hand and this is when we get another dive from pierce brosnan he does a big old dive to avoid the sword um but yeah he gets a he gets the sword again he cuts graves torso knocks him into the fountain at this point frost stands in the middle saying that's enough you're done 
Um, and Gray stands up in the fountain, looks down, is saying, "Ah, you, you have beaten me, Mister Bond. Very hard beat." He's like, "Maybe we should go and settle this outside." But they're both there, breathing heavily, blood on their face due to them fighting. And uh, yeah, that was that. And this was great. I really enjoyed this. Uh, it's mm-hmm. that, it's that kind of, I'll say trope that we've seen a million times before, but I always enjoy, which is like Bond and the villain having like a friendly competition that actually has big connotations behind it. It's the Goldfinger golf scene again. You know, it's that format, but like a really good version of it. Like it's well put together. It's really quite exciting actually to see them go from a friendly fencing game to actually do this proper one, to see them get bloodied up, to see them both being really competitive and really into it. And the way it develops is fun and seeing them have swords is such a unique kind of idea and the setting is great it, it's like this is actually a really awesome kind of a, again it's part of the introduction of the villain somewhat and this is really an awesome part of it it's a classic bond trope and i think it's done very well it is done very well i'm totally with you i really enjoyed this whole scene from even you know starting from madonna up until this fight uh <laughs> it was all it was all just as you say done really well i think it was they could have very easily filmed this sort of scene and it ended up being a mess. You don't really know what you're looking at. You can't follow it very well. Um, you know, the hits aren't landing correctly with the way you're seeing it and, and stuff like that. But no, it all it all plays perfectly fine. Great setting. I like how it moves from place to place. It keeps the momentum going, changing weapons. Um, and I really like, I mean, it goes from it goes from zero to a hundred. Like instantly, and I I do like that. It just you know, uh, Graves just snaps, basically loses his, his temper and is like, right, we're doing it this way. Uh, I'm going to kill you, sort of thing. Um, and yeah, uh, one other thing I liked as, as well is Bond looks like he's struggling <laughs> in some mm. parts of this fight. And I uh, maybe this is just Pierce Brosnan. I don't know, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give the film the benefit of the doubt and be like, oh, well, maybe this is Bond, you know, after all the, the 14 month of imprisonment, he's getting back into it and it's not as easy as it used to be sort of thing. But yeah, there are points where you see Bond and he's really grimacing, like he is proper struggling with some of these jumps and, and things like that. So it's not just a plain sailing one like, uh, well, I think one of the things this is perhaps a reference to is the man with the golden gun, the fight in like the glass shop kind of had similar vibes to all the, the glass and suits of armor smashing down. But, you know, that is a film from the 70s, which is shot very slowly and quietly. And this is one where it's 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 loud and it's in your fa- it's in your face and it's quick and it's it all just works. Yeah. Big fan of this scene. Yeah. Surprisingly solid. Uh yeah, and I like that Bond wins. I, like again, it goes to the personality of Graves, where he's this a very great person to team up Bond with by kind of having him Bond win, and then Graves be all upbeat about it, being like, "Oh, it, it appears you've won," even though Graves is clearly a very emotional guy. He was getting very upset before. It's all, all it it brings in those nice character moments as well, um, mm. which I think is is very important for this sort of Bond versus the villain scene, uh, especially early in the film. Yeah. Afterwards, uh, after Bond has beaten Graves, we cut back inside and things have calmed down a bit now. They're all dressed back in their suits and there's people cleaning up all the mess from behind, taking the painting away and and things like that. And uh, Bond meets up with Graves and Frost and writes him a check because, as you say, he won fair and square. And because he's so impressed with Bond, he invites him to uh, the scientific demonstration of his Icarus project in Iceland for that weekend, uh, the stuff that the press were asking about from before. And uh, I think Bond does say something to Frost about, oh, I hope I have the pleasure of you being there as well. And she's just she's having none of it. Um, she just shuts him down immediately. Um, and they both leave. Uh, and before- that, was so, so, that was so good, that moment. <laughs> I love that moment so much. <laughs> I can't but, even remember yeah, what she, she says. says. Like, Can I expect the pleasure of you? No, it's not what she says. It's... Um... Yeah, Bond's like, can I expect the pleasure of you in Iceland? And she says, I'm afraid you'll never have that pleasure, Mr. Bond. And then it cuts to Pierce Brosnan doing like an ooh face. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
Uh, that's something that's very surprising about the film. I'm not going to say all the humor works, especially the stuff with Jinx. A lot of it falls flat, but I was surprised how many of those small moments that are meant to be funny of Bond reacting to stuff actually really made me laugh. I think the the humor, especially revolving Bond, is surprisingly solid, and I like that they allow Pierce to do this sort of stuff. Him doing like an "oh" face, like "oh, that's cold," <laughs> was really funny. <laughs> Yeah, they're not always going to be winners, Bond, and I guess he accepts that. Uh, but before the scene ends, there's a member of staff that comes over to him quite randomly. He just comes out of the blue and says, Commander Bond, you've, there's a package left for you, and it's this envelope. And inside is this big, old-fashioned-looking metal key. And Bond looks at it and sort of kind of... I don't know if he like looks out and something clicks, clearly. Like, he knows what this key is for, so... Um, we then uh, we then cut to London, and we're at Westminster Bridge because the key is actually to a small door just on uh, the side of the bridge. And actually, it's a very easy Bond location to find in real life if you if, if you're into that sort of thing. I've gone to it because I've been like, oh my god, it's the door from Die Another Day. Uh, of course. Yeah, and you know what? If you're up for it, Trex Adventure is right next door. So perfect. <laughs> your whole day's sorted for you. That's a head of a Saturday right there. <laughs> It's actually the same place where, if you're a fan of George Lazenby, the photo of him resting against the lamppost. The same oh, one. that one. Didn't that get removed or something, though? Oh, Isn't did it? Sort of... oh. I remember reading something about people being upset about that. I'm not sure if you can do that anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a shame. Anyway, um, yeah, so he unlocks this little kind of big, well, this big, uh, no, it's little. It's a little door. What am I talking about? It's a little wooden door on the side and walks down some stairs and he ends up on this empty tube station platform with M kind of ominously standing, waiting for him in the doorway. Uh, And it's an abandoned station for abandoned agents, he says, uh, as he walks towards M and, and gives her back her calling card of the key. And M is kind of gets straight to the point. She wants some information on, on graves. What has Bond found out? What's going on? And Bond is quite bitter still about what's happened with the whole career stuff and like, the way that M's treated him and, oh, now you need me sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, M reveals that they only know the official biography of Graves. They don't know anything more malicious than that. So uh, all, according to MI6, he was just an orphan who learned engineering, found a diamond mine and uh, in Iceland and then gave some of his money to charity, which I guess is why he was getting knighted. And um, Bond talks about all the gene therapy stuff that happened in Cuba, the diamonds that he found on Zhao, um, which, again, prove it's all that smuggling conflict diamonds. So they are again. Uh, So, yeah, maybe Graves isn't as clean as he's, uh, he's making out to be. And with that, Bond is suddenly useful once again. M gives her approval, and uh, he can continue... Well, I say he can continue the mission kind of semi-officially, you know, as an outsider under the radar. Yeah, it was, uh, I thought this was very cool. I always enjoy the whole extra dimension to uh, MI6. And I guess with this one, they kind of, you know, we're obviously not getting the classic sort of, oh, we're getting an updated version, right? We're getting a a variant of all this MI6 stuff, but I, I think it actually works quite well. You know, the impact of Bond leaving mi6 not being a double agent you know you don't really feel that much at all it's no. like just like a, a plot device but i don't really mind that all that much as i said for the reasons i described before and just seeing bond and m talk and i think something that's actually quite solid in this film is the dialogue between m and bond i think it's as maybe not as good as goldeneye but actually surprisingly really solid there's a lot of solid lines between the two and having bond leave and not be a double o anymore kind of create some interesting kind of dialogue between the two and obviously Judy Dench smashes it because she always does um, and Piers Brosnan and Judy Dench have a good back and forth so yeah I really enjoyed all these scenes with Emma Bond and it was cool to see this abandoned uh, sub, like uh, underground station it was all all good stuff yeah that's the bit I liked uh, the, all the all the dialogue was fine it was all very plot heavy sort of stuff but um, I did like the fact that they, they've changed it now to this this empty tube station it felt very uh Skyfall, <laughs> in retrospect, mm. um, just to change the scenery. I guess it's uh, that maybe they didn't want to blow up a MI6 anymore, or have something else happen to MI6 building, so they they stay well away. 
Um, yeah, like this stuff stands out more to me than like the Scotland stuff in the world is not enough. I find there's like, obviously these locations aren't as striking or stuff, but I, 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 this works a little bit better for me as a way of mixing it up. Yeah, yeah. I know they are they are underground. Uh, they are literally underground and figuratively now for Bond. So it all works. But then actually after that scene, you think, well, okay, well we're in we're in the tube station bit. But no, we cut to Bond. He's back in his office in MI six. His office, which I guess we wouldn't have seen for quite some time. It would have been on a Master's Secret Service, right? Uh, yeah. I think so. He's in there. He's he's sat down cleaning his gun with a little brush, um, and it's all it's like late at night. It's all, a lot of lights are turned off. It's quite moody, and he hears some gunshots from outside his door. Oh no! And so he he's got his gun pointed, and he walks out, walking through the corridors, and he sees some dead bodies on the ground. He looks through into Money Penny's office, and there she is, dead on Not her desk. Money Penny shot in the forehead. Rest in peace, Money Penny. Um, oh, I want to say he made a quip, but I can't think of one in time. <laughs> about uh, point. Or I guess the penny's oh, dropped. <laughs> I guess it landed on heads because she got <laughs> shot in the head. <laughs> they're, both... <laughs> they're both good, actually. I like them, yeah. Um... <laughs> Send in your uh, Money Penny is dead puns. Quips for Bond. Send them in. <laughs> Uh, to the usual address. We'll read them all out next episode. Is this a Blue Peter competition? Or <laughs> Someone's going to win a badge, guys. Best one gets the badge. Uh, the Bond Revisited um, badge. Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, so he's joined by uh, Robinson, joins him in the situation, and they, they carry on looking through the corridors. They head into M's office. Um, and M's in there, but she's being held hostage, and there's a few different men in there, uh, terrorists, I guess, and... One of them kills Robinson, R.I.P. Robinson. No quips for him, don't care. And um, <laughs> Bond takes out a couple of the guys and try is trying to figure out what to do with him. So he shoots the hand of the person holding her hostage and they let go. So she falls and then he finishes him off. And it all starts to go slow-mo and Q suddenly starts to phase through the scene and moans at Bond for injuring his boss and he comes up to the camera and he see that he's actually taking glasses off of Bond because yes that wasn't real folks don't worry oh. money penny's still alive robinson's dead though no <laughs> yeah they actually shot yeah they shot him off screen to yeah. make that work it had to be extra real uh, but no it was all a training exercise that Q was doing for for Bond um do you want me to talk about this first then well i, I just did you have anything to say yeah I don't like it. You don't like I it? I like the very end moment of Bond making that decision to like shoot M's soldier, uh, shoulder <laughs> to save her and being like, oh yeah, well, if you see, I actually did did the right thing. But this is just all, all a bit lame, all a bit rubbish, all a bit like it's not really a very good gotcha moment. I don't think it's all that interesting. It kind of comes out of nowhere and also it allows for a, another very bad scene to happen. Oh. Right towards the end. <laughs> So I would prefer if they cut this stuff from the film entirely. Um, because overall, I've enjoyed this film quite a bit at this point, And it doesn't really sink anything. It is, once again, the pacing of this film is pretty good. Everything's quite quick. Nothing stays on... Uh, you know, you don't hang around on one thing too long. So this is just a quick kind of one-off thing. But yeah, I would have just... Um, I would have cut this. But the glasses thing, I don't think it adds anything at all. More glasses for Pierce. I don't oh, know. Yeah, you're right. I d I'm, I'm in two minds about this. Because it. you're right, it is basically pointless you could take this out of the film and the other bit and and it, you wouldn't lose anything they don't ever bring this back in terms of the actual mission and and stuff like that i guess how would they but uh i do it is cheesy though and i it's not a true gotcha moment you're never going to really think oh my god they killed money penny but you know, this, isn't, <laughs> this isn't game of thrones or anything but i i do still like it i just like that we're in this early 2000s it's very video gamey i think it's because it reminds me of like the beginning of everything or nothing like the video game or something like that it's just it seems so of its time and i think we were kind of touching on this with tomorrow never dies about being a product of the the 90s and like we're now getting into the 2000s and i don't i don't hate it but i can definitely understand how it, it could be removed without much love lost yeah it's almost like by itself it's like an interesting kind of time capsule like it's an interesting scene in itself in terms of 
Bond. It's just in terms of the film as a whole, cut it. But I, I do appreciate what you're saying. I can kind of appreciate it in terms of a individual scene showing Bond doing some training. Like it, it might be a fun DVD extra. Like I would like it like that. Yeah. I just Ooh. don't really like it in the film itself. That should be like, a, do you know how DVDs used to have games on them? Yeah. It should be like a choose your own adventure thing with Bond. Like you choose which directors to go. Oh no, M died. You lose. <laughs> <laughs> you got to shoot M to play the like director's commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> so yeah, Q takes off the glasses and yeah, as you say, Bond says, well actually M's fine, flesh wound, but she survives. And you realise that yeah, they're still in the underground uh, station, uh, tube station, uh, as they walk into Q's lab there. I say it's a lab, it looks more like a storage room. It's filled to the brim with gadgets from previous films uh, where they keep the old relics, as Bond puts it. And so this was the moment I was saying, like, you should, this is where you need to pause because they, they just cram this scene with so many little easter eggs and little things to look out for i mean the film points out some very obviously with bond fiddling with them um so you know you see uh in the background you've got the crocodile sub from octopussy you've got kleb's dagger shoe from from rush of love which bond even has a quick smell of <laughs> it's a quick sniff of it <laughs> <laughs> it's like ooh, <laughs> and the uh, the jetpack from thunderball which i guess is the thing that you were is this yeah, a, that's that's yeah. the one I did get. Like, which as a kid, I definitely wouldn't have understood that at all. I would have been like, "What the hell is that?" But yeah, now actually, it's uh, kind of cool because yeah, he turns it on. I think yeah, he, turns or he it plays with to, it a bit. Yeah, and it starts to go off, and Q puts it back down. I, I when I finished watching the film, and I was looking back on scenes like this with the whole element of the 40th anniversary and references back, I was thinking, is this a bit too fan servicey? Like, is it a bit too much? I don't think it is, because I think people that don't know the Bond films wouldn't care. But it, this is like the most meta, the film, apart from maybe the, the gold finger whistle and things like that. But this this is the most meta of film the, the series has been, I would say. Yeah, I think so. I don't think it's over the top, but this, this again, ties into what I think the tone of Die Another Day is. This type of tone, I think for me, means it gets away with it. The mm. fact that it is a more fun, over-the-top sort of film, I think that means they can do it. Yeah. But if this was like a Timothy Dalton film and he just walks in and sees all this stuff, then I'd be like, that's strange. Why is Timothy Dalton playing with the fundable jip? <laughs> but because it's Pierce Brosnan and because of the direction of this film, I think for me it works really well and just is a really cool uh, sort of set. I didn't pause, by the way. I didn't really take a big look at that. But I think even just seeing Pierce Brosnan messing around with the shoe and the... <laughs> <laughs> the fundable jetpack is enough for me. That's just fun. I can enjoy that. Uh, yeah, I just liked when you sniffed it. I thought it was really funny. Um, <laughs> so we do get onto the actual gadget demonstration, not just ones from previous films. Q uh, walks Bond up to this bit of bulletproof glass and starts shooting to prove it. And he shows him this sonic agitator ring, which if you put your ring, put the ring to the, the glass, it shatters it. And he's got a watch, which he says is, uh, oh, this must be your 20th by now or something like that, being the 20th film. And then they head out onto like an actual train platform area and Q uh, triggers this empty stand to come out of the tunnel and says, this is your new transportation. Um, and obviously it's just completely, it looks completely empty. Bond's like, I think you've been down here too long. And Q starts to walk onto the platform and walk onto the other side. And then you see his legs warp and distort because he's walking behind something. And then we get that kind of prompts a, a almost, well, I think it is word for word replica of Goldfinger where Bond says, you must be joking. And uh, Q says, as my predecessor told me or taught me, I never joke about my work. It doesn't quite land the same way. As good old Desmond, but uh, you can see what they were trying to trying to do there. It's it's all right. It's it's a big like nudge and a wink, isn't it, to the audience? But yeah, hmm. this is the uh, the Aston Martin Vanquish, or as they're calling it, the Vanish. It's a, a car with adap adaptive camouflage. It's all cameras over it and polymer, blah blah blah. But yeah, it's it's basically invisible. It's an invisible car. Um, it's all kitted out with. The regular features it's got the well the ejector seats back from goldfinger and it's got torpedoes and uh target seeking shotguns and bond demonstrates that by chucking up the hefty instruction manual in the air and it shoots them into little 
dust. Um, it so this is a the car. I think is another one of those things that people like to focus on with this film. I really don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with the concept of this this film at all. Uh, the, the, sorry, the concept of this car in this film at all, because as you said, the tongue is in the cheek of this film so many times, and the tone of it 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 suits it. And also, we've had really silly fake sci-fi stuff in the past anyway. I really don't care that it's invisible. I think it looks cool. The only thing I do have a problem with is that this isn't. I was. I don't think it's used very well later on in the film, but on its own. I have no problems with with the vanish. No, I don't either. I always, I mean, maybe this is because I was a kid. I always thought the car was incredibly cool. <laughs> I think it's so neat. Uh, but I really like the look of this car. I'm so happy we're back to Aston Martin because mm. they just look so much better than the BMWs. You know, we don't care about cars that much, but I think anyone can just look at the BMW and the Aston Martin and be like, look how cool the Aston Martin looks <laughs> compared to it. So it's nice to have a really good looking Bond car. And I really love the fact that, yeah, it's Aston Martin. The most iconic car is the DB5. Yeah. That's it. The DB5. So I like that we now have a new one, which isn't just that car. It's like a modern version of it. And I think it looks incredibly cool. Um, so I, I love this car. To me, when I was younger, this was the Bond car because it was Aston Martin and stuff. I didn't really have that concept of the DB5 Uh from Goldfinger and stuff, so this to me was the Bond car. It helps that it's all in all the video games as well. Yeah, <laughs> they put it in that as well. So this became like the Bond car, and I, I love it for that. So yeah, I don't know. In terms of the concept, I've never really thought about it too much. I I never really saw it as anything that crazy. So I kind of agree with you. If people aren't into it, fair enough to you. But I never really saw how this crossed a line compared to some of the other wacky stuff we've had in the past. And this film just has a lot of wacky stuff in it. So it makes sense to me that the car might be something a little bit more out there. And I think it does set up a couple of cool moments later on. So, yeah, I'm for it. I think it's quite neat. I guess the other thing to point out in the scene is that this is this is now uh, Q, well, John Cleese as Q, just him on his own. No Desmond anymore. Um, and it's the only time we see him in this role. Obviously, he gets... Well, Q gets kind of written out for a little while in the series going forward. So do you really have, I don't really have much to say. I think it's more of the same as we saw in The War's Not Enough, where I don't really there's just not enough time. There's just not enough time between these these characters. That I guess I don't know. I never really thought that early on when it was Desmond Llewellyn, but I, the, the character was different then to an extent. And I, I, think, I thought this was just fine, really. The, uh, the thing that stood out to me is that this was written as if it was Desmond. Yeah. It's just John Cleese doing it instead. Yeah. So that's a bit odd. But I think because it is just a more traditional Bond Q scene, it is better than the last film because of that, because they just go through the motions a bit. And I like some of the lines. I like when uh, John Cleese is like, always oh, an excuse, double O zero. <laughs> <laughs> so <Ooh>. childish. But like, <laughs> but I like the... Uh, but yeah, I think that's the thing. That's as you say, there just wasn't enough time for any of this. And next film, he's gone. So it's like a bit. It just all felt a bit pointless at the end of the day. But you know, he does a decent enough job. It's just they never really found his feet with it. And this is a very standard Q dialogue back and forth. So it's all fine. It's all completely fine. It's just not really worth thinking about that much because it just didn't matter in the end. Mm. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Poor John Cleese. He'll he'll be fine. Uh, we then see M in her office and someone enters the room. She looks up, someone comes in, but we don't see who it is straight away because we only see M looking at them and she starts talking about this person's mission to Iceland. So you think it's, oh, it's Bond. Bond's come in and says one last little thing to talk about. But no, it's revealed it's actually Frost. Whoa. What? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, Frost is uh, an undercover agent. She's also working for MI6, and uh, with M M's dialogue, we learn that uh, she's been investigating graves for for three months. She she's wanted to go on this this assignment, and after three months, she has not found anything to no avail. And uh, M warns that Bond is about to join in and and mix things up a bit and try and find out some more and basically keep an eye on him. Don't let things go out of out of control. Keep an eye on it all and. Uh, and Frost 
is worried about this, saying that, oh, he's going to blow my cover. I've seen the sort of things he do he does, like with the the uh, fencing fight. Um, and then the scene kind of ends with M pointing out that in all of her years of training and things like that, Frost has never fraternized with anyone. And uh, Frost makes it a point that, oh, no, she, she'll definitely, you know, keeping uh, work and pleasure separate, especially with James Bond. I don't know, we'll see how long that lasts. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, that's a little bit on the nose, that. But... Yeah. But I do like the description Frost gives because M's like, what do you know about, you know, James Bond? And I like the description where it's like, he'll, if there's a, yeah, he's a danger to himself of others, kill first, ask question later. He likes to provoke and that's how he gets things done. I think it's just pretty on the nose. Like, does it gives a very good description. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I actually quite like that. I think very that's quite fair. cool. Very fair analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll talk about Frost later in the film. Um, but yeah, I guess interesting enough. So we then go to Iceland. And now we're in Iceland. Cue the weird fast forward and then stop footage. Oh, yeah. Which I guess that's the only way I can describe it, where the camera just shoots across over all this landscape and then suddenly stops um, to see Bond in the Aston Martin. So we start getting that. It's it's more, you know, early 2000s filmmaking where it's like going fast because I guess they figured out how to do it and think it looks cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we fast forward and we see Bond on the road with his Aston Martin and he arrives at the, the Ice Palace. So yeah, so Graves is having his big scientific event for Icarus at this giant Ice Palace. And that's what the film calls it. But yeah, it's just a giant building made out of ice. So Bond parks up, gets out, a guard shows up, and he's like, I'm Mr. Kill. <laughs> <laughs> In my notes, I just put, I'm Mr. Kill. And then, okay, like, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thank like, you. It's really, 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 really awkward. Yeah, there's no clever dialogue here. It's just a giant dude who looks like a henchman. So it's like, I'm Mr. Kill. Of which Bond responds, now there's a name to die for. Oh. Because of Kill. Um, so Bond looks over and he sees like this speed rocket car out on the ice going very quick. Uh, and then it starts slowing down. It uses parachute and it stops right in front of the palace. And Graves gets out of the car and like some engineer comes up to him. Who I didn't really write that much about this guy. This guy to me was always engineer. Mm, not a nerdy science guy. Yeah, but he's not like an important character, but you see him a lot. Like he yeah. hangs out a lot um, around graves. Um, so he gets out and saying, that was a new personal best, sir. That was the fastest you've ever gone. And Graves is mad saying one of the engine cuts out or something, make sure it's fixed. So Graves then goes off to Bond and they they enter the palace and there's a bit of back and forth between the two. It kind of ends with him saying like, all the advantages of uh, never sleeping because he's going all in with this I don't sleep thing. He's saying, I have to leave, live my dreams. Then he's saying, besides, there's plenty of time to sleep when you're dead. Um, so it, it's a lot of that type of dialogue. I quite like and that line, actually. I, I like it. Yeah. I just think it's actually quite a good line. Virtues of, virtues of not sleeping. I have to live my dreams. Like, hmm, yeah, I could, I could see that on a, on a poster or something. <laughs> yeah, well, it fits in with this eccentric millionaire who's in love with himself. <laughs> they yeah. say all this stuff. Um, so yeah that happens quite quick not too much between the two Grace leaves and instantly Frost then shows up and greets Bond uh, and I think Bond I hope I get this right Bond says like oh a palace of ice I bet you feel right at home because her name's <laughs> Frost to get it <laughs> that made me laugh quite a bit <laughs> a lot of this stuff does this was like the maybe the most I ever laughed at a Bond film and not even at it in a lot of cases a lot of these little quips just really got me they're so blunt they're so on the nose I'm just like fine, fine let's do it um, but yeah so she explains that the palace was built all just for this event like it's all very uh, very over the top so they built this for this event and next door is the diamond mine which doesn't come up again I don't think ever uh, but she just mentions the diamond mine is actually nearby next door. Um, so as they're talking, we see Jinx arrives in a red sports car. So Jinx is here, um, part of the event. And Frost then takes Bond to the ice. His, <laughs> I put ice hotel room because that's what it is. Bond has a room. Yeah. So Frost escorts Bond to his room and, and leaves him in there. 
So we then cut to later that evening, where we're in the large main hall of this ice palace, and there is a dance remix of Die Another Day playing as the, oh. the music for this. Is that the song that plays over the credits as well? It probably is the same one, yeah. I didn't connect those two, but it's definitely like, you know, that long form dance remix yeah. type of thing. Wow, I completely, I, I call it on the credits, obviously, I completely missed it here. That's surprising, because I don't know if they say any of the, the actual vocals, but to me it was pretty, pretty in your face. <laughs> Joe Ball, I was distracted by this point. I get, I, I seem to be distracted on very inane things in this film. Earlier it was M's drink. In this scene, I was distracted by the fact that everyone, everyone in that place would be absolutely freezing. Most oh, yeah. of all, most of all Jinx, who we are going to see soon because she's wearing a dress with like open sleeves and everything, they would be freezing and there's absolutely no breath visible and it was really bugging me. Like you would see people's breath. <laughs> Why do they not put breath in? They didn't have the tech yet. No. Well, the, yeah, I guess the, the practicality of this ice palace is something you shouldn't think about. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. This is another st- a stop for people. If you're like Ice Palace, you might get off at the station. I nearly did. I stepped off. But I was like, Joe, what? Pod- it. podcast. I'll get back on. I'll get back on. So, all right, one more. If we can keep going. Yeah. Uh, so Bond goes and order a Fogca Martini. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> Fogca Martini, plenty of ice if you can spare it. <laughs> it's, I, it really made me laugh. It, it clearly- shouldn't do. Yeah, you two were on the same wavelength, this film. This is like my kind of pun, I guess. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't say I'm someone who makes a ton of puns and stuff, maybe when I was younger, but like these puns were just like exactly the type of puns I want. So blunt, so on the nose, but like not too like thoughtless. There is still a joke here that works. It's just so blunt and he just does it all the time. Mm. Just going around making these jokes. It's hilarious. Uh, so Bond sees Jinx. And I think he just says, like, mojito. Mojito? Like, mojito? Yeah, mojito. <laughs> and don't worry, guys. They go straight into bird banter. Yeah. Straight away talking about birds. Because she's still playing, like, oh, are you here to see the local birds? And he's like, yep, sure, sure am, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, there, there was some sort of talk. Like, they kind of referenced the fact that they did that thing in Cuba and... Jinx has a line about saying, I'm a girl that just doesn't like to be tied down. Um, Again, more awkward dialogue. I kind of didn't mind this one because it was almost funny that they're doing the bird stuff again. I was just like, oh no, (laughs) stop. But it's so ridiculous that they just instantly go back to bird puns and jokes. I'm just like, all right, I kind of like that in its own dumb way. That's all they have in common. All they can talk about. That's all they got, man. It's just awkward otherwise. Um, but yeah, more bad dialogue from those two. So we see a van pull up to the Ice Palace and there's like a man in a hood that kind of gets out and he enters the palace, like, or maybe not the palace, but he's like entering a building nearby. Um, actually, is that building nearby, the Biodome, is that where the diamond mine is? I think so, yeah. That would make more sense, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, f- fair enough. I never Although, connected those. It two. doesn't look like a mine because it's jungly, so I, I don't no. quite get that. But yeah, I think that is supposed to be the biodome mine. I don't know. Right, no. fair enough. Biodome mine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this man enters this room and he sees Graves is in there and he's wearing like a weird neon rainbow face mask. So it's somewhat similar to what we saw Zhao wear before, but this one's a little bit more over the top with like these strands going on him. So he's lying down with his eyes closed with this big uh, mask on him. So the hooded man removes the mask and then he reveals his face and it's Sal. Sal is there and they talk in Korean saying hello, hi, I guess. Um, And then they hug. And Graves actually explains that the insomnia is real. So when he's talking about never sleeping, that's actually true. And it's because of this DNA therapy that is currently going through. Um, But Graves looks at Sal and saying, what's going on? What happened? You didn't, you know, you're still, you look a bit odd. Um, And Sal says it was Bond. (laughs) You look a bit odd. (laughs) Something not right about you. Your diamonds are off. Haircut? Uh. Something, glasses. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sal probably misses his old class. <laughs> um, but Graves explains that Bond doesn't even know who he is. He got this close to him and then gets very uncomfortably close to Zhao um, and says, like, oh, Bond doesn't even know who I am. Um, and Sal explains that General Moon still mourns your death. Oh, no. Uh, whatever that means. So we go back to Bond and Bond and Jinx is still talking about birds, probably. Uh, but this time Frost joins them. And... I think the only reason is for one joke because this dialogue is completely pointless and a waste of time but I think it's just one joke where Frost says oh has Bond been explaining about his Big Bang theory and then Jinx is like I think I got the thrust of it awful just, Boo. and then Frost just leaves <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's like oh they set this little scene up just for that joke and it's a terrible joke yeah that sucks. So, but let's, let's think about this though. Thrust of it. So, is that because Big Bang Theory is the origin of the universe, and the universe takes place in space, and the way we get to space is with a rocket, and a rocket has thrust to go into space. That's the PG version, yeah. No, but I know the the double entendre <laughs> side of it. But I mean, in terms of like the connection between Big Bang. As in, like, the concept of the actual Big Bang and Thrust in terms of making the joke work. I think that's it. Big Bang's a space thing, and space thing's like a rocket, and rocket has Thrust. Wow, I, I did not think about it that much. I would have... I guess I would have read that as maybe just the thrust of the, like, the bang. That's just on a very, very I, I guess level. so. Maybe it is the thrust of the bang, but would you ever see something... <laughs> and then the universe was thrust into existence. <laughs> I don't. I honestly don't know. This is why this is bad. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Now the oh, yeah. ice joke, classic. This one is just so forced and so awkward. Like, oh, it's more awkward, bad dialogue. And the way Harry Berry says this line, it's like it's supposed to be like sexy and funny and cool. And it's like, ooh, it's none of those things, Harry. It's none of these things, Berry. Calm it down. Yeah. Yeah. It's just stop. Yeah. So we then cut to everyone is now outside. Um, and Graves is on a stage and there's lots of lights and he starts doing a little speech um, and Bond is in the crowd and he sees three Korean men nearby so he, he takes note of those so three Korean men are here watching the speech um, so Graves hits a, a switch he has like this control panel in front of him he hits a switch and we cut to space speaking of uh, thrust. the thrust yeah. We cut to space where we see like this satellite almost and it's like turning in space and like the front of it opens up to be this like big circular mirror, I suppose. It's, I don't know what the best way to describe it is. Hmm. Yeah, a big dish. Yeah, it's like a dish, but it's almost like, I, I thought it was like a kite. <laughs> it was the best way I could describe it. Very expensive kite. Very expensive kite, yeah. Very, uh, yeah. So, yeah, stuff is going on there. So while that is all kind of setting up and Graves is giving his speech and he's talking about there being a second sun. Imagine if there could be a second sun, like a diamond in the sky. Uh, then he hits a button and says, let there be light. And the space thing, the satellite, with this big reflective kind of dish on front of it, reflects sun re sunlight down onto the crowd and it makes it look like it's day although really it's just very white and it's like i give you icarus and everyone's like oh very good i like icarus very good stuff oh yes bravo um, yeah so he turns off icarus so that was the demonstration so icarus is a giant satellite where there's like this big mirror thing in front of it and the general idea is that you can then reflect the sun anywhere on the world which is supposed to be like oh we can stop world hunger we can have plants growing all the time and, and things like that so like, like it's he presents it as like a oh we can actually have or we can have like solar energy like he's presents it as this like environmentally friendly thing that we can now control sun rays by reflecting stuff in space down and he does that by saying oh look it's daylight even though it's actually meant to not be daylight it's terrible it looks terrible <laughs> I, I guess <laughs> you're saying the cgi is not well not yeah it, i don't know i don't know if they just got to set that day and they were like oh who who brought the lights did anyone bring the lights? Oh, I thought Bob was doing it. Oh, 
Oh, I didn't bring them. Oh, do you know what? We'll do it in post. We'll just crank up the we'll white. Just whack, yeah, just whack up the contrast. Whack stuff. it up and then it will, it will work. Don't worry. We got this covered. Lee, don't worry. Get on with your filming. And it's just, no, it doesn't work. It looks terrible. Yep. Is that bad, though? Um, In the grand scheme of things, no. <laughs> yeah. That's where I was at. I agree. It looks terrible. But I was kind of like all in on this stuff by this point. So this stuff doesn't bother me. And I totally get why it bothers other people. This just does. It just doesn't bother me. I. It just goes. It just like a swan's back or something. I don't know. It just rolls off. I don't mind by this point. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to kind of reveal my hand a little bit early, but not too much. <gasps> but I'm going to say that it's at this point. Well, a few minutes earlier. But we're we are pretty much halfway through the film when we when we go to the ice palace and we stay here for a significant portion of the film. Um, this is where the film really starts to dip for me. I think for me, a lot of the stuff we've seen so far, I've really enjoyed, but I might be less, <laughs> I think, I think it's, I, I won't necessarily hate a lot of the stuff going forward, but I just really won't care about it, which is maybe bad for d- different reasons. So yeah, this is just the start of that where I'm like, that looks terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes from there. I get what you mean. And, and I think there is one scene in particular and i wrote it in my notes where i think the pacing takes a big hit i wouldn't say it's now because we're still early on in the iceland stuff but there are multiple sequences in iceland which normally i'll be pretty up for but yeah there is one specific moment i was like oh the pacing has kind of been flushed down the toilet a little Mm. bit (laughs) and that happens with uh with iceland unfortunately yeah yeah Uh, so bond notices that jinx has disappeared so jinx and bond was actually standing next to each other but she's disappeared uh, so Bond then kind of sees that the control panel that Grace was using to control Icarus, this engineer guy that was there before, he kind of takes it away and him and Mr. Kill kind of walk off. Uh, so Bond decides to follow them and he sees that they go through a gate with some guards posted. So Bond looks around and he sees his car, the Vanish. Um, so he gets into that. I think he gets into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think he gets into it at this point and starts kind of, yeah, he like follows them through the gate. They don't really show how, but he uses the Fanish to get through that gate. Um, so he's following the engineer into another building and they they go inside. I think they use like a, a card or something to get into one building. And then from the car, Bond sees Mr. Kill use his hand to open the next door. And that's how they get fully into uh, the biodome that we mentioned before, which is this building next to the ice palace which is this very tropical like greenhouse area um, so that's where grace was before and sal was before and now that's where mr kill and the engineer is going so bond steps out of the vanish and then he like heads towards a pipe or heads towards part of the biodome peeks through the window sees a pool of water and then walks off and that's very important for later it's a bit confusing but that's very important for something that like, <laughs> happens later. But it's very confusing. Hmm, water. Okay. <laughs> hmm, I'll make a note of that. I also, one other thing. I just, I don't want to start moaning too much. And I, I, I said before, I like the car and I like the invisibility stuff. But as Bond is in that car, sneaking behind them, invisible, behind the guards, he is so close to those guards. So <laughs> close. <laughs> like stupidly close to those guards. That that must have the quietest engine known to man, or it's an electric car. I don't know. It just just because it's invisible doesn't mean it doesn't make sound. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to have a shot in the film, which was the guards walking forward, or Mr. Kill walking forward, and then the tyre tracks on the snow reveal itself. Yeah. But to have that all make sense and for you to understand what's going on, as you say, the car is really close to them. <laughs> so you can see <laughs> the tyre tracks and then the guards right in front of them. Yeah, not a massive fan of that bit. It's a good thing Bond didn't sneeze because that would have really <laughs> ru- like ruined things for him. <laughs> or he just stalled the car or something embarrassing. Oh, crap. <laughs> he just turns on the radio, the clash <laughs> starts playing. Like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, my favourite song. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yes, so we go inside the biodome and Graves approaches this engineer guy and the engineer has like this glove and... It- Graves is like, is this 50,000 volts going through this? And he's all like, 100,000 volts. He's like, 
So Graves has like an electric love. What's the point of that? Um, so Bond, back to Bond. Um, so a guard just kind of sees Bond, I think, while he's sneaking outside. Bond is able to like knock him out, but Mr. Kill just sees him and sounds the alarm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it just sounds the alarm and like two guards come out of the biodome to try and find Bond. He just like hides near this like valve and decides like, oh, I'm going to turn on the valve, which just shoots like a load of steam or something, which knocks out those two guards, which is just got nothing to so nothing me <laughs> um but graves on his pc inside sees there's an intruder and you can tell because his pc screen says intruder alert in massive letters <laughs> it's so useful they program that in so handy um so but yeah bond is able to kind of get away yeah so because he knocks out the two guards the alarm's still going off but bond is actually able to just sneak around and walk off so as he's trying to get away frost grabs him from behind a car and starts kissing him. So Mr. Kill and some guards are looking around trying to find him. And Frost is basically doing it just to keep Bond's cover. So at this point, she pretty much reveals that she's MI6. I'm assuming that Bond already knew. Because um, why wouldn't he? But we don't really get a scene of Bond finding out that Frost is MI6. So a bit are strange. But yeah, at this point, Bond definitely knows. So they're kissing and there's a bit of thing where she's all like, Oh, I hate this. And Bond is like, this is great. And then she starts being like, oh, I know what it is with you. Sex for dinner, death for breakfast. And lots of kissing. And it was a little bit too sloppy for me, this kissing. Yes, that's exactly what I wrote down. Very wet kissing. Yeah, it's a bit gross, some of the sounds and some moaning coming from them. It's like, I didn't need this. I didn't need this at all. I just found it strange that, yeah, like there's this big intruder alert thing. And as you say, Bond just walks out. There's no alarm. There's no lights going off. I was really expecting there to be a big red light flashing, but... No, they, the guards just quite slowly walk out after him and, and yeah, that's when <laughs> Frost grabs him. Very yeah, low-key, very low-key. Yeah, again, once again, a little bit awkward, a little bit strange. <laughs> Doesn't bother me, son. Doesn't bother me. I'm on for the ride, <laughs> so I don't really mind. But yeah, I could have done without the, the sloppy kissing, but all that other stuff, I don't know, it's all so very silly. Graves being like 100,000 volts, ha ha ha, and Mr. Kill... We talk about Mr. Kill here, people walking around and steam. It's all, yeah, it's not meant to be cool, I hope. Um, so I don't really <laughs> yeah. mind it. And let's just be thankful that sloppy kissing from, from Pierce and Frost, or uh, what's her name? Rosamund. But at least no biting. We saw how much Bond yeah. loves to bite, but he restrained himself in this film, at least for now. Yeah. Hmm. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, as the two of those uh, two of them make their escape and we do get a bit of cutting back and forth between what they do and what Jinx does so I might just squish some bits together to make it easier to explain but we do see that um, Jinx is there she's all suited up like to break in she's at the top of the, the biodome I'm calling it and she's, she's in cutting. her stealthy red leather spy gear oh so stealthy when I you guess. go to Iceland you want to <laughs> At what night. color? <laughs> red, bright red. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, actually. Yeah, uh, but she's at the top of it. She's cutting open using a laser to cut open a panel at the top and uh, descends down on the rope all the way to the bottom. And she starts to look around. And as she's looking around, she snoops and finds Zhao, who is in the uh, the dream machine. I don't know how I wrote... Was Dream Machine... Did someone say Dream Machine? Did you say it Dream Machine? It might be. I know there's the whole thing about... I think... Yeah, I think Grave says, oh, that's how I dream using the machine because I okay. can't sleep. I just wondered how I got the phrase Dream Machine, but maybe I heard it somewhere. Uh, He's but yeah. dreamy. Sal's a bit dreamy. so Very dreamy. That's probably so why. He's in that. And uh, as she gets quite close to him about to do something, uh, I think she lifts up the visor. Uh, but nope, doesn't get very far. She gets zapped by Graves's zappy power glove Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we are back with uh, Frost and Bond. They go back to their the ice hotel and to keep up the uh, charade of, of being lovers, Bond says, oh, you've got to stay in my suite. Oh, yes. Um, and so they head to the, the lovely ice swan bed and start to undress. 
um, and get into bed together. And Bond puts a gun under his pillow, which he calls an occupational hazard. And uh, later on, uh, afterwards, he's getting dressed and uh, Frost, they kind of make a point of this, but Frost gives him back his gun um, from under the pillow and says, be careful, James, sort of thing. Uh, with Jinx, we see that she has been... Oh, we're up to this bit. I'll just <laughs> let's see where we are. Uh, she's been restrained to a sort of table on a, on a robot arm. Well, it's like a, like a car factory robot arm. And yeah, I don't know what you would call that. It's just like, yeah, it's like a table, but it's like mechanical so it can move. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something. And Zhao's there, um, who is kind of threatening her and asking about um, who sent her, giving her some zaps with the glove. And I just got to point out, I wrote this down, the zaps, that the electrocution in this film looks worse than in Gold, uh, GoldenEye. Yeah. It just does. This is a problem with early CGI. It looks worse than tried and tested, you know, actual methods. So, Well, I think the problem is that it's supposed to be on people where GoldenEye just did it on, like, planes in the sky and could be a bit more stylized. This is, like, zoomed-in shot of Halle Berry being electrocuted. She's like, ah! And they've mm. just had to put, like, electric stuff on it. So it's like, I don't know if... I wouldn't necessarily say the CGI is worse, but I think the the implementation of, like, what they were trying to use it for is a lot, lot worse. Like, they did not have the technology to put up a close-up person being zapped shot. No. No, they didn't have the tech to do a lot of stuff coming up in this scene. Uh, so Sal is asking, yeah, who sent her? And she replies, yo, mama. <laughs> I can't, Got him. I can't. She does say something else after that, but I only cared about the yo, mama, to be she honest She says, with you. and she wanted me to tell you she's really disappointed in you. Oh, that's, okay. that's funny. Good line. Uh, that's a great line. Yo, mama. Uh, <laughs> and... Zhao says that even though the mine is fake, so this is where you learn that the mine is not actually a real diamond mine, the lasers that I guess presumably are used for the diamonds are real. And the lasers Ooh. in this room and on this table are real. And so he... Uh, Mr. Kill was there, by the way. I forgot to mention that. He's just there in the background. And um, Zhao gives orders to Mr. Kill to uh, do as his name suggests and, and kill her. And... Um, he very enthusiastically wants to use the lasers. He's like, I'm going to use the laser. So uh, he kind of sets up the laser, very Goldfinger-esque. You know, it's just this time it's on a moving thing and going in a different part of the body because it's slowly working its way across her neck, kind of getting up to that point. Oh, okay. Um, speaking of lasers, sorry, did you actually want to, anything to say about that scene before I move on? Uh, no, not really. I think it's... Yeah, we've got more lasers to come. Oh, we've got plenty it. of lasers, yeah. So speaking of lasers, Bond is also using a laser. He's using his uh, laser watch. Uh, to Hooray! Cut. Yeah, that comes back. And hey, I like that. Yeah, he's using it to cut a hole in the ice because I think it was mentioned earlier that yeah, this ice palace is on top of a lake. That's when he was spotting the, the water from earlier. So um, he cuts a hole in and he uses his rebreather, which is another Thunderball reference. Um, Hooray. <laughs> to jump down and swim underneath the layer of ice to get into the biodome, popping up at the bubbling pool from earlier. He, and... you, when, you know, he looked in the window that one time, guys, so... That's how yeah. he knew. Yeah. The water, yeah. And in there, he spots Jinx's rope and then goes and finds her on the table. Mr. Kill's not there at first. He just goes in and, and she's there, you know, help me sort of thing, and he goes and turns off the machine. There's this controller that's attached by a cable that swings around and as he turns off the the laser that's going to her neck that's when he gets attacked by mr kill and in in all the hubbub uh, the lasers turn back on somehow and except there's not just one laser there's tons of them and now they're moving frantically all around the place and like going in circles and not just straight lines so this looks crazy <laughs> There's just all these red lasers in the scene going crazy. Uh, Jinx is still tied to the this table that's also moving around it slightly. And Bond and Mr. Kill start fighting. And this fight is just pretty lame. You would think with them being in the middle of these scary looking dangerous lasers, 
they would do something with that, but they just kind of move out of the way and they show the laser like searing some things or cutting through some things, but nothing really happens um, in terms of like them actually fighting around the lasers. They just do. Uh, and then Bond goes and grabs a controller and turns them off. So <laughs> that's that's kind of it. Uh, and as he's doing that, he gets caught again by Mr. Kill and starts getting strangled and I think he's about to stab him with something in his hand. And uh, as he's doing that, Jinx has managed to grab the controller once again. She's now got the controller. With one hand, I think, she manages to program one of the lasers to be precisely behind Mr. Kill's head and then activate it, activates it so it shoots through his skull and out of his mouth. And I was moaning a bit about the laser just then. I think this is actually a pretty cool death. It's quite uh it's quite grizzly looking for a Bond film. It's not not quite head popping, but you know, just seeing Mr. Kill uh with his mouth open and the laser shooting out of it. Uh I oh, I think it pretty much saved the scene, although it still looked terrible. Yeah, it's it's still a CGI, right? <laughs> It's CGI, but also just it just makes it makes no sense either. Like if you're gonna have these crazy lasers spinning around, then you you'd think you'd have moments where I don't know, there's more thought into like dodging them or them doing something, but they don't. Like it's just shots of them in between Bond and Mr. Kill all the time, and there's just no tension there. They just look like wacky waving things with fake lasers on top. So. That side of it's bad. I like the Mr. Kill death, but the rest of it is, is pretty bad. You are 100% completely correct. But you loved I it. I still liked it, though. I knew it. <laughs> I still had fun with it. I mean, this does start tying into the whole Jinx stuff, um, where, again, up to this point, I wouldn't say I really disliked Jinx. Her dialogue's been pretty awful, but I haven't really hated her. But this is when she kind of starts becoming pretty bad. Like, the dialogue is awful, and twice... She just becomes a damsel in distress, and it's tedious. Mm. Um, so we have to see her tied onto the table rather than Bond, which is what Goldfinger did. But I guess Halle Berry, it would have been better if it was Harry Berry on that table, I guess. <laughs> Being like, yo mama, Goldfinger. <laughs> it's like, oh, no. Yo mama. <laughs> I just, oh, there, there's something there about uh, Operation. It's an Operation Grand Slam. Operation Yo Mama. Yo Mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like, I know it's not one-to-one, -one, but yeah, this is where her dialogue gets bad and she does this whole, I, the the moments I dislike Jinx the most is when she is just the damsel in distress. As bad as her dialogue can be, this is the stuff that kind of winds me up a bit and I, I just don't like the setup. But I think the fight itself is fun enough. You, again, you're completely correct. Like if the lasers were off, doesn't really change much but i don't know it's fun enough and silly enough i actually had a decent time with it but mm. but you are correct there's a ton of potential here that they kind of didn't really go into or, or realize at all no just lasers are cool put them on screen get them flinging around like there's no tomorrow <laughs> yeah but uh after that it's all calmed down a bit and bond goes to let Jinx out of this table and uh, that's where we learn that um, well I think he says oh CIA and she goes no uh, NSA so she's an NSA agent and uh, they're on the same side they're both after Zhao and now you might have to explain this to me but Bond w with the whole Zhao in the machine thing Bond makes a connection to Korean I guess there's some of that from before anyway, like the getting getting the gist of it. But it's just in this line, I was like, well, what? how did Bond make that like jump to, oh, well, that means that they must have had another machine here. The boss is Korean. Like, ha was I just missing something there? Not really. I think he takes the jump forward. Like, he knows what's happening. That gets spelled out in the next scene. And I think this is just him realizing it without mm. it getting fully explained to the audience. So, I mean, the breadcrumbs are pretty aggressive up to this point. So you might have already figured it out anyway. 
But I think this is just Bond realizing that that oh, if Zhao is here, then that means that like yeah, I think he figures out what what is going on with Graves for real. If Zhao is connected to Graves, and he knows that for sure because Graves is the one funding this, and he knows this technology exists, and that Graves owns that technology, I think he's just putting it together in his head. So we then get the explanation in a minute's time. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? That minute. Yeah, just a little bit clunky to me, but that could be me just like sort of missing some things now. <laughs> um, but yeah, in order to escape the room, as Tom pointed out, it was Mr. Kill using his handprint. So Bond goes to, says, oh, let's move the body over. And Jinx is just, nap, don't worry. And she lasers it off instead, lasers off his arm and uh, just uses a severed arm for the handprint and then just casually tosses it aside when they're done and uh, they're ready to leave. She's, she's not wasting any time, Jinx. Oh, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, Bond says uh, to... Oh, yeah, Bond is going to go and um, find Zhao. Jinx wants to go call for backup, but... Bond says, can you go get Frost before you do so? Because she's MI6. So that's where um, Jinx is going to head to. And we then cut to uh, Graves' office, where he was having all the glove stuff going on. And he enters the room, and we see that Bond is there on the, on the sofa at the end. He was there, ready and waiting for him, holding him at gunpoint. and. Uh, we get the line of the we get the name of the film in here pretty well, I think. It says so you live to die another day, Colonel. And then oh, that's yeah, that's the big reveal. As if him speaking Korean and talking about but yeah, it's it was pretty obvious, but yeah, there it is. And it's uh, almost like delivered in a way that makes me think that they actually wrote the line first and then decided that should be the name of the film. And maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but it doesn't feel like they forced this line in. I actually think it's surprisingly natural for what this line is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, die, die another day. That's just, I, I guess all of them are just words, but <laughs> compared to the world <laughs> is not enough. Yeah, that's true. Compared to the world is not enough. Someone could use the the words die another day more naturally, I suppose, yeah. But I mean, like, even if we go all the way back to you only live twice, you know, they they go to Blofeld and he's like, you only live twice, 007. Like, it's that was the start of this. This almost feels like a little bit more natural, which uh, I, I kind of like. But obviously you do know it's the name, so it stands out. But I do feel like maybe they actually wrote this line first based on these characters and then said, oh, actually, that works quite well, die another day. Let's, let's shove that in. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised. So yeah, this is actually Colonel Moon that we saw in the pre-title sequence. And he's had... Who? Colonel Moon, not General oh, right. Moon. Colonel Moon. Right-o. And uh, he's had... <laughs> A woman. No, wait. Um, he's had the gene therapy stuff, and that's why he now looks like Graves. And he's been toying Bond along the whole time, right under his nose sort of thing. And... He starts to talk about the, the process of, of uh, transforming and how Bond left such a, a lasting impression back in North Korea that uh, Graves modelled his new face on Bonds, as Tom was saying. like this is, this is like a kind of alternate reality Bond, one not tied to MI6 maybe. Uh, but yeah, he says, you know, the unjustifiable swagger, uh, the crass quips, that sort of stuff. So... Kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, you could see that guy as a, a very nasty Bond. All makes total sense. Yeah, I do almost wish, like, they didn't 100% point that out and you were yeah. kind of left to do that yourself. But I also get why they did. Um, so I don't mind it too much. But I do wish that was kind of left for the audience to figure out. Well, we've had villains before that have almost been... They've, all, they've admired Bond uh, in, like, a twisted way. They're impressed by him. And some, some of them want him to join their side sort of thing and this is just a kind of a different different way of doing that where the villain actually was so impressed by, by bond who wants to actually copy his style so I, I like that as a as a as an idea but yeah you're right maybe i don't know maybe it could have been better without it or not maybe just let it, let it say more than it actually does in some ways um yeah and i think just speaking on this twist because we're about to get another reveal very shortly uh this is something i used to really hate 
And before rewatching this film again, I would always look back on it. I was like, oh yeah, that really stupid one where really stupid villain where a Korean turns into like a British dude. Like that's really dumb. Uh, I actually didn't mind it <laughs> watching it again. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know if it's just this effect of this film on me, I suppose, but yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous, but I actually kind of think it works in its own twisted way. It's not something you could ever take seriously, but I think the way that the actor for Graves plays it works, and I think actually the characterization of Colonel Moon in the opening bit also kind of works. It's all, it's so kind of hammy and cheesy in the way it does it, that this is again another plot point that in another Bond film, stupid, no, get rid, awful. But in this one, I think it works. So something that I normally would have looked back and saying that villain is bad because of how dumb the backstory is, re-watching it, I was actually like, that part's fine. I'm actually okay with it. Yeah, I didn't mind it either. I didn't mind that idea of him turning into Graves at all. We've had slightly similar things. I guess Thunderball again, actually. Lots of links to Thunderball with the guy having plastic surgery to look like the pilot. Uh, and this is just an... Ex- extension of that just going a little bit more all in and a bit crazier with like a total uh appearance change and honestly like, we've had invisible cars we've had all sorts i'm not going to question a dna therapy thing cloning blowfeld as well yeah exactly exactly the doctor creepy doctor is very good at getting that orphan dna so i'm not going to question his his skill there well, he's no an artist, sorry. So. he's an artist he's a dead artist um <laughs> Yeah, so uh, with that, Frost walks in. Frost walks in, um, which Bond is pleased about. She starts by pointing her gun at Graves, and that triggers Graves to ask Bond if he ever found out who actually betrayed him back in North Korea all the, uh, with that sort of stuff, and uh, and says that after all that time, you never thought to look in your own organisation inside MI6 because that's where Frost turns... And points her gun at Bond instead. She was the mole. What? No. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, she was the mole. So the reason why I was a bit confused earlier, like way at the beginning of the podcast, I just presumed that they had not known each other very long. But well, th- this is the confusing part. And I was thinking about this, you know, three in the morning, laying up awake at night in bed. Oh. Uh, because... <laughs> The timeline in this film, I don't quite understand Mm. because Bond gets betrayed and is captured and then spent, and this is when Moon supposedly dies, and then it takes 14 months for Bond to get out, but then three, no, like a year before that, uh, a year after, a year before he gets out is when Graves then reveals himself so I'm assuming that Moon then spends two months in this therapy and makes the transformation. Um, why Zhao doesn't do that straight away, I don't know. That's a bit strange. Uh, but then I guess in terms of when did Frost try to win that medal? Because she's been on the case for three months. But I'm assuming that even though she's been on it for three months, she didn't betray MI6 three months ago. She betrayed it before the events of the opening sequence. Mm. So actually, she must have aligned herself with Moon before he became Graves. Yes. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and I guess that links back to when... Which Olympics was it? <laughs> oh, Sydney, wasn't it? Sydney. Was it Sydney? So so she, that was two... Madonna said Sydney. Thank you, Madonna. She's so helpful. So helpful. So that was 2000, wasn't it? So that would <laughs> wait a So minute. I guess that does line up. <laughs> does it? Well, yeah. So in, oh, if that we're assuming this before. film takes place in 2002, <laughs> but I guess it means that what part of the film takes place in 2002? I would assume that when Bond is released, that's in 2002. Two years ago at the Sydney Olympics, Colonel Moon as himself then meets up with her, helps her win. She then betrays MI6 while still working for MI6. Or, you know, became an MI6 agent after that. And then the offense of the opening sequence happens. He spends two months transforming. Or they obviously, they're still, they're already working together because of what happens in Sydney in 2000. And then that's when the betrayal happens and the offense of the films kick off. 
I can guarantee to you this is the most discussion anyone has ever done about Die Another Day timeline. Well, I think it works, though. I think I was a bit unsure about it, but I actually think it does fit. I guess so. I kind of wish I didn't need to do that, though, but but I guess this is a podcast where we're talking about we need to go all in. So yeah, the average moviegoer doesn't really need to care about this <laughs> level of backstory, but hey, if it all checks out, it all checks out. I mean, we did just have a scene where, like, this is a definitely a classic movie action scene because it's completely stupid that she comes in and points the gun at Graves. <laughs> like, did Graves text her saying, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to mess with Bond. You come oh. in and, you know, you pretend. <laughs> pretend oh, to be yeah. his mate and then turn the gun and then he'll be like, whoa, we'll get him. P.S. What do you want for dinner tonight? <laughs> yeah, you hungry? What are we, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you're right. That is really stupid if you think about it. But no, Graves is relishing this moment when when uh, Frost reveals her, her true identity and that she was the mole. He's loving it. You know, that's when he says she was right under your nose the whole time. And Bond, he has a gun still, and he just goes to shoot her like nice. right there and then, just straight away. Um, but the gun's empty. The gun's not loaded. Oh. Or, or sabotaged in some way because that's that was the whole thing about making such a point of it in bed is that whilst he was sleeping, she must have done something to it. And uh, so he's he's a little bit stuck. Uh, but yeah, this is where you learn that Graves uh, won over Frost by sabotaging her opponent in the Olympic fencing competition and is now using you know, her mind, her, her brains, her body, her sex, all that sort of stuff. And uh, Bond says that... Although they can kill him, there'll be others after him. Meaning Jinx, though we do see her go into the room to try and find Frost, as Bond told her to do, and then she just gets locked in. So she's not doing too well either. <laughs> and uh, back in the office, Frost gets Bond to hand over his watch, over the, like, the toys, the gadgets, because she knows. She knows what's what's up with them. And as he's doing that, he says something. He gives a little quip to Zhao. He says, you... um, I've missed your sparkling personality because mm. of the diamonds in his Those face. Because of the diamonds. And he gets punched, like Zhao punches him in the stomach. So I assumed that that was on purpose to purposely get on the floor. Because um, when he's on the ground, the, the floor of this office is all glass. And so just as Frost is about to shoot Bond, he's wearing his ring, his, activa his sonic ring, and activates that. So all the glass shatters and he falls down into the jungly bio area below so bond and frost and i want to say graves as well they've all like dropped down onto like this the jungle floor and bond because he knows what has happened he just sprints it's another scene where piers brosnan is bond just sprints just the old arms up straight arms and hands yeah. doing his sprinting he loves it <laughs> very tom cruise run come to yeah. think of it yeah yeah yeah, but he does it quite a lot, so we get another one in here. So they're shooting at him, but he's just like running full sprint and he gets to the wire that Jinx used to enter the building. So Jinx came down with this wire, this like electronic wire that allowed her to go quite a long distance down to the ground. And Bond saw that earlier, I believe. So he's now he just runs to it, attaches himself, pulls it up, he goes shooting up to the top. Um, he then uses that to run down the side of the building as well. I don't know if we can call that a Tomorrow Never Dies reference. That's probably a bit generous. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to it. I'll give it nice. to it. Nice, yes. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so Bond runs down the building uh, and disconnects and he sees the, the bullet car, the, the rocket car, whatever you want to call it. The one that Graves was driving earlier to try and beat like the, the speed record. So he just sprints and runs into it. And Zhao sees him go, so orders the guards to go and kill him. And Bond shoots off in the speed car. And we go back to Graves in the office. And he says, ah, oh, this is fine. Uh, it's all about the threat of the kill. Or the threat of the kill is in the chase. So he orders the Korean people that we saw before. And these are actually Korean generals. The ones who are at the Icarus showcase. So he shows brings him into the room and then he was saying oh i promised you uh, to show you a true demonstration of the power of icarus so he uses the little control panel to 
use Icarus to shoot a sunbeam down into the ice. And he's like, oh, well, it's uh, it's going to lock onto his heat signature and it's going to lock into Bond and we'll chase him down. So we see a giant sunbeam shoot down and start chasing Bond, which I don't want to think about this stuff too much because my biggest problem with this is like, how does a sunbeam pick up a heat signature when there's literally an intense heat source right next to him? So how can it possibly distinguish the two? But let's not think about that too much. No, no. I think let's, uh, that's for another podcast. That's for the Icarus podcast. Nice. Okay. I, I won't be there for that, though. So oh, oh really? Notes. I can reschedule if you want. No, no, no. You're busy. We're busy. Everyone's busy. Okay, fine. Your loss. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, but yeah, so the, the giant beam is coming down. And this is all obviously CGI and stuff. Like we are just seeing a giant intense, like there's a sound that goes with it as well. Like there's, like there's this intense sound and this giant sunbeam. It's just chasing Bond. Uh, so Bond is going super quick to try and get away. We get a, a little moment where the engineer dude goes up to Graves and is like, oh, boss, Bond beat your time. And he just snarls at him. <laughs> that was quite nice. Um, but Bond sees a cliff edge. So he's trying to escape from the sunbeam. He sees a cliff edge. So he fires like a hook at the back of it. So there's like a hook on this long wire behind this car or this rocket car thing. So he fires that off and he goes off the edge. And after he goes off the edge, the hook grabs onto the snow or the ice on top and it snaps the car back onto the cliff and i have to say there's a lot of things you can criticize with the cgi on this one this bit made me laugh because they actually did do model work it seems and it looks terrible oh it looks yeah (laughs) this might be one of the worst shots this actually might be worse than the shots coming after this because i think so at least cgi into cgi mess it all flows Whereas, as you say, that is a model shot, and it it's clear that they like the scale of it just didn't work. So they the only thing they could do was slow it down, and it's terrible. I don't know how that made it into the final cut. Yeah, you just get no sense of the weight or the scale of things. It just clearly is a model of a little car on a cliff. It's so cute almost. I don't understand that because they've done model stuff amazingly well in previous yeah. films it's just really dropped the ball drop the drop the car with this one yeah i think it's the the fact that it's all this ice doesn't help i don't think and i think it's like the scale of these cars in the motion normally it's supposed to be something like that's quite big but this one's just like a tiny little car snapping against the wall i think it was like really naive to think they could pull something like that off mm. so yeah so bond is now hanging on the cliff in this car so he starts climbing out he he gets the parachute from the back of the car and then he also like gets rid of the door removes that and the hook slips a bit so he starts falling down and graves decides because the sunbeam is waiting for him at this point Uh, it's just waiting at the top so graves decides like oh i'm going to use the controls of icarus to just cut off the side of the cliff so instead of going forward he just cuts off this edge of the cliff which starts, uh, it's all like, starts dropping down. Um, So we see Bond attaching the metal door to his feet as this giant ice cliff completely drops into the ocean. And we get a line from Graves, which is global warming. It's a terrible thing. (laughs) That's a very good impression. I've said that a few times. That was actually legit a good impression. (laughs) Oh, cool. (laughs) You could could pass. Although actually, I think, um, this is minor tangent, but... uh, Toby Stevens actually did come back to do uh, Graves in uh, 007 Legends, so hmm. <laughs> I don't think you need to. He'll do it. He needs the work, maybe. I don't know. Mate, I hope he's doing all right. I think I quite like him in this film, so yeah, I hope he's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he does that line to the generals. They're all impressed. Uh, but we cut back to Bond and his surfing on the water. Oh, that it's sounds a- cool. That is cool. He's on a metal door parachute and it's a giant wave and... We see all the little big music going on, a very action-y. Bond is surfing and jumping up on these and it's all very chaotic and stuff and uh, it looks fake. It looks really... um, It's all, it's all CGI. It's uh, 100% CGI. 100%. Sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. But I believed in Pierce. We, are, we have now reached the one of our final stops. 
<laughs> oh yeah. We have this reached is... pure CGI station. I, I can understand <laughs> if if this is where you get off. It's this fine. is like this is a this is a stop where it's not like a nice slow pull into the station. This is like hard brakes on the stop. Like yeah. you'll be thrown out of your seat. Are you sure? And also like <laughs> the <laughs> the the station only covers like half the train the train carriages so you got to like run down there's like eight and you got to run to like four, four coaches yeah. <laughs> yeah only the front four coaches depart here and you got to run <laughs> to get off but oh. to be fair and this is something i fall quite a bit in this film i expected worse yeah i think it doesn't look good and I think doing a pure CGI scene like this is ridiculous in 2002. I was somewhat expecting worse. I think for me, it's just the fact that I was expecting it at all. Just really, I, I, I this is another one of those things where I, I knew it was bad, but I didn't really care. Um, I knew it was coming. Everyone talks about it. It does look bad, but you just, and I think there is an element of that as well. I don't, I don't think it looked... I thought there were more scenes with Pierce side on. I think that's one of the worst shots hmm. is not even the full CGI one, but where he is green screened on. And actually there's not. So it, it's not as bad as maybe I remembered it being. And I think actually the one thing I wrote my notes is that at least the music's good. I like the music in this scene. So there's something, there's a silver lining for me. Yeah. I, I think the fact that it's all kind of CGI kind of helps like, doesn't look great, but it's not like CGI on top of real life pretending to be the same thing. This is all just kind of CGI. So to me, that massively helped. I think one of the things that and I, we haven't talked about this yet, where we do get it with Piers Brosnan, where he is a bit older, and I don't think he looks terrible, but for all the stuff they make him do, and for all these like CGI shots, when they do cut back to him and his face doing this stuff, because he is a bit older. I think that's part of what makes these stand out and not look great. That, you know, you talked about it with the sword fight where he looks like he's grimacing and stuff. I think he is kind of struggling across the film to do some of this stuff. And mm. it means like with this scene, when you do cut to him up close, you know, you don't really buy it in the same way that like with the later Roger Moore films, you don't buy all the stuff that they're clearly getting the stuntman to do. Yeah. But rather than just having like a stuntman do it and doing some face shots, instead we get like, a ton of CGI and CGI bond. And then we cut to Pierce holding it, grimacing. And I think that actually makes it worse. And maybe if it was a younger Pierce Brosnan, maybe he actually could have sold some of this a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I, I just, but I also just think they could have, they could have put more effort into this. They could have tried to do more things. They could have tried to do different things, but I do think the concept alone is just too much anyway. Like mm. the idea of Bond on this tsunami, it's it's they just had to go so big, so ludicrous. And I know that by this point in the film you should be used to it, but it's just I still think it was too much. Just too much. And I think most people would agree with that, Joe. That this was too I'm much. I'm glad. I'm glad. I didn't really hate it, but I do agree that it's a very off scene and doesn't look great i'm sorry i'm not going to defend it but i didn't watch it and like grimace or anything i it is what it is i yeah, guess pretty much um, so yeah so the visuals is just him bouncing off all these waves with this ice and trying to get away but it ends with him seeing like a the ice land for let you know actual proper ice that you could land on so he like launches himself up and again we get another kind of awkward shot where pierce has to like lunge forward to prepare himself um so he lunges forward and he he lands on the ice and you get a nice little shot at the end of bond on the parachute landing i guess to try and set it so he's all okay folks he made it out of there that was a very roger moore shot actually that landing uh, yeah, one definitely yeah uh so we now go back to bond's room inside the ice palace and Zhao and frost are there and see jinx and as soon as they open the door, Jinx just kicks Zhao, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> um, uh, just to see Zhao just be a little bit of a joke <laughs> at this point. <laughs> they even Jinx kicks her da um, him down. And I didn't write any of this dialogue down. It's more bad dialogue uh, between Jinx and Frost. And we haven't really talked about Frost yet. 
But I actually really dislike Frost in this film. And I think she's one of the worst, if not the worst character in the entire film. And I think a lot of it is kind of the acting and the dialogue. Like, so she's the whole point in her is that initially she is, you know, she's an MI6 agent, but she's acting. So her chemistry with Bond is really awkward and weird, but it gets explained that, oh, she's acting because she needs to sleep with Bond and keep her cover and stuff. So she's really awkward and strange with some of that stuff. But now that she's just full, I'm evil, like she just kind of gets the jinx treatment where her dialogue is just bad. And I think Rosamund Pike, who has proven she can do a lot of great acting in future roles, like she became quite successful after this film. Uh, But in this one, incredibly off. And actually she bothers me more than Jinx in a lot of scenes. Uh, It's tricky because I would agree. I I think acting wise, she's not great. I don't really know what I don't. You say that she's been very successful. I actually don't really know what else she's been in, to be honest. The big one was that uh, Ben Affleck film. What was it called? I'm going to look it up. It was really good. Oh, why is it not coming up? Why is it not coming up? I want to say it's like Girl Gone or something. Oh, Gone Gone Girl. Girl. Oh, I recognize the name. I didn't. Okay. It's a very good film. She's very good in it. She was also in Johnny English Reborn. Fun fact. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> another Bond girl. Um, yeah, like I'm sh- yeah, I'm sure sh- sure she's a very good actress. Maybe just very very early on in her career or something like that. But also, it doesn't help that the character that she's playing is meant to have literally this frosty demeanor, and so you don't. She doesn't really get much to do with that. I mean, there's a bit where she's pretending to make out with Bond to to stay in disguise, but she's just kind of bland. And I think when she goes evil, she's also still quite bland. So, yeah, I would I I would probably agree with you that I think Jinx is more, she's at least more interesting than uh, than Frost. Perhaps I mean still lesser of two evils maybe is a better way of putting it. Yeah, like Jinx has more direct bad lines like the your mama stuff, but I feel like Frost is more consistently just kind of awful. Like, just kind of doesn't really work. And I kind of wish that they found a better direction for her and the way that her character is portrayed. Mm. Like, if she went super hammy, I'll be all up for that. Or if she was more cold and calculated, I'll be up for that as well. But as it kind of stands, I just find her a bit irritating and annoying. And yeah, she's a, you know, didn't like her. And actually, she, yeah, one of the worst characters in the film for me. Mm. Um, so Frost then yeah there's some back and forth here it's terrible uh frost says oh that's a nice red leather suit i hope it doesn't shrink when it gets wet whatever that means i guess yeah i guess it might shrink and she's gonna drown Mm. so we go back to (laughs) bond (laughs) yeah so so jinx is logged in the room again which was great scene guys very helpful um and we see bond using like the parachute to like knock a man off off a uh, snowmobile so he like drags it across like a wire and then the guy gets knocked off and he takes the snowmobile because he just has to head back to the palace so get a couple of short scenes of him doing that on the snowmobile and he sees the plane go overhead and we cut to Zhao inside the ice palace telling his goons oh we have one hour to wrap this up we gotta wrap this up and this is and Bond sneaking into the palace this is where I think the pacing takes a giant hit. Uh, because we've literally spent a lot of time in the palace. We had a big old action sequence. A lot of stuff has happened. And now we literally are seeing Bond sneaking back into the palace to then, well, leave the palace to then do another action scene. And this is, for me, where I think the pacing of the film, which was pretty damn good up to now, actually takes a hit because we were about to do another big chunk of stuff in Iceland which doesn't really connect together in a in a way that works. They really wanted to get their money's worth out of that set. Yeah. That must be it, right? Like, why do they have any other reason to stay in Iceland? Yeah, I think there's good stuff coming up. There's stuff I really like coming up, but the pacing is what the, the issue is, the way it's all connected together. You are just, as you say, it's one set. It's it's either like the ice pad is all the ice nearby, and you just jump between those for like... Yeah. 40 minutes and it's just like oh that's 
could I cut that down or would have mm. liked that to be cut down? It's just quite awkwardly the way it's put together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Bond sneaks back in or he uses his remote control, which is like a little, I don't know, pen thing almost, I don't know, uh, to move the Fanish near him because his car's still there and he gets into the car. And we see Zhao is nearby looking around but doesn't see the car. Uh, so Bond is using the ray, like uh, thermal imaging, like radar, I guess. I didn't spell the word correctly, so I don't remember. Uh, but some sort of thermal imaging to try and find Jinx. So he knows Jinx is in there, so he's trying to find where she is. Um, but then while he's doing this, a man in a snowmobile just smashes into the back of his car, because <laughs> it's invisible, and goes flying over the top and lands. And uh. this is where Zhao sees this and orders his units to come in. Because he can now see that Bond is there, or somebody is there, because the snowboard deal crashed into nothing. All that training, years of MI6 training, you didn't see that snowmobile coming. No. It's always the little things you you miss out. <laughs> I don't know. It made me laugh. I'll yeah. give it another pass. I like how Bond is legitimately caught off guard by that as well. I was like, oh, oh, damn. Oh. Should have parked it, really. <laughs> Oops. Not just sat here. <laughs> Because he's taking off his jumper or something, and then he just gets caught, caught out. Yeah, not very Bond-like. No. So yeah, with that, with Zhao now seeing uh, Bond, um, he on on the thermal imaging in his car, he shoots at it. I don't. Has he got a BMW? The green one. It's a Jaguar. The Jag. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. It's very nice. And like it. Immediately, like by shooting it breaks the invisibility <laughs> functionality of it. And I gotta admit, that really annoyed me. Um, it's clearly just because they were like, all oh, right, we don't want this whole chase and have to do invisibility DJI stuff. But it's like, well, why? I know they've used it a couple of times and they're going to use it again. But none of this chase has any like gimmick around that. And I just think like, why? Well, I know why. But yeah, but do it like it was, if you're going to have that car that does that, make the effort. It really bothered me. Um, so, yeah, it's it's them two driving around on, uh, on the frozen lake, a big patch of ice. And it's just uh, a car chase to show off all the gadgets in in this car, aside from the invisibility one. So um, you've got Bond uh, using the, the torpedo, the missiles and the tire spikes, I think, show, make make a appearance as well. Um, at one point, I think Zhao is like locking on to Bond uh, onto the Aston Martin with some sort of missile, and then how does it, how does the car get flipped? That's what I forgot. So yeah, there's a little bit of like Bond handbrakes turn and they shoot missiles at each other, then he turns back. But I think Zhao actually does hit Bond almost. It's just like hits maybe his wheel and that missile causes the car to flip. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Because all I remember is the car is upside down and Bond opens up the uh, the sunroof. The roof opens up and just as the Aston's about to get hit by another missile, Bond triggers the ejector seat, which causes the car to flip back up and dodge out of the way. So... That stuff I like. Like, give me all that stuff. It's it's very um, uh, living daylights, just showing gadget after gadget and basically getting them out of the way. I think another point he uses all the little um, uh, target seeking things to shoot down more missiles or torpedoes or whatever. And I, I don't mind all that. I just wish that they had had something with the invisibility in there. I'm going to keep on moaning about that just because I I think it's a, such a missed trick. I guess so. I think this is so good, though. I, I really do have a ton of fun with this. It's, you know, you got some more naughty zoom-ins and zoom-outs and stuff, which I'm not... I, I, I don't really dislike because they're just so over the top that <laughs> you can't miss them. But I don't know, seeing an Aston Martin and this Jaguar chasing it, like basically two Bond cars going up against each other, it's awesome. And I think that's what I personally focus on. I don't really think about the fanish stuff here i just kind of focus on like yeah two people using bond cars to try and take each other out and the back and forth and that shot where he uses the ejector seat to spin the car and the missile goes past awesome that's like one of my favorite like chase moments ever in any bond film i i was 
Again, wow. it's a shame that the pacing of the film as a whole takes a hit here because it does kind of bring this scene down a bit for me. But I think as a standalone chase scene, it's so much fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I liked... I did like the location of it as well. I think it's quite cool to just have... Because usually in a lot of Bond chases, it'll be you know, going around bends, going through alleyways or streets or whatever. And this is just two cars on a big patch of ice. Nothing to hide behind. No cover. I guess that's maybe why the invisibility stuff wouldn't have worked very well anyway. Because it's like, <laughs> what are you going to do in a big <laughs> in a big patch? But um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I guess, man, I don't know. Something about it I still didn't love, though. But anyway, um, we see on back on the plane, the plane that uh, Graves is in. Um, he is using his big remote control interface for the Icarus satellite, the one that the nerdy engineer guy made. And uh, he says, time to give the American her bath. Not, not such a great line, but um, he loads up the interface and turns on the Icarus beam directly onto the palace, which obviously starts to melt it. And so Jinx is still trapped inside and everything starts to melt and she's trying to break down the wall, but not really getting very far. Bond uh, spots the palace starting to melt in the distance and so heads towards it. And there's there's like outside the entrance, there's a couple guards on snowmobiles that start shooting at Bond. He just plows straight through them. They go flying. Yeah, these two. I don't. I didn't really get the point of why they're even there, but I thought it's funny the way they bounced off anyway. <laughs> yeah, but he just uh, smashes straight through into the palace. Zhao is still on his tail, um, and we're kind of getting the second section now. We've had that bit. I was just saying about in the big open bit. You've now got that bit of a car chase where it's all going around bends and stuff because these two they drive around this. TARDIS Ice Palace by the looks of it. This place is huge on the inside. They're just going around bend after bend and floor after floor. Um, all very thankfully uh, just wide enough for cars to fit through as well. So as it's all starting to collapse, Jinx is starting to get submerged, starting to drown. Bond when the Aston reaches uh, a dead end or at least a spot quite high up where he can't go any further and Zhao is right behind him. And it looks as though Zhao is about to... He gets out these big and like spiky things on the front of the car and is about to sort of ram Bond off, off the edge down below. So in great timing, the invisibility functionality on Bond's car works just in the nick of time. So he turns it back on and also activates the tyre spikes, the traction, and goes invisible so yeah Zhao goes to ram him but hey the car's not there he flies straight through and down into the ice and the lake below because Bond turns back on uh, and he's actually driven up the side of the wall out of the way so hey they you know they did use it there credit where it's due they did use it a little bit so I can't get too mad um <laughs> so yeah Bond uh Zhao is now like in the water he gets out the car um and is swimming to the surface. Bond is driving back down. He on his way down he shoots a massive chandelier that just conveniently is right above Zhao and that falls down and crushes him and kind of churns all the water as it falls on him. It's kind of a similar shot to uh Alex. Or Alec, sorry. Um with the satellite falling on him. But yeah, he gets crushed by the chandelier, all the water churns up and turns red. And that's the end of Zhao. I thought that was really good. I think that's really good death. Good death. <laughs> like the guy who had all the diamonds in his face gets crushed by the chandelier. That's ah, oh, that's perfect. It's poetic. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I yeah, I, Zhao isn't really that much of a henchman. When at the end of the day, I think the henchmen in this film are a little bit confused because you got Mister Kim and Zhao. But I still quite like Zhao's actor, and he's a weird-looking guy <laughs> with diamonds in his face. Yeah. And, I think it was fun having this big chase and yeah, I love how like casually Bond shoots the chandelier as well. It reminds me of in the world is not enough where Bond shoots the lock to free M. He just like pops out the window of the car, shoot the chandelier and drive off, <laughs> which causes it all to, to land and kill him. It's very casual, which I thought was quite cool. He knows what he's doing. 
Yeah, I didn't mind Zhao either. I think, um, as you say, very, very memorable visually with all the diamonds and stuff and the, the bald head and the white skin. I guess he didn't really do too much in the film, but I, I, he was in there enough. And I'm, Joe, you know what I've, you say about Mr. Kill, I'd already forgotten about Mr. Kill. He sucks. I'd much rather have Zhao than him. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I've criticized the pacing of this bit. I like that now all the henchmen are out the way. <laughs> It's, uh, it sets up the finale a little bit better because after this ice and bit, we're going to the finale. So I like that Mr. Kill was killed in that laser scene and I like that Zhao kind of gets this death here to cap off Iceland. So we're not like, I wonder what Zhao is up to for the next bit. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Well, there's... How would you define Frost? Um... Something. I don't, I don't, <laughs> she's, she's Yeah, she's in it for sure. Yeah, she's in it. Anyway, uh, with Zhao out of the way, Bond carries on driving and smashes into the room that Jinx is in, uh, that she's drowning in, and uses the ring to smash his windshield and pull her through. And then he like, launches out of the wall of the Ice Palace and carries her to a sort of bubbling hot spring that's very close by and you know, starts to give her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation and of course it works she's fine everyone don't worry jinx isn't dead she's she's all good she's good enough to even give a quick quick little bit of sass what took what took you so long she says after nearly dying and then <laughs> laughing about it she's all right uh and then they bond looks up and sees the plane fly off so graves is out of there he's gone hmm. i do like kind of like this section of the film but as i already said you know, it feels a little bit tedious due to the pacing of this overall Iceland section, and we are getting quite close to the end of the film as well. Uh, but something that I don't really like, and I think it's something you didn't really touch on too much, is that throughout a lot of this, we are cutting to Jinx drowning. Like, yeah. They keep cutting back to Jinx in the room trying to escape. She doesn't escape. And then we keep cutting back to like, oh, now the water's starting to fill up. But then, oh, she's about to start drowning. Oh, oh now she is drowning. Like they keep doing that and they really want to set it as oh this the tension from this is all about Bond trying to find her in time. It's not really about the Ice Palace melting at all. It's actually all about Bond being able to rescue Jinx before she drowns. And I don't really like that. Like I said before, I don't like Jinx when she's just the pure damsel in distress. And it happens twice in Iceland. And I think it does bring it down. Overall, I still actually enjoy this section of the film. I think the the chase outside is good and even inside even though it's very clearly a set like so clearly a set like i don't buy this as a melting ice palace it just looks like a wet set (laughs) that has water everywhere (laughs) i still think it looks kind of good um so this thing definitely have problems and things i'm not super happy about it but there was enough good for it uh for me to enjoy it it's just yeah it's uh definitely flawed um this bit yeah, I, I like I say, by this point, the Ice Palace stuff, I was kind of getting checked out. I, I just, well, I mean, we'll talk about more at the end, but I was so, I was getting really sad because I was, re- I enjoyed the start of this film so much and then I was just slowly like going down and down and down in terms of mood. But we're not there yet. So, um, yeah, Bond spotted the, the plane fly off and we're then changing the location entirely. Finally, we are leaving that damn Ice Palace. <laughs> Uh, Because we're going to the demilitarized zone. We're going to a US command base um, where Bond and Jinx are are being taken down um, into a command bunker. Um, There's troops everywhere and everything, and they're going down there. They meet Robinson. He's here, and he's in his film quite a lot, actually, (laughs) for being that sort of character. But Yeah. uh, yeah, Robinson's there to give a quick brief about what's going on, and uh, they've spotted that There are 80,000 North Korean troops that are being mobilized and near the border. And they think that they're they're building up ready to invade the South, South Korea. So uh, that's why as they go further into the bunker, there's M. There's also, what's his name again? Falco. Falco. Falco's there uh, in this, yeah, computer screens everywhere. It's like a command hub. And Falco says that they've launched a missile, an ASAT missile at the Icarus satellite to destroy it. But uh, because Graves have, have spotted Graves' plane and he's in the middle of uh, the North Korean uh, North Korean airbase, so they're right where 
they can't touch him. So, uh, and I would also, I think Falco says that they've had no, uh, they've had instructions for no uh, infiltrations into North Korea. But um, M wants to send Bond, obviously. He's her best man. And so if Bond is going, Falco says, well, we're not leaving this to the Brits. So Jinx, you go with him too. And uh, they're off together to um, to go sneak into North Korea once again. And to do yeah, that... pretty sorry. Yeah, pretty quick scene, really, uh, just to kind of get some... A lot of plot there, but it's it's more that like back and forth, like the British intelligence agents against the US one, and there's a little bit of back and forth there. It doesn't really go anywhere at the end of the day, um, but yeah, it's a little bit of back and forth. They do also say that Bond is talking about General Moon, the dad, saying, well, he doesn't want a war, which is kind of in, hinted at the start of it, but they explain, oh, there's been a coup, so actually the General Moon is no longer in charge, which is why somebody's now going ahead in North Korea to start a war with South Korea and invade. Oh, okay. I completely missed that. But that does make sense. Um, so yeah, to get to North Korea, Bond and Jinx are dropped from a plane, and they're not just literally dropped, that would be a bit harsh. Um, they, they've they got these sort of mini planes, I don't know. I don't know what they are. Like yeah, they're just wings, but yeah, I think like... Falco calls them switchblades. But switchblades. Oh. I don't know why. Okay, well they go down on some switchblades, and after a certain point, they just parachute down uh, to nearby where the air base that Graves is at. And we also see the uh, the missile that Falco mentioned that the the US have sent to destroy the satellite, and it's it's spotted by the North Koreans and by Graves, and so. They just turn on the beam and aim it directly at the missile. So you, yeah, you just see in space this missile heading towards it, big beam on it, and it just burns up and explodes. And then you see all the US generals are, are watching this back at the, the command bunker. And pretty embarrassing, gotta say. It just blows up a completely, completely failed plan. But I say completely failed. I don't know... Obviously, they look very disappointed at this, but my question was, surely they could just aim two missiles from different yeah. directions? Or you could have shot at it when it started firing its beam later. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they ever addressed, like, oh, my God, we need... Send another one. I don't think they do. But <laughs> We only had one. <laughs> we only had one missile. Should have bought two. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Silly Falco, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, after that embarrassment, uh, we see Bond and Jinx are outside the airbase. It's all at night. They're all suited up in their combat gear and they're spying on uh, Graves' plane because it's all being loaded up, ready to take off. And Bond is there with the rifle. Jinx is there giving him instructions, you know, windage and all that sort of stuff. And Bond is uh, trying to get a, a clear shot of Graves as he's, as he's getting onto the plane. But... I think just at the last second, uh, Frost walks in front, and there's also a jeep that walks past, uh, that drives past. So Bond can't can't get a shot of him. So they have to go to Plan B, which is to just get onto the plane itself. So they start cutting through the wire fence very hastily as well. It's quite. <laughs> I was a bit stressed at this bit, honestly. Like we talk about tension with saving, <laughs> saving Jinx. This was a bit I was getting stressed at. Like quickly, cut it, cut it faster. <laughs> Yeah, like there's no gadget here. Bond and them are just using wire cutters, but they have yeah. to do it bit by bit. So they're like, tick, tick, click, tick, tick, click. Like very slowly doing it. Where it's like, come on, oh, I missed the plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. So they do get through and they run up alongside the wheels and they eventually climb on board, like into the landing mechanism, just as the plane starts to take off. So, yeah, so that's like, obviously, you went through that quite quick. But something that is quite nice about this part of the film is that they do just get you to the finale. Like, yeah. we spent a long time in Iceland. So now, all right, let's get some plot out of the way. Let's get the setup out of the way. We are now on the plane, and this is where the finale takes place. So I do appreciate that they get to this point quite quick. They don't kind of mess around um, because we are towards the end of the film. Yeah? Mm. yeah, very grateful for that. Yeah, which is nice. So, yeah, so we're on the plane and we see Graves on the plane in the, like a command room there's like a pretty big room um that's kind of at the front of the plane and it looks like a big command room so graves asks for his his father to be brought down to him 
Um, and also we see a very odd looking suit, like a top of a suit of armor almost, some sort of tech. Um, so we go back to Bond and Jinx. So they have entered the hangar of the plane where they see lots of barrels and sports cars. Um, so they've entered in and they're now sneaking through. So we go back to the command center where General Moon now enters the room. And we see the three Korean generals from before. They kind of look away. So I think it's implied that the three Korean generals are the ones that did the coup. Mm. Um, and they've been able to capture General Moon, which is why he's here. Because Graves is, is the one who orchestrated the coup um, using these generals. So um, we go to Graves and Graves has put on this suit and he looks so stupid. <laughs> like this is a like control suit for Icarus. But he has like these big goggles on, which they must have known how silly he looks. They're, they're, they're like so magnifying goofy. goggles. It's just, if you're yeah. going to have goggles, don't, don't make his eyes all look big and stupid as well. Come on. No. Yeah, it's like purely amplifying his eyes, really. So Graves turns around and says, Father in Korean to, to General Moon. But Moon's like, I don't know who you are. Which then goes with a bit of a back and forth and Graves says, I'll never forget what you taught me, father, which is in war, the victorious strategist only seeks battle after victory has been won. Uh, which pretty much kind of proves to Moon uh, that Graves is who he says he is. Um, but Graves is saying this suit is going to guarantee our victory, this Icarus suit. So... There is a, then another quick scene of Bond and Jinx just sneaking through the hangar again. Waste of time. But anyway, so that we then go back to Moon. <laughs> so Moon, General Moon approaches Grave and sees his, touches his face. And then very conveniently, there's a head sculpt of Colonel Moon back when he was still Korean before the surgery. So he was able to touch the sculpt and touch Graves and be like, hmm, yes, you are my son. So, <laughs> oh, handy. I didn't even read it as that, to be honest. I don't know what I was even focusing on at this point, but <laughs> that's, that's quite funny. It's I think just, that's all you could be. Otherwise, what, it's, it is very strange. There's this head sculpt of him. Just a random bust there, yeah. Yeah, very helpful. So, yeah, he now kind of believes him. And uh, General Moon's like, what have you done to yourself? Why have you done this? And Graves is all like, come watch, father. And then he says, come watch the rising of your son, which I thought was a very strange way of phrasing that i'm assuming there's some tie to japanese with the rising sun or stuff but i didn't want to think about it too much but using the phrase rising sun felt a bit like i don't know what they're trying to say there rising sun yeah he says watch the rising of your son well the rising of his literal son i don't know i don't know if he means sun as in him or sun as in the beam or sun as in like the rising sun of japan but obviously he's korean so it can't be he's a clever one that that Graves. Oh, he, he's got so talented. <laughs> uh, so Graves then uses his power glove, we'll just call it that, to activate Ica Icarus. And what it does is that we get a giant sunbeam again, and that hits the where the minefield. So in the big old area where there's that's separating North Korea and South Korea, where all the mines are, he is destroying the mines in the zone. Um, so Bond is sneaking through the plane. We see a little bit more than that, but then we go back and yeah, the beam is just completely destroying this big track through the minefield. Lots of explosions going on here. And Grave says, I'm creating a highway for our troops. So the idea is that the troops he had stationed are going to invade South Korea once he has drawn a massive line through the minefield that allows them to cross it. Um, so at this point, Bond and Jinx enter the room and Bond... Oh, and, no, sorry, enter a different room. My bad. Uh, so this is like, what would you call this room? Like the martial arts fighting room? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just got like, it's a lot of martial arts stuff on the walls. It's like where you would practice with swords and things like that. Yeah, on a, on a plane. Interesting. I never really <laughs> even even put that, that together, but that's kind of strange. I put it that Graves and Frost are fencing and are going for the Olympics. Oh, so it probably does make sense room. that they would practice on the plane like this. Wow, I hope they don't get any turbulence. I mean. Oh yeah, that'd be ooh. ooh. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Ew. Didn't mean to slice you. <laughs> uh yeah, so so Bond and Jinx enter that martial arts room. Bond knocks out a guard. Jinx throws a knife at somebody's throat and kills him. Uh Graves then starts making a speech about the West and he says like Japan is a bug waiting to be squashed. 
And General Moon's not into this, saying, what are you doing? America will send a load of nukes. And Graves is like, don't worry about that. Icarus will destroy them. Uh, but at this point, Moon kind of panics and he grabs somebody's gun and points it at Graves, trying to get him to stop. Um, and we cut back to Jinx, who sneaks onto the cockpit of the plane, knocks out the pilot and like takes control. So now she's piloting the plane. Uh, and Graves is talking to General Moon, saying, would you kill your own son? Why would you do that? Um, General Moon says, my son died uh, a while ago. You're not my son. And he's all like, father, you disappoint me. Gives him a little zap. And we get some very dramatic over-the-top music. And then a gunshot goes off that you don't see. But Graves is looking all sad. And we get a slow-mo falling off General Moon going to the ground. And it's all very dramatic. Yeah, it also looks terrible as well. Like, it has more of that weird time remapping where as he gets shot, he's like, he goes really quick and then he goes slow again. And then why why are they do, why, why now of all times are they doing that? I kind of get it a bit. If you're going to do that, all right, do it on a car as it's driving and you're getting like a swooping shot over it. That makes sense to me. Why are you doing it on a close up of a character dying? It just doesn't well, make I think any that sense. is something they did back then. Like the big dramatic sad moments got the big dramatic slow-mo stuff as well. <laughs> I don't mind the slow mo, but it's just the bit before the slow mo where it goes far, like someone's pressed fast forward. I was like, why? Why would you do that? Mm. Mm. And this is where also the music, like, I don't really mind this scene. I actually kind of like it just because it's so silly uh, and over the top. But yeah, this is where I don't know if David Arnold was like, I guess I'll do a big chorus of people going like, um, oh, like <laughs> to make it more dramatic. But that's what we get here. Mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe. David Arnold's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's fine. By this point, it's like, oh, bloody hell. Um, yeah, stick in some chorus. Stick in some yeah. voices, I don't know. So I kind of do like all this because it's kind of silly and exaggerated and it matches with uh, Graves' character. The main problem is where we are at in the film <laughs> and the idea that maybe we are meant to care about this because that's absolutely absurd. No chance. Um, but I, still, I like in a vacuum, but yeah, for where we are in the film probably don't really want to be messing around with this a little bit too late for this yeah i think earlier on this would have been fine for sure yes yeah, so where are we so i think at this point bond enters the room of which graves then just sees bond is like oh you're there <laughs> again <laughs> bond doesn't sneak in at all graves just sees him so bond is like grabbed by a guard and as part of the fight with the guard he shoots the gun and I, I don't know if this is a Goldfinger reference. I kind of hope it is. I think it is. Yeah, the gun bullet like rips a hole in the side of the plane due to the pressure. And the engineer guy, if you remember him, he just gets sucked out. So he's gone. Yay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um, but due to this change in pressure, the plane starts kind of freaking out and tilting and starts like going forward. Um, so more people kind of get sucked out of the plane. I think the Korean generals get sucked out and we see Bond and Grace hanging on as it's like tilting forwards. Um, so Jinx is trying to pull the plane up. It's gone into a nosedive, but she's trying to pull it up. And we see Graves is trying to climb up to get to Bond and he just kicks him down. Of which then Bond just like rolls after him to go and fight him. Um, but at this point, Jinx manages to level out the plane Calm things down. We've got a little bit of craziness there, but she manages to uh, to calm things down. So yeah, so not too much to say on this stuff. This is all just kind of part of one big kind of crazy finale, and this is just kind of the start of it. So with Jinx leveling out the plane, we then see Frost appears behind her and holds a sword to her neck. And it's like, let me see the gun and drop it. Uh, so Frost seemingly has Jinx captured. Um, but we go back to Bond and Graves and they wrestle for a little bit so they're fighting a lot of jumping and forwards with this um, but then we go back to Frost and Jinx so Frost tells Jinx put the plane on autopilot and Jinx does that but she manages to set it up so the plane is going to go directly into the beam that is being fired from Icarus so she sets that up and Frost doesn't notice um, but down below we're seeing a ton of explosions so we go back to the sunbeam 
and Charles uh, Charles Robinson is saying, oh, the beam is only 1,000 meters away. So lots of explosions, lots of destruction of the Earth. All the monitors inside their base where MI6 and the Americans are, they're starting to just blow up. Um, but at this point, the plane actually heads into the beam, which like knocks everyone down. And then we get these kind of miss these shots that just don't match where it's the shots of like the plane completely burning up <laughs> going through the beam and yeah. then people just being like whoa <laughs> Ooh. yeah yeah <laughs> i feel like there might have been a bit of a mishap in, uh, in the order of things here it seems like there should be a bit more of a reaction there yeah they just don't match like the impact of this beam it just causes commotion for those the people inside. It, there's no sense of like we are in the middle of a literal sunbeam, <laughs> and I hope the plane holds. <laughs> well, especially because it starts tearing apart. Yeah, but like it's, it's being ripped apart by this beam on the outside. But it's holding out pretty well inside. Yeah, considering. <laughs> so Jinx and Frost has made it to like the fencing martial arts room. And this is when the plane goes into the beam. So it gives kind of Jinx a... Or actually, I think Frost attacks Jinx with the sword. But the plane shortly after escapes the beam. And that's when the proper fight between Jinx and Frost plays out. So she gets her small blades out. That Jinx has these like little blades that she's using. She throws some. And one of them goes into The Art of War. The book for The Art of War which was in that room. So Frost and Jinx starts fighting. Frost is like kind of swinging her sword. No, yeah, Jinx is mostly trying to avoid her. She manages to find like two small swords. So it's Frost is like big sword against her small sword. They're fighting each other with these swords. Jinx like gives Frost the old elbow to the face. We then cut back to Graves punching Bond for a bit. So they're still fighting. Uh, and then we get like a slow-mo slice from Frost where she like manages to slide Jinx's torso, but it's all in slow-mo. Uh, and then we go back to Graves and Bond fighting, where Graves kicks Bond, but it's all in slow-mo. That means <laughs> they, it's cool. Yeah, they go all in on this stuff. Apparently they couldn't do the Matrix stuff, but they wanted to do like a version of it, but never mind. So uh, Bond punches Graves, and Graves starts slapping Bond. But we go back to Jinx and Frost and Jinx starts doing like some wacky backflips here, just really going crazy. Um, but that causes Jinx to be facing the other way from Frost and Frost is like, ah, I can read your every move. So Jinx just throws, finds the book, like the knife that has the book in it, throws that knife and the book, that goes into a chest. I think she then kicks it or something. Mm, and read says, this read this bitch so frost is now being killed by jinx and yeah i mean i guess the thing that's kind of very odd about this is that like frost is in like <laughs> isn't wearing much for this no she's not i wonder why they, yeah it's a mystery they, they were very clearly just started using this character for just like the sex appeal like let's have sexy young woman just wearing like a very a top that just barely covers her chest and that's that and now we're gonna have her do a fight with Jinx, Harry Berry, and it's I mean it's not played to be super sexy to be fair outside of that. This does seem like quite a legit fight between the two. And I think the fight itself is pretty alright. It's not bad. Uh it's just well, I don't really like either of these characters, so I just don't really care all that much. Yeah, not, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really do much to save either of them. Yeah, I think on that level, in terms of character, not very invested. But I also just think visually, the way these and the fight with Bond and Graves are just filmed in such a. I mean, they are on a plane that's falling apart to give, you know, to be a bit fair. But, you know, it's all so shaky and it's kind of like you can't really even focus on something before it switches back to them and it cuts back to them and it cuts back to them. And it's like there's no. They're not giving these scenes like any kind of tension. It's just constant back and forth, which. You said earlier, it's like it's their attempt to build up tension maybe or something or just keep it going, but it just kind of has the opposite effect and just makes it all that. I really just don't care about what's going on with both of them, but especially the uh, the Frost and Jinx fight. Uh, yeah, I yeah, guess. This, this kind of ties into how they try to characterize Jinx, which is she is her own agent. She's basically a female Bond in a lot of ways. 
and it means they had to separate all this stuff to give her her own proper fight. And it was just not the way to go. <laughs> it just makes it no. more confusing and weird where Wei Lin and Bond, they tied them together and had them work together. And there was some separation. Yeah, she buggered off to go into the engine room, but they were just smarter. It's the same idea, really. They were just kind of a bit smarter about it and it was shot in a more cohesive way where this is like, oh, she's going to go and do her own thing, her own storyline. It's just like, oh, who cares about this? I don't need to see this. No. Um, so yeah, Bond and Graves, they're still fighting. Uh, Graves is Graves is zapping Bond real good with his cyber suit now and snarling the whole way through. He's, he's loving it all so much. And uh, he's also like bleeding on the lips as well. It makes him look really horrible, like kind of like really red lipped and not, not like a lipstick way. It's just like gruesome way. Um, yeah, it's like blood between his teeth on his yeah, lower Yeah, yeah. Looks bad. Uh, but yeah, Bond falls to the floor. Um, after that last zapping and Graves goes to uh, a nearby cabinet uh, on the plane and grabs two parachutes. Says, oh, look, parachutes for the both of us. And then kind of cartoonishly just throws on out. And, Whoops. <laughs> um, oh, I wish out. you... Oh, I want you to put more energy into that. <laughs> Try and match his energy. Oh, what does he, what does he actually say? It's like, oh, look, parachutes for the both of us. Oops, not anymore. It's so good. Yeah, you're, you're, you're the, the you're the resident Graves imp, uh, um, impersonator, I think, for this podcast. Because <laughs> <I'm laughs> I love that line. That's the thing. that really made me laugh, and I remember loving it as a kid. It was just so funny seeing that old Graves come back, being so like happy and that like eccentric billionaire persona, and just being so smug. Uh, I loved that line. Right to I the bitter end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he puts on the one he didn't throw out the window and crouches down to Bond and, and says to him, you can't kill my dreams, but my dreams can kill you. Time to face destiny. <laughs> uh, as I, I say this only because of Bond's line later. Uh, Bond, having had that said, Bond pulls the ripcord to uh, Graves' parachute, which obviously opens it at the back. And because he's nearby to the window, parachute gets sucked out. And so does he. So he's now like pretty much out of the window, um, hanging on onto the edge. And this is where Bond gets up and says, time to face gravity, (laughs) which doesn't really. Anyway, um, and presses a button on the front of the cyber suit, which for some reason, I guess it's. Yeah, it causes the whole suit to become electrified and and yeah, Graves gets electrocuted, which causes him to let go. And so he gets sucked into the jet engine and positively vaporized. So like you see, you see him burn up and come out the other end. So that's that's the end of Graves. I really like the death for Graves, actually. It's just as over the top and silly as he is. Mm. It, it's very CGI, like a lot of this stuff is, which is kind of a shame, but I think it works well enough. The only problem I have is the line. But I feel like him being sucked into a jet engine, especially with the fact that he gets a, like he electrocutes himself, I feel like there must have been something so much better than time to face gravity. Because yeah. gravity doesn't kill him. Exactly. That's what I was about to say, but I stopped myself. But it doesn't that it doesn't make sense. But I think everything else I actually really like as an ending. I like his smugness. I like how silly he looks. I like that Bond kind of uses his smugness against him to pull the parachute and he gets sucked out and dramatically explodes in the engine. I think all that stuff's actually really good. Mm. I just, I think I would have liked, because we got a taste of it before in the fencing fight, I wish they had just kind of focused purely on Bond and Graves in this ending bit. I know they had to deal with, with Frost, but I think, as I mentioned, it's just that constant cutting back and forth. I would have liked like one nice ending and instead we got just like little slithers of it and then this final bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly, like someone getting sucked into a jet engine. That's that's great. Come on now. You can't, you can't go wrong with that. It's like Sherry Bobbin style when the Simpsons just like completely sucked through. So that's all good. Uh, so after that, Bond heads uh, into the area where Jinx and Frost were fighting and spots Frost's dead body uh, with Jinx just sitting nearby. Um I think I broke her heart, which actually, again, it's not a terrible line for Jinx when she says that. So no, um, that's fine. That's fine. That passes. Uh, but yeah, they 
I think she says, I can't remember, something about, I guess we're going down together. Bond says, not yet. So they head to the cargo area of the plane and Jinx goes and opens the, the back door of the plane, similar to the one we saw in Living, uh, Living Daylights. It all opens up and inside there's a heli. It just so happens to be a helicopter inside this plane. So that's quite, uh, that's quite useful. So they start unloading all the stuff because it's on a big conveyor belt. So there's all these fancy sports cars ahead of it and they get chucked off. The whole plane is starting to fall apart now. Um, and they get into the helicopter and they literally fall out of the plane in the helicopter. And Bond is there in it trying to gain control of it as it's spinning. And they're, you know, the falling pieces of the plane around them are nearly hitting them. And Jinx turns around and looks and spots that the, the helicopter is completely full of tons of diamonds in the back, so at least they'll die rich. But, uh, of course, just at the last second, Bond gains control of the helicopter and it swoops just as just as it's about to hit the ground and goes back up. And we do get a shot of one of the, <laughs> one of the planes, uh, sorry, one of the cars, like, vertically stuck in the mud and there's this farmer there looking at it. I wonder if that's a reference to... Oh... Was that Moonraker? I think it was, where they had like a car perfectly vertical in the house. That could be another reference. Oh, with the Italian... Italian no. guy, yeah. Wasn't that... Oh, maybe that was. I, I was thinking The Spy Who Loved Me, where Jaws comes out of the house. Comes out of the house? Yeah, you know, when the Oh, the yeah, car no, that lands... is The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, sorry, that yeah, is The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, that's The Spy Who Loved Me, yeah. Yeah, I knew it was Jaws, but yeah. Um, so yeah, they're fine. They're all good. They fly off. And... We cut to, randomly, we cut back to MI6 uh, in London, and Money Penny is there. She's in her office. So we're very late and moody and dark, and she is typing up uh, what looks to be like a sort of press release on her computer about what happened in North Korea, and uh, saying it was a freak electrical storm that caused all of this and all of the landmines to go off. And Bond walks in and walks over to her, or she walks up to him and starts to touch his tie, and I don't think there's any dialogue here. They just start kissing. And Money Penny pulls Bond by his tie onto her desk and he sweeps all the stuff off her desk very passionately. Money Penny, oh James. And then of course Q interrupts because yeah, it's another it's another training simulator VR thing. Um we see Money Penny, she's just on that same bit that Bond was, but on the floor. <laughs> and she says she's just testing it out. And she's all flustered as she's buttoning up her top. That's the bit that I'm guessing you really don't like. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it comes right at the end of the film. Yeah, just that's cut a bit it. Like, We just don't need it at this point. But also, I think it does, like, it's just a bit of a stain on Samantha Bond as Money Penny. I think overall she's been pretty solid. Pretty good. Not amazing, but pretty good. And I think going all in with this is just lame. Like, it just kind of destroys some of the character of Money Penny, where you kind of, you know, it's obviously kind of, especially with the original films, heavily implied that she's actually does really like Bond and would like this to happen. But to actually show it, I just like, ah, no, just, just cut it. And so, which is why I would cut this and cut the last one as well. Just keep, make the film a little bit shorter. This really has nothing to do with anything. Once again, I think mm. it does ruin Samantha Bond's as Money Penning a little bit. And actually, this is what I think of when it comes to her Money Penning out, oh, no. which sucks because I think everything else she's actually pretty good. Uh, but yeah, this is just, just this is just kind of bad. I mean, it's pretty quick and we're nearly done. But yeah, just bad. Yeah, definitely a strange location to put it because yeah, the next shot is literally the the, the last part of the film. We we see this big wide angle shot of uh, this kind of small temple in the mountains with a helicopter that's landed out kind of outside it. And inside, Bond and Jinx are there in bed together. But before you actually see them, there's this dialogue, this kind of very uh, innuendo-based dialogue. Oh, Jinx is saying, don't pull it out yet. And, oh, no, wait, wait, wait. And then what do you see? It's actually a diamond in her belly button, you it's sickos. Diamonds. It's, yeah, it's just a diamond and... Uh, can't remember what they say, but they eventually start to kiss, and that's the end of the film. Hey, and yeah, then you get that electro die another day song again. I could I could have just give me the Bond theme at the end of Bond films. That's more than enough, but at least yeah, it's fine. 
Yeah, another one of those kind of city endings with the joke endings, but quite brief. That's the thing. They do kind of get you out of there. <laughs> it's just all very brief. Like, let's do the Indowendos and the Bond Bond and the Bond girl kissing. And yeah, it's not the worst one, but a bit pointless. Yeah. So that was Die Another Day. That was Die Another Day. We certainly will. Um, so uh, it's me to go first, I believe, because it's a even number episode yep. so i would say this is my favorite bond film oh that involves diamonds oh <laughs> got him <laughs> so, <laughs> oh you so you know obviously we got a little bit negative and a little bit tired towards the end here um but that's because you know it's a decently long film it's 133 minutes it's quite action paced but overall i enjoyed this one i would actually say it's good um and i think it does come down to you know Kids, you got to know who you are. You got to know what you're about. And Die Another Day knows what it's about. It's it's crazy. It's over the top. It's maybe not the most over the top Bond gets. I think it gets sillier in other films. But in terms of being that like city action film, you know, this is pretty out there. But I think it actually balances things really well to find a really nice tone where. It's just a popcorn film. It's just something to turn your brain off and see some Bond classic stuff and some Bond staples and some craziness and stuff. And I think for that, it's actually quite successful for what it does. And I was surprised at how much the humor made me laugh. I was surprised at how much the action actually works really well and can be really cool. And I think some of the locations are pretty solid. I think, and some of the character interactions, I think a lot of this stuff actually works a lot better than I thought it would. And I think, you know, the biggest crimes here is that it is an early 2000s film and it has a lot of the shortcomings of that type of film. And we've talked about this a lot, where a lot of Bond films are products of their era and certain eras as a whole, not just for Bond, have aged better than others. Like we said, how the 60s age quite well because of how unique it is. And the 90s we talked about with GoldenEye and Tomorrow Never Dies aged quite well because there's a real charm to that. The early 2000s do not age well at all. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think Die Another Day is somewhat of a victim of that. So unfortunately, I've got to criticize things like the CGI. I wasn't massively bothered by it, but especially this ending bit with the helicopter and the plane looks terrible with the CGI. Yeah. Um, and there are just things throughout it where like the CGI becomes a focus and you get some really awkward, bad looking shots and it does look bad. It's the... Uh, it doesn't bother me that much, but it definitely is a negative towards the film that brings it down that just so heavily relies on CGI where if they just went for a more simplistic practical shots, it actually would have helped a ton. Um, and also, you know, the Frost stuff is pretty terrible. She she is bad in this film. The dialogue is bad in this film. And there are some really bad lines from Jinx. I don't really hate Jinx when it comes down to it. I think Frost distracts me too much from that. But it isn't handled as well as Tomorrow Never Dies, does it? I think Halle Berry and the, her acting doesn't help, but I think her dialogue is actually the main problem. And they really wanted the idea of this like female 007 and it just doesn't really work too well. But even then, I still enjoy this at the end of the day. And I have to say, Gustav Graves, really fun villain. I had a great time with this guy. I thought he was really good. Uh, and for this type of like hammy over the top villain he goes all in with it the actor and actually gave me someone that was quite interesting and i think someone that actually works really well against bond so i enjoyed it i had a good time now i'm not gonna rank it highly <laughs> okay <laughs> all right, let's not get too ahead of ourselves yeah yeah let's not go crazy here but and this is the thing i wanted to figure out am i gonna be basic and am i gonna rank the pierce brosnan films as everyone does which is it gets worse as it goes on. But honestly, I like this more than The World Is Not Enough. I think this film knows more what it wanted to be and it's more successful at doing that. Maybe it's not as ambitious and maybe it's a bit too crazy and all over the place and it has its own flaws, but I appreciate this being successful at doing something that it wants to do rather than The World Is Not Enough, which is just a frustrating disappointment. So it's going above The World Is Not Enough. Um... So then that takes me to The Living Daylights on my list. And I think I had more fun with this than The Living Daylights. Okay. I think The Living Daylights is a bit more bland. And I think that film had worse pacing issues than Die Another Day because 
Die Another Day does have some pacing issues, but it's still not that bad. I think Living Daylight is more bland and forgettable and more pacing issues. Do I like it more than Moonraker? No. Oh. I think Moonraker is probably more fun and is more out there, actually, than this film. So that's where it's going to live. It's going to go at number 15, so underneath Moonraker, but above the Living Daylights. Hmm. So, yeah. I think I don't think it was ever going to be at the bottom like a lot of people's list, especially after hearing what you've said about it so far. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's that makes total sense where you put that. Yeah, like it's it's somewhat a similar film to like a Moonraker and to One Ever Dies, but I think those films are probably better what they do, and this is kind of like another version of them, a pretty good enjoyable version of them. But I probably would just if I want that sort of Bond, I probably would still watch To One Ever Dies and Moonraker before that. But at the same time. Everything kind of below Die Another Day on my list, I find a bit like soulless and disappointing and a bit joyless. <laughs> so uh, I don't find Die Another Day like that. So that's that's why it kind of slots in there. Oh, I'm I'm frustrated, I think, with this film, because as I mentioned, I was really enjoying this uh, for the first first half of it, I would say. All very solid stuff. I mean, maybe not all solid, but a lot of st- enough there to make me like it. I liked the stuff in Cuba. I liked, um, uh, I liked the the underground station stuff and and the cue scenes. And I just, I, I just think oh, it really dropped the ball for me in the Ice Palace. And from that point on, especially in the later bit of the Ice Palace, and from that point on, I just, I was that was it. I don't know, and that's why I'm frustrated because I was thinking, oh, this actually. This is actually going to be all right. And I, I'm going to be able to put this not high, but somewhere maybe in the two thirds region and, and higher than maybe some people would expect. And then it just kind of dropped the ball for me. Um, and it's not even really because of the things that a lot of people would moan about usually or in the past have done. It's th- the CGI doesn't really bother me at this point terribly much. I can live with it. I know it's coming. Um and Jinx is also not actually that bad. She's just, I don't hate her. I think she's just cringy, really, which is honestly not terrible. Um, and actually Graves, I'm saying all the stuff I like about it, but Graves was better than I remember him being as well. I don't think he's quite Carver levels of, of hammy, like hammy villains, but he's all right. He's pretty good. But... <sighs> There's just still something about it that by that point in in the ice palace section, I just, I think it was that that bit talking about like the the torture stuff and how to me, it it went down that lane which was a smart choice to make, but it meant it went down the lane that I didn't really love and I, I just I don't know I wanted to see for the for the fortieth anniversary for the twentieth film I would have hoped that this would be a bit of a stronger entry, um, I definitely didn't hate it though uh, i'm like you i think i liked it more than the world is not enough um which i just found dull pretty much the whole way through this at least i enjoyed the first half so with that being said i'm gonna pull it and again i'm a little bit stuck um with my rankings in terms of goldfinger <laughs> because there is no way that this is better than goldfinger so because it's better than the world is not enough and i'm not moving goldfinger by the way I refuse. All right, no, so, you stand by what you want to do. I know what you're all thinking out there, and I'm not doing it. Um, it's going to go below Goldfinger, but above The World Is Not Enough on my list. So 17th. So I think I might have the only Bond ranking list where Goldfinger is next to die another day. <laughs> but you know what? That's fine. Um, but the thing I think is quite interesting about this film is, as we said right at the beginning, it made a ton of money. It was very successful for what it needed to do for the for the board, <laughs> for the for the producers. Yeah. I think critical reception, even at the time, wasn't very good. I, I get the impression and, and reading about it as well. So I do wonder how much it's like that saying about like X had to run, so Y could sorry, X had to walk, so Y could run. And I wonder how much of this actually then led into Casino Royale being the way it was. I know there are other factors, other franchises, things like that, but I do wonder whether they saw this and thought, we went too far with this, and then that's why they stripped it so far back with the next film. 
I, I think they definitely did, yeah. I think this was definitely a bit of a... Like, I think they were on this trajectory and they were getting away with it, but yeah. I get, and we know it was the smart choice. We definitely know it was a smart choice. And I think it takes a lot of discipline from them to say, well, die another day was a huge hit, but they might have just been seeing trends elsewhere. But yeah, like I've, yeah, this kind of... I'm trying to think if there was any other examples for the Bond franchise, and I'm kind of coming up blank where they had to go all in on one direction to then swing back to the other. I'm sure there probably is, but I can't think of one at the time. Um, mm. But this does feel like that. But in, in some ways, I feel like Tomorrow Never Dies is still the more over-the-top film. It's just Die Another Day has this, yeah, the Jinx character and the CGI stuff. But like, I feel like Tomorrow Never Dies is actually a little bit wackier than this one. <laughs> uh, uh, they're, yeah, I don't know. They're different. They're just they're very different. But... Yeah, I think so. In that regard, I can kind of appreciate it because if this if this is the reason why we got Casino Royale, then hey, <laughs> it can't be all bad. Yeah, but I I think for me though, like, and this is where like critical response and like retrospective reviews and stuff kind of come in, where it's like I can just watch Die Another Day for what it is and just kind of have that popcorn film, that summer flick or whatever, and enjoy that. And just take that as what it is because it's not the current one and it's not the current trajectory of Bond. And we've had a whole other era of Bond after this. So Die Another Day can kind of do its own thing and be that silly, wacky one that's kind of flawed but fun. Um, And I can kind of take it as that, which probably makes me look like a hypocrite because I'm pretty sure I've criticized other films for for that. Um, But there's something about Die Another Day. Maybe it's nostalgia. I don't know. But I kind of expect this to be a big old mess. And I think it's a big old fun mess <laughs> and i think that's probably what people saw in the cinema like this is a big old fun mess with james bond and Halle berry was somewhat of a name as well there was there was like reasons to go and see it and have some fun um or reasons to go and see it and criticize it i guess but there was there was like hype behind it more than like any other uh pierce brosnan film so and that translated to sales it's just yeah, I guess they were smart enough to say let's redirect, but I f- I think I can- I get it. I think it does make sense that this film did well because it's fun, and I think that's what most people ultimately want with a lot of films. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're saying about kind of nostalgia for it. Nostalgia is a very powerful thing. Um, that can really you can you can forgive a lot of stuff if it hits you in the right spot. I think I said that about the other films. So. I, I don't blame you for enjoying it as much as you do. I wish I could have, but it just wasn't quite there for me in the same way, sadly. Hmm. And this might be where just length comes in as well, um, because this is 133 minutes. So, And this is the the issue I had with the John Glenn era, where it's like, it's not that I necessarily hate those films, but when you're making those films as long as those, you better bring something. Mm. And for me, Die Another Day is just kind of crazy. So that was enough to kind of, you know, bring me on for the ride where John Glenn was just boring but yeah again if your film is going to be like 130 minutes long if you kind of lose the audience or lose somebody you're never bringing them back and then they're just stuck watching a film they're not that into <laughs> so that's always pretty brutal I did feel a bit stuck <laughs> you wanted to get I, off at the station but you missed you missed it I missed the stop I felt like Halle Berry on that laser table but no one was there to save me Oh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's Pierce Brosnan done. Oh, yeah. Any uh, any thoughts on the Pierce? I think... Oh, it's so funny when thinking about Pierce Brosnan. I mean, this could be a whole other podcast about talking about his era as Bond, but, or an episode anyway. But I just... Uh, lots of people do say, yeah, his films got worse and worse as he went on. And I think we've both said that we don't agree with that um today but it is still kind of sad that the path his bond took they're not they're definitely not without uh kind of things to like about them but when they start off with golden eye i mean i like tomorrow never dies more but for most people golden eye is always gonna be the top one when you start out at that and you end up at this point it's just so it's such a big jump and I think also the terms that where he sort of was pretty much booted out of the role rather than actually leaving on his own accord, it just kind of makes it, in retrospect, it just makes it all a little bit sad for me. I think he he did deserve better, actually. 
Because I think during all of our episodes about the Pierce Brosnan films, we've never really complained about Brosnan himself. No. He's always been very, very solid and and arguably a very good mixture of previous Bonds. So, yeah, I just I honestly just think it's a little bit of a shame that maybe this was the right time for him to leave in terms of age regardless, but maybe just not on these terms. Yeah, I think him leaving makes sense after Die Another Day. I think that was the right call. But I think the one that hurts for me is The World Is Not Enough, where it had a ton of potential, but it just didn't play to his strengths at all. And it just is a complete wasted film. Where, But I think with GoldenEye, you get that great film and that classic, and then Tomorrow Never Dies, you get the other end of the scale. And then I would even argue Die Another Day is that same end of the scale. And I think he's really funny and good in the film. It's just the world is not enough. That's the one that hurts for me. So I definitely haven't really changed my opinion that much on Pierce. I think it's really interesting how many of these ideas are here and come back for Daniel Craig's Bond. Mm. But the one that hurts the most is the world is not enough because it's like, if that was better, I actually think he would have had a really solid set of films that cover a lot of the Bond era. And yeah, again, people do like him overall, but I think he could have been like uh, a little bit more like, he could have had that if just that bloody third film wasn't so, well, not good. <laughs> <laughs> it was not enough. It wasn't, sadly. Yeah. All right, well, there we go. That was Die Another Day. This is our longest episode. Hooray! Hooray! I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. If it, was any, if it was any film, it was going to be this one. Oh, yeah. So any last thoughts before we go? I'm off to go watch the, um, the Jinx spinoff. Right, oh. they made they made that right. Um, they got uh, closer than they should have done to making it. <laughs> I'll find it. Must be on Netflix somewhere. I'll go. They got look. dangerously close. <laughs> Your mama. Ah, oh. ah, oh. she's really disappointed in you, Joe. <laughs> she wanted me to tell you. Oh, let me turn the lasers back on. Yeah, all right. I'll join you in a second. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Thank you very much for listening. You have been listening to episode 20 of the Bond Revisited podcast. The Bond Revisited podcast will return next week for Casino Royale.